I was chewing fruit lounging on the thick branch of a huge tree. Along with a light crunch, a mixture of sweetness and a slight tanginess spread through my mouth. This fruit, the apua, is actually an ingredient used in rejuvenating elixirs and is sold among humans for a pretty decent price. But in this forest, they are everywhere you look. Come, spirits of the wind, I whispered and tossed the pit of the eaten fruit, which was immediately crushed by a swirling wind. In this way, the fruit serves as my nourishment and the remains enrich the soil. And if luck is on my side, maybe the seed will someday sprout and grow. Yawning deeply, I admired a little bird that had calmly settled on my chest and was chirping something in a high-pitched voice. I extended my finger and it began to rub against it as if cuddling. The bird fully understands that I will not harm it. The reason for such confidence is that I am from the race of elves, living side by side with the forest. Well, to be more precise, I am a high elf, closer to the spirits, but there's no special difference as we are also a forest people. Both regular elves and high elves are a people far removed from hustle and bustle and any changes. Enough, I'm bored. I lazily muttered, not really addressing anyone in particular. When you're hungry, eat fruits and nuts. Although hunting is forbidden, everyone trains daily in archery. Communicating with spirits, they observe the truth of this world. One could say that the everyday life of elves is the perfect embodiment of the phrase, a measured life. There's nothing wrong with this, of course, but, man, I'm tired of it after 120 years. By the way, I'm about 150 this year. I reached a conscious age around 30 and have been counting since then. Naturally, other elves see nothing strange in such a life and love the forest without any complaints. For them, this is something natural, and they know no other way of life. But I, although born in the deep forest and never having left it, know of a completely different, distinct life. I am what they call a reincarnated being, born with memories of a past, different world. This world, Earth, though overshadowed by heart-wrenching wars and constant conflicts, was also filled with art and culture. Knowing such a world, full of hardships and struggles, I can appreciate the beauty of the calm and peaceful life of elves, but at the same time I miss Earth's entertainment so much. And most importantly, I'm sick and tired of eating just berries and fruits. I want meat. No sooner had I muttered this than the bird sitting on my chest panicked, flapped its wings, and flew away. A very intelligent creature, but I wasn't planning on catching and eating it anyway. Say what you will. If you light a fire in the deep forest, other elves will immediately swarm in and start making claims. If there's meat, it has to be well cooked, and it seems there's no choice but to leave the forest. In other words, once you leave the forest, you can not only eat meat, but also experience a thrilling life and see different things around the world. All right, I've had enough of this elven life. It's not for me. I've tried for over a hundred years to fit in and behave like everyone else, trying to assimilate into elven society, but it seems I've reached my limit. Elves live for over 1,000 years, and even after their flesh withers, their spirits continue to roam the forest, one with nature. I definitely can't endure another 800 years of this life, or maybe even wandering until the end of time. With such a long life, it's much better to roam the outside world, see distant lands, try all kinds of delicious food, and challenge myself in various things. And after that, I can become a spirit or whatever else. I headed to the river flowing through the forest, picked up a couple of stones lying around, and started knocking them against each other, creating a makeshift stone knife. There are absolutely no metal items in this forest. Everyone says it's because the trees in the forest are afraid of metal objects. But in reality, this decision is driven by hatred for the gnome race, famed for its blacksmithing. Well, I get axes and such, meant for chopping trees, but why should the forest fear forks and knives? Anyway, if you need a cutting object in this place, you have no choice but to use stones like this or sharpen fangs, claws, or bones of large animals. Besides stones, fangs and bones are considered valuable items and are entrusted only to the elders. That's because if an immature elf falls into the trap of greed, he can eventually start senseless hunting of animals. That's why I, filled with curiosity, am not allowed to have anything like that. Well, that's fine. 
Since I'm leaving the forest, all this is no longer relevant to me. Looking at my reflection on the surface of the river, I raised the improvised knife and decisively chopped off my hair. Long hair is a symbol of nobility for high elves, and it was not even allowed to trim it slightly. To be honest, it has been quite bothersome until now. However, since I didn't have a proper knife, I decided not to shorten my hair too much, just in case I needed to fix a failed attempt. So I left it about shoulder length. If the elder saw me now, I would definitely be in for a scolding for three days and three nights, followed by decades of grumbling. We don't need that kind of happiness, so it's time to quickly get out of here. Getting a haircut. So simple, but it immediately feels so much lighter on the heart. There's really no one to say goodbye to before leaving, and although I have biological parents, elf children are considered young shoots and are raised by the whole settlement. So I don't have particularly warm feelings for anyone, even my parents. It's not that I have bad relationships with anyone. It's just that no one would understand me if I announced that I decided to leave the forest. Well, it's not certain that this goodbye is for a lifetime. If it's meant to be, we'll meet again. I think they won't notice my disappearance until at least a month has passed. Sensibly, I headed towards the exit of the forest with a light step, carrying a bow and arrow slung over my shoulder, a grapevine woven bag with apua, and a stone knife tucked into my belt. What we call the Deep Forest is known from the outside as the Pulha Dense Forest. Well, to be precise, it's just a small part of the forest where elves live. In the very heart of the Deep Forest live the High Elves on its periphery, ordinary elves. And all around this, thanks to the power of spirits, a barrier is erected, protecting against the invasion of humans and monsters. In other words, once you step beyond the barrier, you're fully in the outside world. But that doesn't mean monsters should attack just because I poked my nose out from behind the barrier. I didn't expect that as soon as I stepped out, I'd be surrounded by a pack of forest wolves. I wonder if Pulha is a dangerous place, or am I just unlucky? Even if the forest here is not as dense, there are still plenty of trees around. As soon as I looked at the nearest trees with a pleading gaze for help, they repelled the wolves with their moving roots and allowed me to hide in the dense canopy. So, having assured my safety, I started thinking about what to do with the pack below. To kill or not to kill, that is the question. Truth be told, hunting forest wolves is not difficult. Just a few arrows shot from the tree branches are needed. However, the arrows I have are nothing more than sharpened branches. It might not be possible to pierce the monster's hide with them, so I'll have to aim for the eyes. But since in the elven settlement my only entertainment was archery with complex targets, even if the target is small and moving, there are no problems. What really bothers me is not how to kill them, but whether there's any point in doing so. I understand that they attacked first and all that, but even if I kill them all, I have no desire to eat wolf meat, and skinning them here is a whole problem. And walking through the forest, dragging a carcass, is not an option. Of course, I could take only the fangs and claws, but since there's a whole pack of wolves here, the load would be significant. So, it's fine for one or two, but if it comes to the whole pack, it would just be senseless slaughter. All right, for starters, I'll take down the biggest one, who looks like the leader, and see if the rest scatter. If they don't run away, then I'll think about what to do next. I prepared my bow, pulled the string, and released two arrows in succession. Hit by an arrow in the eye, the huge wolf howled in pain and surprise, opening its mouth wide, where another arrow immediately landed. Nice. I felt a slight sense of satisfaction. Anyway, it's better to have at least one trick to defend yourself in case of danger, and it kind of boosts your confidence. The pack, having lost their leader, turned and fled, showing their heels, as soon as they saw me raise my bow again. Clearly, it seems that monsters have much higher intelligence than I thought. It's good that everything turned out fine this time, but I need to be more careful in the future, as who knows when I might encounter something similar again. Thank you. I thank the tree that saved me, stroking its trunk and jumped to the ground. Taking the stone knife from behind my belt, I started extracting fangs and claws from the wolf, which had clearly already kicked the bucket. Such a weapon can't pierce the monster's hide, but, as they say, in skilled hands. After putting the trophies into my bag, 
I called the spirits of the air. In response to my call, they created two small whirlwinds and minced the wolf into mush, including the hide and bones. Quite a spectacle. But by doing this, the body will return to the earth faster, becoming fertilizer for the surrounding trees. This is my gratitude for the help. Well, to be honest, it's the spirits working, not me. But since they don't have a physical body, they don't need a material reward. But that doesn't mean I forgot to convey my feelings of gratitude. So, having cleaned up after myself, I couldn't help but wonder how many more times I would have to experience something like this before I reach a human settlement. I've only just crossed the barrier and there's still a long road ahead. Even so, I couldn't help but smile, thinking that I was right. The outside world indeed won't let me be bored. Even this incident for me, who was tired of a measured life, turned out to be a fresh stimulus. Just the thought of what to do with the obtained claws and fangs made my heart flutter with joy. If I sharpen the large fangs well, I can get a short sword or, in the worst case, a long dagger. The small ones can be combined and used for crafts. The death of the pack leader would be meaningless if I ruin the materials, so I should first learn the craft properly. Well, anyway, first I need to get to the city. I'm not so foolish as to run through the forest, but restraining my legs, hurried by anticipation, proved to be quite a task. Sad news. It took me half a month to leave Pula. I didn't think it would take so long. Perhaps it was a mistake to move along the river just because I wanted to bathe regularly. I was attacked several times by monsters coming to drink, and a couple of times I was almost bitten by fish. Of course, it's good that the water spirits warned me about any danger immediately, but if I had reacted a moment later, I would have definitely lost a few pieces of myself. Well, let's leave the past in the past. Nibbling on nuts from time to time, I made my way through the dense forest and gradually reached the real outside world. I trembled with excitement, watching the plain dyed in the scarlet color of the setting sun. Plain. It's been a while since I remembered that word. From here, the boundless world stretches far and wide. Well, actually, it must end somewhere. I just got carried away with the mood. So, no time to indulge in impressions. The settlement in the distance, surrounded by a stone wall, a city? I need to hurry or I won't make it before it gets completely dark. Wiscott. Since it's written next to the entrance gates, it must be the name of the city. Oi, oi, isn't that an elf? What's the matter? Lost in the clouds. First time in a human city? Asked the soldier, armed with a spear who was taken aback by the majesty of the walls and gates. Probably the gatekeeper, guarding the entrance. Maybe because of the late hour, but besides me... No one else was trying to enter the city, so he's the first human I've seen in the 150 years I've lived in this world. Yeah, it's my first time in the city. The gates are impressive, so I was just looking. Is it a good time? Did I make it? Can I enter? Intuition told me that this person was clearly not a bad person. So smiling, I showed my empty palms and asked to be let in. Ah, uh, I knew it. To enter, you need to pay a tax. Is that a problem? You know about money, right? If you have an ID from any city, it's 20 bronze coins, if not one silver. The guard scratched his head in confusion. Understood. Unlike other elves, I retained memories of my life when I was a human. So naturally, I know about money and its significance. I know about it, but whether I have any is another question. So I just sadly shook my head. Um, well, you need money to enter the city. Did you come here because you have acquaintances living here? If so, I can call them to pay for you, the soldier offered. Indeed, a good person. However, unfortunately, I came to this city only because it happened to be the first one I saw after leaving the forest. Nothing more. In that case, it seems I'll have to ask for permission to sell the fangs or claws of the forest wolf and pay the entrance tax with the money I get. There's no other way, but I really didn't want to do that. I thought I could use them myself after processing. Excuse me, can I... Have a moment? A voice from behind interrupted my thoughts. Turning around, I saw a group of a young man and two girls who had been standing there for who knows how long. Well, from my point of view, all humans are young, but these are young even by human standards. However, upon closer inspection, isn't one of the girls an elf? If so, there's a chance she's even older than me. It seems she was the one who called out to me. Ignoring the puzzled face of the guard, 
The elf girl firmly grabbed my hand and pulled me away from the gates. Could it be that you are a high elf? She asked me in a whisper. In principle, it's not something that needs to be hidden, but it was painful because I was pulled forcefully, so I nodded in a worsened mood, after which a mixed expression surfaced on the girl's face, half convinced, half surprised as if asking what a high elf is doing here. Her expression was somewhat amusing, so I quickly forgot about the pain and forgave her. It's too trivial to hold a grudge against the opposite sex for every little thing. If it's not too much trouble, may I ask why someone as noble as you has visited a human city? The elf girl asked me, with a clear sense of the strangeness of the situation. Well, that's probably a logical question. Most likely I wouldn't believe my eyes either if I met another high elf outside the forest. To live together with the forest and, after death, turn into a spirit becoming part of this world. That's what my race is like. All questions about the outside world are nothing more than insignificant trifles for them. Except for me, of course. Well, I got bored of the forest, decided to wander around the world and see various things. Oh, right. You can call me Ice. That's what everyone called me back home in the deep forest. Well, to be honest, it's not even really a name, more like a nickname. They say the Elder even called me Maple Child in my childhood. Most spirits don't have names, and neither do High Elves. However, it's not very convenient, so children are given nicknames instead. Often, the names of High Elves sound like nothing more than wordplay. But if you mock someone for it, High Elves can get seriously angry. And their anger means they will attack without hesitation, pursuing the offender to death. So, if you don't want to start what's likely to be the last fight of your life, it's better not to touch on topics related to an elf's name in your conversations. Hearing my answer, the elf girl made a face that immediately made it clear what she thought of me, as if I were some kind of oddity. And again, such an eloquent expression, so amusing. She must have been living in the outside world for quite some time. Learning about this, I felt a strange joy that elves had undergone some changes. I see, Mr. Eyes. It might not be polite towards a respected person like you, but since we are compatriots, would you rely on me, Irina, this time? Suddenly declared the elf girl, after briefly thinking about something. It seems she decided to help me. Not that I didn't think about it, but why all of a sudden? But I didn't feel any malice from her. And what's more important, the spirits around clearly trust her, so she's unlikely to be a bad elf. Thank you. You'll really help me out as I'm in a difficult situation and can't get into the city. And by the way, no need for sir and all that, I said, extending my right hand for a handshake. I don't know what she was thinking, but Irina, suddenly dropping to one knee, took my hand in hers and pressed her forehead to the back of it. I didn't ask for anything like that, but it seems elves can't be changed after all. Thanks for the willingness to help, of course. But after I get into the city... I need to get away as quickly as possible. Mr. Ice, what will you do next? Do you have any plans? If not, I advise you to register at the Adventurer's Guild to get an identity document, asked Irina, who noticed me looking around. Yes, if I think about it, it's time to decide what to do next. But right now, there's something I want more than becoming an adventurer. No, I'll leave the guild for later. Can you tell me where I can find a skilled blacksmith here instead? Exactly. First, I need to learn the processing technology to turn the claws and fangs of the forest wolf into a knife in various crafts. If we're talking about a place for this, it's none other than a forge. And if I'm going to learn, it's best, of course, to learn from a skilled master. The best blacksmith in this city is a dwarf. I'm afraid he's unlikely to sell anything to us elves, Irina replied with a bitter face. Understood. It makes sense as elves and dwarves have long hated each other. But that's not a problem at all, since, after all, I have no money and I'm not planning to buy anything. That's fine. I've always wanted to see dwarves, so this is a good chance. But if it's uncomfortable for Irina, you can just show me the place. Well, the probability that I'll be taught something here is quite slim, but it's a good chance to see for myself what a living being called a dwarf is like. Mr. Eyes, you don't hate dwarves. Irina looked at me with incredulous eyes. Good thing I was prepared for such looks ever since I decided not to act as a high elf is supposed to. So I just smiled and nodded. Isn't it strange to hate someone you've never even met? Hearing my question, Irina just looked away from me. 
In elven legends, it's said that dwarves once stole a spark of fire from Mother Nature and locked it in a forge. But that can't be, because it would mean they can almost completely control nature. Even if we assume they are capable of that, then why haven't elves, who are in terrible relations with dwarves, been eradicated yet? I think elves are fools if they seriously believe what is likely nothing more than a metaphor in ancient myths. Nonetheless, no matter what I say, ingrained animosity is hard to eradicate. Again, I have no intentions of changing Irina's way of thinking against her will. It's enough that I live and think as I wish. Well, it's already night. If we go now, we'll probably just cause inconvenience. I'd like to check into a hotel first, but I have no money. Exactly, Irina. Would you buy this from me? I asked, taking a few Apua fruits out of my bag. I didn't try to sell them to the guard to pay the tax because I didn't think a human could recognize the fruit. But with an elf, it's a different story. She should immediately understand what it is. Apua possess an undying life force. So even though half a month has passed since I picked them, their appearance remains unchanged. Could this be? Arena's face changed color as she examined the fruit more closely. I only know from the conversations of the deep forest residents that Apua are highly valued in the outside world. So I sighed with relief, understanding from the elf girl's expression that it's true. Thinking about it, I managed to enter the city and learn from Irina that the blacksmith is a dwarf. It would be unfair not to thank her for this, so I took out another fruit, placed it in her hand, and said, This is to show my gratitude. Thank you for your help. Most likely, all elves must love Apua. I, of course, have eaten so many that I'm sick of them, but I'm sure after some time passes, I'll want to eat them again. Their taste is that good. Irina's companions curiously watched our interaction, but it took her some time to snap out of the stupor of surprise she had fallen into. After that, they made me promise not to take out these fruits so casually in front of strangers, and that before going to the blacksmith tomorrow, I should first listen carefully to information about human money and everyday life. It was amusing to watch her tremble as she realized she had completely forgotten about showing respect and addressing high elves while scolding me, so I decided to honestly learn everything from her. On the second morning from the moment I reached my first populated place, the city of Visca, I opened the door of the forge, which was my goal, and asked in a loud voice, Is there anyone? I think that my request to teach me processing technology will most likely be denied, so the main reason for today's visit is just to look at the gnome. Due to the fatigue accumulated during the long journey, Yesterday, I was not in ideal shape. Therefore, I think it was right to spend the whole day asking the elf Irina about this and that. Among what she told me was also information about human money. 100 copper coins equal sign 1 silver equal sign. 10 silver equal sign 1 small gold equal sign. 10 small gold equal sign 1 gold. For the apua I handed over, Irina gave me no less than 50 gold. By the way, you can eat normally with a few copper coins, and a luxurious room with a bathroom and a magnificent dinner in the luxurious hotel where we stayed yesterday cost only five silver. If we compare very roughly, it turns out that one copper coin is equal to about 100 yen, and a silver coin is equal to 10,000. And the day before yesterday, and yesterday as well as today, Arena paid for the hotel. So, Having converted the amount into yen, I felt somehow a little guilty. I told her that a cheap place to stay would suit me, but she was categorically against it, and almost by force settled me in the best hotel in the city, so nothing could be done, but at first I had to let her pay for me. Moreover, this hotel serves a stew full of meat, bread that is a little tough but full of the aroma of wheat, and a heartily seasoned steak. So even if they now tell me to move somewhere else, I will never agree. Okay, let's put this conversation aside. Now something else is more important, namely the gnome. In this store, weapons and armor were displayed for sale near the entrance, and the back part was occupied by the forge itself. Although my cry was heard, the owner was apparently busy since the sound of a hammer pounding coming from the depths did not stop. But I didn't come here to interfere with the gnome's work, 
So first, I decided to look around. It was interesting to examine the densely piled merchandise, which included everything from a crude sword with an obvious emphasis on practicality to ornate armor. There were even outlandish things, the purpose of which remained unclear to me. Among everything, what caught my eye the most was the huge Q-shaped machete. It can be called huge, of course, when compared with knives and one-handed swords, but in comparison with axes, sledgehammers, and two-handed swords, it cannot boast of size. But this machete radiated a certain pressure that was not inferior to the hefty weapons around it. Naturally, I didn't touch anything without asking. No matter how passionate I am, it is still a weapon. If, God forbid, you get hurt by picking up something without the owner's permission, then this will only cause problems for the store. Well, for the dwarf who owns this store, perhaps the very presence of me, an elf, is already a problem, but one should not confuse one with the other. I apologize for keeping you waiting, dear customer, and you have a trained eye. This is not just iron, but, oh, if you look closely, aren't you an elf? Why the hell did you forget? In my store, they don't sell to stinking elves. While I was admiring the machete, a polite voice came from behind, which in a matter of seconds turned into dirty swearing. Turning around, I saw a muscular and short man staring at me. Even the beard, braided so as not to get in the way, seems to shout, I am a gnome. I couldn't help but smile with joy. Good afternoon, a very good machete. I liked it, but I'm not shopping today, Mr. Smelly Gnome. I really liked it. I really did, but I've already decided for myself what material I'll use. By the way, here you go. This is as a sign of acquaintance, I answered in a voice in no way inferior in volume to dwarf swearing. And although our squabble had already begun, I did not forget about the wine I had bought as a souvenir, which I carefully handed over to the gnome so as not to break the bottle. Whatever one may say, a greeting and a gift are a sign of decency. Thank you for being polite. Oh, who is this stinking gnome, eh? Stinking elf. Do you think a stinking elf like you can choose normal wine? That's crap, really. He brought good wine. And, if not for shopping... Then why did he come then? If it's some kind of bullshit, then even though I accepted the wine, I'll really throw you out. Slowing down, the dwarf asked me, apparently touched by my polite attitude. It's clear, he is also a good person, that is, a dwarf. It was rightly said in my past world that unless you actually meet, you won't know whether you'll get along with someone or not. Since the dwarf agreed to at least listen to me, I couldn't hope for more. True, this is entirely due to the expensive wine that I bought in the best store in the city for a whole gold coin. I pulled the fang out of the bag and placed it on the counter. The fang of the leader of a pack of forest wolves. I lost it when I was getting out of the forest. I want to make a knife out of it so I came to learn the necessary technique. Raising his eyebrows at my words, the dwarf grabbed the fang and began to study it closely. The movements of his hands holding the fang were careful, and his gaze was serious. Only after a few minutes, having examined the material very carefully, he returned the fang back. That's what I was thinking. Some strange elf, and you turn out to be an idiot? This is the fang of not a forest wolf, but of a healthier great wolf. This is not the kind of material that a beginner can use after only a little studying of the processing method came out shocking words from the gnome's mouth. What the heck? I thought that all the wolf monsters found in the forest belonged to the same species, but apparently in the outside world they are somehow distinguished. Just because I don't want to screw everything up, I came to learn from the blacksmith considered the best in the city. I couldn't take the skin and meat with me, so I don't want to waste my existing fangs and claws, I said, and carefully put the fang back in a bag. Seeing this, the dwarf immediately told me, If you don't want to fail, let me make you a knife from this fang. Moreover, since you are so strong that you can finish off the great wolf, then you can easily earn money by becoming an adventurer. Why do you want to master this skill? I was right. He is a good gnome. 
Look, he's even ready to forge a weapon for me. But I just smiled and, shaking my head, answered, I won't become an adventurer yet. Not only a knife, I also want to make various products from the rest of the fangs and claws. Besides, I also have an interest in blacksmithing, so I want to take a look at the forge. Moreover, as I thought, gnomes are an interesting people. So instead of adventures, for the next 10 to 20 years, I want to study blacksmithing. Hearing this, the gnome began to look at me as if I were crazy. Well, yes, quite an expected reaction. I understand that I say things that are strange to people, but the difference in the time scale for the elves is too different. Therefore, I have no choice but to live my own way, even if others cannot understand me. This was decided the moment I abandoned the high elf life I was accustomed to. I understand. You're not an idiot. You're just crazy. Well, okay. This is much better in comparison with the inflated pride of other elves. If you agree to do some auxiliary work, so be it. I'll teach you blacksmithing until this madness of yours goes away. It will. I feel sorry for the great wolf if you ruin his fangs. And even if my path in life is not understood by others, this does not mean that it will not intersect with them. From an overabundance of happiness, I extended my right hand, which the dwarf stared at even longer and more intently than at the material. Realizing that I wasn't going to give up, he finally shook it firmly. Well, why does Mr. Ace work as a salesman in a gnome store? That was the first thing Irene could say when she saw me sitting behind the counter, lazily playing with the circle of wisdom asterisk. Several days have passed since the dwarf, with a wave of his hand, accepted me as a student. It seems that the elf was worried about me, so she came to check. By the way, the circle of wisdom was made by my mentor at my request. If you don't do it in great detail, there is no point in it, so I was wholeheartedly amazed at the skills of this stinking gnome. There is no pretension in calling such a master a mentor. And even though I became his student, as long as he continues to call me a stinking elf, I'm also in no hurry to change the way I address him. When I learned blacksmithing, I launched the mass production of the Circle of Wisdom and sow the seed of irritation throughout the world, so I won't be the only one to experience it asterisk asterisk because they told me that if I did some auxiliary work, they would teach me blacksmithing, and besides, they promised me a salary. However, even if I work here all day, it won't be enough to pay for the current hotel, so as soon as Irina stops supporting me, I'll have to look for a new hotel. Although I don't think that such deliciousness is served anywhere else, so it would be better to rent a house and cook it yourself or find a suitable restaurant. Continuing to crunch the circle of wisdom, I was finally able to separate the two metal rings. And although this toy is very annoying, this particular moment brings indescribable pleasure. That's not the problem at all. You know that the trees will be afraid of you, and the spirits will hate you if your body is saturated with the smell of iron. Even if it's you, what will happen if the spirits abandon you? At Irina's noisy voice, a stinking mentor appeared, forging iron in the depths of the store, but surprisingly did not make any complaints. On the contrary, in his gaze it was clearly read, Here, this is an ordinary normal elf. Okay, let's leave the gnome alone. We need to eliminate Irene's misconceptions. No matter what I am, nothing will change the fact that the spirits and I are close friends. That's why I couldn't ignore her misunderstanding. Of course, I know, but this is nothing more than a misunderstanding. No matter how much you smell of iron, the spirits will not hate you for it. But the food tastes strange, so every day I ask the wind spirits to eliminate the smell. I don't want people to think I stink, so I take a thorough bath every day. Even when I got out of the forest, it was for this reason that I did not leave the river. I can be called very delicate in such matters. In addition, I checked a long time ago that perfumes have no problems with the smell of iron. And when I first approached the hearth, I saw that the spirit of fire had settled inside it. And when I left the forge, the spirits of the wind were circling around me as always. 
Perhaps the rumor that spirits hate the smell of iron originated from the fact that there was an incident where they were frightened by pollution due to mineral gases. The elves who witnessed this did not understand the situation and spread ridiculous rumors. And then, if trees are afraid of metal, doesn't that mean that adventurers shouldn't enter the forest of Pula? Naturally, trees hate being cut down, and who would like that? But the problem is not the axe, but the one it holds him in. Don't assume that trees are so weak-hearted. Trying to explain to the inhabitants of this world about environmental pollution is too tedious, so I have reduced the explanations to examples that everyone can understand. Just enough to be enough to give me a reason not to quit my job. I think that even if I get a few potted plants here, I'll quickly make friends with them too. Oh, Master Stinky Gnome, don't you think the store lacks some greenery? Would you mind if I put a couple of pots in? I shared the idea that came to mind, but the mentor just snorted and disappeared into the depths of the store. Let's assume that this gesture of his means consent and I can do as I want. Returning my gaze to Irene, I found her standing in a stupor. Apparently, she didn't fully believe my story and is now trying to fight her common sense. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. This is because Irina, unlike us high elves, cannot clearly see spirits and directly talk to trees. Therefore, for ordinary elves, the knowledge left by their ancestors is absolute truth, and no one doubts it. As for the high elves, due to the fact that they do not care about external concerns, they do not share their knowledge with anyone. And even if an erroneous understanding of something spreads among the elves, no one will bother to correct it. By the way, there is a prejudice among elves that fire consumes air. And although this is a self-evident fact, they interpret it as if the spirits of fire eat the spirits of wind, and therefore the former are dangerous to the latter. But this is far from true. On the contrary, there are strong relationships of mutual cooperation between the spirits of fire and air. And in general, wind spirits, although they live in air currents, are actually immortal creatures without real bodies. And even if they fall into the fire, they won't even scratch themselves. Again, the food of fire is oxygen, and the wind spirits only carry it, but it is not part of them. And strong fire can sometimes generate wind. That is why fire and wind, and accordingly the spirits living in them, are in a strong relationship. And the possible destruction at the moment when fire and wind unite is something no joke. It is dangerous to spread such knowledge too much, but Irina is a very kind girl, so I don't see any problems. It's something like this. If you want to know anything else, you can always ask me, but now I'm actually at work. And since I came to the store, I would like you to buy something. I recommend the machete from that shelf over there. It's a cool thing. Although it's a pity that I won't be able to admire it if they buy it, I still recommend it. A, hey, this knife. So big. It's really a wonderful thing, but it was made by a gnome. If you sell it to me, won't Mr. Ace be scolded? The girl asked, checking the machete and clearly becoming interested. I have no idea whether they will scold me or not, and it doesn't matter to me. Although the stinking gnome said at our first meeting that they don't sell to elves here, the goods in the store exist to be bought. Yes, and I like it when we have big revenue, even if it's not my money. Moreover, if Irina buys the machete, then I can sometimes ask her to show it to me. If you handle it with care, it won't be a big deal, right? By the way, next time, take your friends with you. Even though the blacksmith in this store is the best in town, the same can't be said about sales. From the attitude of a stinking gnome, forcing waiting for a customer for a good hour, it is clear that this store values the production process more than selling. But since I work here now, I want to make this place the most profitable in the city. If this continues, I won't have time to train at all, so my immediate goal is to increase sales and demand to hire more people. In this case, the mentor will be able to devote more time to forging, and my number of acquaintances will increase. And the first step towards this is to lure into the store, White Lake, who proclaim themselves to be the best adventurers in the city. 
After all, in any case, that couple did not come to this store just so as not to hurt Irina's feelings. If the city finds out that the best group prefers the local blacksmith, then many adventurers driven by curiosity should follow their example. It seems that you see things that I never noticed. Or, more correctly, I didn't even try to notice. I understood everything. Seller, sell me that machete. I will treasure it, Irina finally said, smiling. After that, I helped her choose a suitable belt for the sheath and conveyed, word for word, as I was told, the method of leaving. Judging by the fact that the stinking mentor, peeking from the depths of the store, said nothing, I was not mistaken either in choosing a belt or in explaining how to care for the weapon. Naturally, because of this incident, the enmity between the elves and dwarves did not decrease one iota, but good quality weapons fell into the hands of a skilled adventurer. And as for me, even this is a completely joyful event. Note per, asterisk, the circle of wisdom, or the ring of wisdom, is a metal puzzle that consists of separating two curved contours by choosing the right angle and location. But what do you think if you fiddle with it for several hours and at least she doesn't need henna? Won't it be annoying? It's been about a month since I arrived in Wiscott. Work at the blacksmith shop is progressing like clockwork, and the number of visitors has only been increasing lately. The obvious incentive for this was that the best group of adventurers in the city updated my equipment here. Well, also, the fact that an elf works in a dwarven store turned out to be such a rarity that many come just to stare at me. My training is also progressing slowly. Since I accepted taking on the role of being responsible for controlling the flames, thanks to the ability to see the spirits of fire, I began to help more and more often in the forge. In addition, the mentor admitted that I have quite dexterous fingers, so I think that the day the real training begins is not so, basically, I plan to focus on blacksmithing for 10, 20 years, so it doesn't really matter to me that the learning progress is slow. And although everything is fine in the shop now, this does not mean that I have not had problems this month. For example, I got lost when I went to pay the tax for strangers living in the city for more than a week. I wanted to rent a house because I felt embarrassed that someone was paying for the hotel for me for a whole month, but I was scolded by Irina. She said she was worried about me and that's why she wouldn't let me move. In general, a lot happened. By the way, the salary received in the store is two silver pieces. I am entitled to one day off so a week comes out to a small gold and two silvers, which is much higher than the average salary of an adult man in Wiscota. For someone to be accepted as an apprentice, the conditions are absolutely exceptional. But the room in the hotel where I now live costs me five silver a day, and it doesn't matter whether it's a working day or a day off. Therefore, a week's accommodation costs me three small gold and five silver, Income does not keep pace with expenses, because Irina is learning from me the magic of spirits and how to communicate with them, she refuses to charge me for the room. And although our relationship has turned into something like a teacher, student, I, being a student of a stinking gnome, receive a salary, and Irina, on the contrary, pays for my housing. And it doesn't matter whether the high elf is there or not, I think that this is not acceptable. In general, everything like that. What should I do now? I complained, pouring out my pent-up feelings with ale from a wooden mug. My interlocutor, listening to my grumbling, was a soldier named Rodner, the first person I met when I came to this city. More precisely, the very first person I met in this world. It was he who, taking a special day off on my day off, showed me this cheap eatery, but famous for its good food. Ha, ha, ha. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. After all, that elf sister is your guarantor. She can't leave you alone in every sense, Rodner laughed, relishing a sausage skewered on a fork. There was not a drop of sarcasm in his laughter. He simply enjoyed the ale, the snack, and the pleasant atmosphere. Indeed, not a bad place. Although the building and the tables are a little old, everything is neatly tidied up and even the floors are clean. The tables and chairs are quite durable, 
so it's okay if you lean on them a lot. As soon as you bite into the sausage, the meat juice spreads in your mouth and the ale is not bitter at all. In addition to everything, just looking at how beautiful, by human standards, the girl, who is a living sign of the store, quickly delivers food to the tables, you experience a pleasant feeling of relaxation. Be that as it may, isn't this elf too respectful of you? And this is the same Irina from, who is famous for not bowing her head even to the nobles. Rodner stared at me intently, waving to the waitress passing by our table. It doesn't look like he's trying to snoop around, more like he's just curious. Indeed, Irina's behavior is too striking. I'm sure this guard is not the only one asking this question. However, this Irina is a very problematic person. Ignore aristocrats who demand respect, but at the same time treat with respect those who ask to be addressed more simply. I picked up my empty plate, indicating to the waitress that I wanted to order. Well, as you can see, I'm often called a weirdo, but at the same time, I... Oh, two meats on the bone, please. Listen, don't you have french fries? Oh, just as I thought. Well, then another plate of sausages and ale after... Smiling at my order, the sign girl headed to the kitchen, swaying her hips. Damn, I really want either fried potatoes or carrots to go with the ale. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a fried food culture in this world, or at least here in Wiscott. I wonder if you ask if a smelly gnome can make a deep fryer. I think he will also like deep fried chicken at a certain temperature. But let's return to the words, as you see. For humans and elves, they have slightly different meanings. If an ordinary elf sees a high elf, he will immediately recognize him. But for a person, the difference between a high elf and an ordinary one is not at all obvious. Therefore, for Irina, as you can see, means that I am a high elf. But for Rodner, it only means that she and I are both elves. So you can't say that I'm lying. Well, if things really become unbearable, come for advice. We'll find you a place to live in a safe area, and you'll see that your elf friend will calm down a little. I just nodded at Rodner's words. Most likely, I will indeed take up his offer. He not only listened to my whining, but also suggested a solution, and not particularly persistently. Still, Rodner really is a good, reliable man. Irina and Rodner, they also have a stinking mentor. I am truly blessed with good friends. Throwing charcoal into the forge, I checked my state of mind. After saying a few words to him, I saw sparks dancing in the fireplace. Apparently, the spirit of fire living here is also enthusiastic to work today. After about six months had passed since my training began, I received permission from my mentor to take on simple work myself, mainly for making nails. Since I started working in a gun shop, the number of my acquaintances among the neighbors has increased day by day. From them, I learned that due to the lack of nails, kitchen knives, and pots, they were experiencing inconvenience in their daily lives. At first, I was very surprised by this because they live next door to the blacksmith. But it turned out that due to the fact that the stinking gnome is considered the best gunsmith in the city, he is inundated with orders for the manufacture of equipment for soldiers and adventurers. Again, dwarves are widely known to be quite stubborn and they are also very muscular and have a very sullen appearance. Therefore, those around them did not dare to ask the mentor to make household utensils for them. But this impression softened after everyone learned about the elf working in the store, who by nature should be incompatible with a gnome. Even though we call each other stinkers, we are both always in a good mood. Perhaps that's why recently a representative of local residents who also happened to be an influential landowner quietly approached me and asked me to make, if not knives and pots, but at least nails to begin with. Having handed this over to the mentor, he, after thinking a little, told me, Because of your appearance here, the number of clients has increased. So you take this job, stinking elf. I'll tell you the method of making it. So today I'm working again, production of nails. It may seem like a simple job, but there are many types of nails too. 
If I need to mass produce something standard, then I just need to pour the molten metal into a prepared mold, cool it, and it's done. But when you make specific nails, you have to use a hammer to shape each individual workpiece. Moreover, depending on the purpose, the material also changes. For example, rich people prefer brass nails that sparkle like gold to iron nails. In addition, not all nails I make become a product. Before being handed over to the client, everything I produce undergoes a strict test by a stinking gnome. And if there were no problems with cast nails, then the ratio of approved nails made by hand did not even reach 10% at first. For me too, it's better if, instead of being excessively lenient, everything I make goes through strict control. After it, you can calmly sell the product to the client and find out for yourself what exactly you did wrong. By correcting all the shortcomings in your work and increasing the percentage of products that have passed the test, you can evaluate your own progress in your studies. That's why I enjoy my current job. I am pleased when customers who buy my product are happy. And recently, while walking around the neighborhood, I began to notice more and more often that people here and there were using the nails I made. Perhaps, if we continue manufacturing for the next hundred years, I think that all the nails used in this city will be made by me. Although I don't think that I will be able to lead such a lifestyle for another hundred years, I get tired of everything too quickly. So, for about 10, 20 years. A month after the start of production, the percentage of goods that passed the test increased to 30 and after three months up to 50. There were also noticeably more visitors to the store, so the mentor finally decided to hire new assistants. They turned out to be two neighboring housewives with children. They work three days a week and share one day between them. While one of them works, the other looks after both children. They often invite me to their place on their days off to play with the children. Human children grow very quickly, and this has proven to be quite interesting to watch. Although I see them once every few weeks, each time they get bigger and bigger. The children became very attached to me, but under the influence of my mentor, they also began to call me Brother Stinky Elf. If they argue since childhood, then nothing good will come of them in the future, so I think that this should be corrected. What do you want them to do if they grow up to be something like me or a stinking gnome? Recently, in addition to nails, I have also started making other things, such as staples. In this world, at least in Visku, there were none, so the smelly gnome was very surprised when he saw what exactly I was making. Of course, due to technical difficulties, it is impossible to manufacture small enough things, but large staples are also very useful when connecting wooden materials. Although with the addition of a new product to production, the volume of my work has increased, but my salary has also increased. Until now, most of my expenses have been covered by Arena, who is one of the best adventurers in the city. But how long can this continue? It's time to become independent. For quite a long time, I wanted to find a place to rent. But recently, I noticed that the funds I had accumulated were enough to buy my own home. Right now, I'm just looking for something suitable. The area where the gun shop is located is quite calm, and the residents here already know me well, so I'm thinking of living here. Arena is currently on a long-term assignment, so she won't be in town for a while. But upon her return, we will need to have a serious conversation, and this time persuade her to let me move. Please help. We need your strength to stop the water spirit that has gone crazy. So began my next working day in the weapon shop, which Martin, a priestess from the best team of adventurers in the city, visited in a hurry. Well, in other words, Irina's friend. Having said that they accepted a long-term contract, White Lake left Viscott, and a month later only Martin returned, who immediately rushed to the store where I work, asking for help. I didn't even know what to answer her. Everything is so unexpected, and I don't even know what we're talking about. But one thing is clear. If a member of what is considered the best team in the city stands with his head bowed in the middle of a crowd of adventurers, he will stand out greatly. 
in the bad sense of the word. Glancing to the side, I saw a stinking gnome nodding toward my exit. I beckoned Martina to follow me and left the store. I still don't really understand what's going on. However, depending on the situation, I don't mind helping as I feel obligated to Irina. Martin's request contained very strange words, namely, a gone mad spirit. I have already explained to Irina in some detail that spirits are immortal creatures without real bodies. Of course, immortality also applies to their minds. That's why they just can't go crazy. To begin with, I decided to return to the hotel and listen carefully to all the details. The hotel where I live was recommended to me by Irina, and by the way, was also paid for by her. Her whole group lives here too. Moreover, they have an annual contract, so even in their absence, their rooms remain available. So this is the best place where we can talk to Martin without attracting too much attention from others. After listening to Martin's story, I couldn't help but clutch my headache. The content turned out to be so troublesome. It's too burdensome to get involved with this matter, but it seems that there really is no one besides me to solve this problem. Moreover, if we leave everything as it is, it may also affect me. The mission that White Lake was sent on was addressed to them personally and delivered from the neighboring city of Galareto, a distance from Vica that takes more than two weeks to overcome. And this is quite strange. It is true that this group is the best in Wiscott, but that does not mean that they are the best six-star group in the entire country. Galareto should also be home to quite skilled adventurers. Apparently, the main reason why Galareto sent a personal task was the presence in the White Lake of an elf who is a spirit charmer. Again, the purpose of this quest is to remove the curse placed on the river. According to the customer, the river used as a source of drinking water was cursed by a spirit gone mad. Well, up to this point, there is nothing that cannot be understood. Again, if suddenly one of the inhabitants of Galaredo somehow angered the spirit of water, then it is not impossible that he cursed the drinking water in revenge. I also realize that people tend to blame spirits for everything if they harm them, without even trying to understand the reasons. And this happened at the moment when I heard that a lot of dead fish were also found in this river, and the vegetation on the banks was drying up. It was then that I realized that the root of the problem lay much deeper. If this were a curse of the spirit directed against the inhabitants of the city, then it would not have any effect on the fish and plants. Therefore, I am afraid that the cause of all this is nothing other than water pollution. And if this is so, then it goes without saying that the spirits have absolutely no reason to harm the river that is their home. All that remains is to find out the cause of the contamination. And for this, I didn't even have to leave the room. It turned out that Galaretto is a new city, founded 10 years ago to develop ore deposits discovered in the mountains. In other words, this case is nothing more than an attempt to shift responsibility for environmental pollution onto spirits. The lord who rules Galaretto is a recently elevated noble. Most likely, in an attempt to fulfill the king's order to develop the mines, he focused on mass mining, completely disregarding environmental safety measures. I don't know if he's trying to shift his responsibility to the spirits, or if he really doesn't know anything about the environmental problem. But if the city lord doesn't do anything, the situation won't change. At the moment, Irina is at the scene and is trying her best to calm the angry spirit, which is ready to almost raise the entire city to the ground. Realizing that they couldn't cope on their own, decided to ask for help and the only one who came to their mind was me. Being the leader, Cliff, in case of something unexpected, remained to protect Irina, and Martina, changing carts one after another, returned in a hurry to Visca. It should be noted that although this situation is extremely problematic, I was glad to hear that Irina has noticeably improved her skills as a spirit caster. To simply complete the task, it is enough to eliminate the water spirit. To be more precise, get rid of all polluted water and make sure that the spirit cannot interfere in the affairs of this world. But these are only temporary measures. If the cause of pollution is not eliminated, 
then after some time the condition of the river will only worsen, and even more angry spirits will appear. So I was quite pleased with Irina's attempt to understand what was happening and solve the problem from the point of view of someone who considers spirits to be their friends. I, in principle, do not mind helping in this matter, but it is a little difficult to completely resolve this issue alone. Okay, it's decided. It is necessary to involve a smelly gnome, who is an expert in the field of metals, into this matter. Well, the pollution problem in the city of Galaretto can affect all the metalsmiths in this country. Dwarves have worked with metals since ancient times, so they have extensive knowledge not only of its use, but also of its dangers. Hearing that pollution had occurred in Galareto due to improper mining of mineral rocks, the stinking gnome changed his face and immediately began preparing countermeasures. In this country, the kingdom of Ludoria, not only the mentor works, but also other gnomes. Dwarves have a very strong influence on the blacksmith guild. Even the king is often interested in their opinion. But in order for the matter to reach the king, first, naturally, it is necessary to send personnel from the guild to Galaredo to conduct a detailed check. And it seems that the stinking gnome himself volunteered to become a member of the investigation team. The reason for this is obvious. Besides the mentor, is there at least one gnome who agrees to work with an elf? No? That's what he thought, too. At the moment, suspicions about the presence of mineral poisons are based only on my assumptions. And if the employee sent by the blacksmith's guild turns out to be a gnome, then he will not even listen to my explanations. I think that I can make friends with other gnomes if we drink well, fight, and discuss all the delights of blacksmithing, but now I simply don't have time for that. The main problem for us could be the distance to Gallerito, because okay, I'm alone. But even if the smelly gnome leaves the forge, we'll have to completely close the store for a while. It's good that the aunties working for us were understanding about this. They said that this is not an alien issue to them, since if the current problem becomes too serious, metal prices could jump, and in the worst-case scenario, future mineral development may face public resistance. As gun store employees, they don't want to see this kind of development at all, so they agreed to an unscheduled weekend without any problems. Accompanied by Marthina, who turned pale at the news that the problem was much more serious than she thought, I headed to Galareto. The stinking gnome also left Visco with us. But he first needed to visit the capital to stir up the guild, so we will meet him on the spot. The road to Galareto, as expected, took us two weeks of constant transfers. The road can hardly be called safe because of the occasional attacks from robbers and monsters. But due to the fact that regular passenger carts are accompanied by guards and there is nothing to steal from passengers without cargo, unlike trade caravans, we only got away with meeting a couple of weak monsters. If I mention any problems, it would be the fact that I got seasick. The uneven rocking of the carriage instilled my sense of balance into great disorder. If I remember well, it seems that in my past life I suffered from seasickness. As for Martin, maybe because she calmed down, having managed to enlist my support, but she looked much more relaxed compared to the moment of her return to Visco. I even thought that this was somehow not fair. Anyway, as soon as we arrived in Galareto, we immediately left the city without much rest, because the White Lake, including Martin, had not yet completed its task. And what's more important, instead of getting involved with the city's problems ourselves, it's better to entrust this to the blacksmith guild and the smelly gnome. Due to the fact that elves stand out in cities, we had to move secretly, although this does not suit my character at all. Asterisk, 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 led by Martin, I walked along the ill-fated river. At first glance, the water flowing in it did not stand out in any way, but the plants growing around were groaning in pain. Unfortunately, their comrades, who had weaker resistance to metal, died long ago and will no longer be able to even groan. As I thought, it looks like the drainage water is being discharged straight into the river. Perhaps, from the point of view of ordinary elves, their compatriot who chose life in the city instead of the usual forest 
looks like a scum of society. But even being such an elf, I think the landscape I saw is disgusting. I might even wonder if the local water spirit had been the first to ask for my help in destroying the city. But thanks to the memories of my previous life and the experience gained in Wiscott, I know that many miners simply work as hard as they can to feed their families. They do not even suspect that the river they pollute through the food chain ultimately causes harm to themselves and their children. Therefore, I do not think that the people in the city are so bad that they deserve complete extermination. So I decided to stop the water spirit. As for the city, its lord and the mines, I was sure that as a friend, as a mentor, the stinking gnome would come up with something. And I, as a high elf living in this world, must do what only I can do. I looked at the abundantly flowing water of a spring located in the upper reaches of the river. Everything suddenly became clear to me. The spirits living in such sources sometimes even become the object of religion. It was no wonder that this particular spirit had such great power. Even raising a city or two to the ground will not be difficult for him. There was a dense fog around the source, blocking the progress of people. Usually, such fog misleads people into returning to where they came from. But in this place, everything is not so simple. If someone, having decided to approach the source, steps inside, then the will of the fog will turn the moist air that has entered the victim's lungs into water and drown the intruder. This shows how angry the spirit of water living in the source is with people. That is why only Irina, an elf spirit whisperer, could approach the source. As for her human comrade, the warrior Cliff, all he could do was pitch his tent on the edge of the fog and wait for the girl who lonely visits the spirit every day. These must have been heartbreaking days for him, to be able only to watch a friend risk his life every time. When night fell, tormented by a sense of his own powerlessness, he strained his nerves to the limit, protecting the peace of Irene. Not surprisingly, I was greeted by a face with emaciated cheeks and reddened eyes. Relief could be clearly read in those eyes when Cliff saw me behind Martin. The girl immediately jumped up to her friend, noticing that he was holding on with all his strength and supported him by the shoulder. I couldn't help but smile, watching the mutual trust between the two. I even felt a little jealous. It's not that I don't have friends, but it's not the same as having a comrade in arms that you can rely on for everything. Ah, but this time, I am completely confident that the stinking gnome will be able to deal with Galareto and his lord. We, like White Lake, are fighting in different places for the same goal. Maybe I can call him my comrade in arms. Having reached this point in my thoughts, my mood even lifted. Great job, both of you. As soon as Irina returns, find a better place and have a good rest. For people, the environment here is too harsh. Although they are outside the fog, this does not mean that the fury of the spirit will not reach them here. And feeling a constant threat, a person will not be able to rest either in body or soul. That is why I advise them to retreat as quickly as possible. However, this will have to wait until I relieve Irina, so I must hurry to the source. Leaving the two behind, I entered the fog. Although it is capable of drowning a person almost instantly, it will not cause me any harm. Not only this, but on the contrary, he himself made way for me, paving the right path. It seems that those on the other side were expecting my arrival. Whatever you say, Irina is clearly getting better and better. Mr. Ace, turning around, Irina greeted me with a voice combining joy and relief. It took Martina two weeks to get to Visco, and the same amount to bring me here. As a result, Irina waited for me for a whole month. If this were a date, she would definitely leave me. Well, there's no one to leave me anyway. Are you tired of waiting? You did a good job. I'm even proud to know you. Putting my hand on her shoulder, I approved of the elf and stood next to her. Player substitution time. I just kept asking him to wait for Mr. Ace, Irina said with annoyance and regret. However, this was more than enough for me. If it weren't for her, the spirit would have attacked the city long ago. And for my conversation with him, everything is already ready. 
which is also no less important. Moreover, the very fact that the girl was able to restrain the spirit of water for a whole month already shows her abilities as a caster, as I believe with all my heart that she should be more proud of herself. Everything is in order. You can trust me with the rest. I'll pay off the hotel fee in full. Your comrades are waiting for you, so you better hurry. I told the elves and moved forward with a confident step. I realize that now is the time to show Irene how reliable I am, so that later it will be easier to convince her to finally allow me to buy my own house. A spring full of clear water appeared before my eyes, and also a spirit shamelessly exhibiting the naked body created from this water, taking the form of a young girl, a very beautiful water spirit. But everything was spoiled by the presence of a huge water snake, formed in a ring around the source and personifying the anger of the spirit. If this snake starts to rage here as it pleases, then it will mow down everything around. However, I did not feel threatened at all, since I knew that the water spirit was not so stupid as to destroy its own home. If you draw a weapon that you clearly don't intend to use, it will be taken as nothing more than a joke. Having confirmed that Irina had quietly left this place, I took a deep breath and raised my head. Spirits listen to the words of an elf because they consider them close to them, but inexperienced creatures like children. By the same principle, individuals can also be born among people, albeit very rarely, who are able to convey their voice to the spirits. And although the spirits can help the elf, calm him down or console him, they will never be convinced by such words. This is akin to how a child, no matter how true his arguments are, often remains ignored by adults. Of course, this is nothing more than a comparison, because the perception of spirits is different from that of humans and elves, and for them there is no clear concept of children. So this time, the spirit of water, possessing enormous power, mistook the elf who came to him every day for a child, who persuaded him to wait a little. But in the case of the High Elves, everything is completely different. The soul of a High Elf leaves the body after death and becomes a spirit. Although I don't know how true this judgment is, because I have never seen with my own eyes the moment of the High Elf's death. The main thing is that such a soul is on the same level as spirits, that is, it is an immortal essence. That is why the spirits perceive the High Elves as their equals, and not only hear their words, but often even respond to them. They help us with advice, develop friendly feelings towards us, and strive to deepen mutual understanding. That's why Irene did the right thing by giving up in her attempts to persuade the spirit and deciding to call me. After all, only words of conviction spoken by a high elf can reach a spirit raging with rage, However, I'm not sure whether she knows or not, but for ordinary elves there is one way to persuade a raging spirit. Instead of trying to convey your words to this spirit, you need to ask another, who has no less strength of spirit, to become a mediator. However, in this case there is a danger that, due to the difference in perception between mortals and spirits, the transmitted words may be greatly distorted. Again, we cannot exclude the possibility that the spirit called to help may become imbued with negative feelings after seeing a situation similar to the current one. So, even if Irina knew about this, or even thought of this herself, then this is the very last method when there is absolutely no other way out, otherwise you can only aggravate the situation. O oh, noble lady! Living in an excellent source, would you mind telling us why you are so angry? In the case of a conversation with spirits, praising the interlocutor is not something meaningless. But unlike people, in a conversation with them you need to praise not the spirits themselves, but the environment in which they have settled. Therefore, words like, A spirit living in a lake filled with the purest water, or a spirit living in a spring that provides abundant water, are a manifestation of the highest respect for the spirit. But in cases like this, where the groundwater was contaminated with heavy metals, excessive words can instead lead to increased anger, so I chose simple praise. 
And also, we must not forget that in addition to the words themselves, the emotions put into them are no less important. When you talk to spirit, everything becomes transparent, so you cannot hide your true emotions. Otherwise, you will never be able to gain the trust of your interlocutor. I think it goes without saying that if you say things that are not in your heart, they may even get angry with you. What came out of the water spirit's mouth could not be put into words. Either an angry exclamation or just a very high-pitched sound. But even so, all her intentions were unmistakably perceived by me from her voice. This was her way of answering my question. It turned out that she was angry not only that her river was being polluted by drainage water. According to her, there used to be a settlement of a national minority that reveres nature. But because the interlocutor is a spirit, it is difficult to say how long ago it was her before. The people who lived here, going out to hunt, thanked the forest. Having caught the fish, they were grateful to the river and every time they bowed to the source when they came to drink the water. And their respect also extended to the spirit that settled in this source. They sincerely worshipped her as their deity. In turn, the spirit of water also treated well those who loved and revered it. She always made sure that their lands were not flooded by floodwaters, and that the fields did not dry out without rain. It seems that despite the hatred she now radiates, she used to be an unimaginably kind spirit. However, the deeper that kindness was, the deeper the anger became when things turned out this way. Good relations were built between the people who lived here and the spirit, but at one unfortunate moment, people who came from outside extended their hands to these lands. The national minority lost the battle, and their already small population was reduced even further, and the survivors were absorbed by the incoming tribe. The spirit of water was greatly saddened by this, but for her, such battles were natural, like a battle for territory between two packs of animals. If she is not asked for help, she will not lend a helping hand, and the losing people did not seem to want to drag their revered deity into their conflict. I didn't quite understand from her story whether it was the current king or not, but these lands were conquered, and the few survivors mixed with the invaders and managed to maintain their faith. However, even their descendants were expelled after they strongly protested against the development of mines in these mountains. People who came from outside drove away the offspring of those she cared for. They not only had no respect for water, but they also polluted the river. Because of them, the fish died and the plants withered. However, the water spirit's anger was caused not only by all this, but also by the fact that she blamed herself for not intervening in time. Even if they didn't ask her, even if they were angry with her, she had to protect those who loved her, because what was lost could no longer be returned. That is why, in order to prevent the complete desecration of the land that she loves, that they loved, the spirit of water, this time decided not to hesitate and wash away all the invaders. And at that moment a cute child appeared and showed her respect. The spirit's heart was healed a little, but it was because of this creature that she became even more convinced of everything. For the past, and for the sake of the world in which this child lives, all this evil must be cleansed. In other words, well, in general, Screw it. As always, the words of the spirits, although short, contain a lot of information that's crazy. It is clearly visible that the spirit of water has already decided everything for itself, and it's a bummer. There was so much grief accumulating in her heart that I think it was useless to stop her, because this is no longer a question only about the minds. Moreover, my emotions, as I listened to the story, also began to adapt to it. In such a situation, no more words will make her change her mind. So I decided, since I couldn't stop it, I needed to change my goal. After all, the opponent is water. Holding back the rushing tide is a difficult and absurd task, perhaps even impossible. However, if you change the direction of water flow, you can significantly reduce the damage. Exactly. This is one of the methods included in the concept of flood control. 
I didn't think that, as a high elf, I would ever have to remember such things. Oh well, this is also a good experience. I understand your feelings perfectly well, and I have no words to contain them. But let me say just one thing. If this continues, then the water will wash away the wrong target for which you should direct your anger. Because I listened to the spirit's words, understood them, and showed solidarity, she was also in the mood to listen to my words. So I told her everything. And the fact that because of her now only weak creatures suffer, knowing nothing, only working as hard as they can, not realizing that they are doing evil, creatures who are forced to obey orders, mothers who are desperately trying to raise their children, who do not yet distinguish between good and evil, babies who know neither sins nor respect, that there is not much difference between the children living now and the children of the people she protects, and the fact that she herself, from a goddess revered by others, would turn into evil, so hated by her. And the main thing is that the powerful people who are guilty of everything are hiding in a safe place. If you wash everything here with water, they will only experience slight difficulties, but because of this, they will not disappear. I also told her that a friend of mine was currently working on a pollution issue. And although this does not mean that everything will improve immediately, it will at least begin to change for the better. Oh, spirit of water, that is why I ask you, please do not make a mistake in the target to which you direct your anger. If we talk about results, then Galaretto somehow escaped its destruction. The problem in the mines was made public, and on the initiative of the Miners Guild, or rather by order of the gnomes who are its members, all necessary measures are being taken. Also, all future development of mineral ores was decided to be carried out only after a thorough investigation, and only with the assistance of the Guild. Thanks to the facts provided, it was proven that the cause of all diseases is drainage water, and the spirit of water, in turn, is also affected. Therefore, the task accepted by White Lake was considered completed without any problems. In other words, everything was resolved peacefully and without irreparable mistakes. Accused of incompetent mining management, Lord Galaretto was removed from his position, and the people expelled for protesting were given amnesty and returned to their homes. Sometime later, the former Lord Galaretto was discovered in his home, committing suicide by dipping his head in the wash basin. And three more days later, the king of Ludoria, who appointed him to the position, died by drowning in a huge bathtub. Rumors spread throughout the country that the demoted Lord Galaretto hated the king so much that he cursed him in exchange for his life. The truth remained in the depths of the dark waters. Note per. Although the chapter turned out to be longer than usual, I could not find a suitable place to break it into two parts without disturbing the flow of the story, so I decided to leave it as is, even if this delayed the release a little. Three years have passed since the stinking gnome accepted me as a student. Starting with just nails, I gradually learned how to create almost all household utensils. And then finally, the day came when I was allowed to start training and making armor and weapons. I would like to think so, but the equipment, the utensils, the basic principles turned out to be the same. And although special technical techniques are used to create reliable equipment used in battles, in essence, nothing has changed in the forging process itself. All I had to do was give the workpiece a shape, constantly keeping in mind how and for what purposes the item would be used in the future. In words, everything turns out to be quite simple, but when it comes to putting it into practice, you realize that everything is much more complicated than you thought, although it's fun at the same time. During all this time that I devoted myself to blacksmithing, my muscles have become quite strong. And although I cannot yet be compared with a pumped-up mentor, I am sure that among the elves I will no longer find equal. I think when I finish my training here, it will be nice to master some kind of weapon that will allow me to make full use of my new physique. If we talk about my friends who wield a sword, the first one that comes to mind is Cliff, Irina's comrade. 
I think if I ask him to teach me fencing, he will agree with a smile. It's just that he, or more precisely, White Lake, was recently promoted to seven stars, and they began to receive personal assignments one after another, even from very remote cities. Therefore, they are quite busy now, and it would not be very good in such a situation to ask to teach me simply because of my curiosity. Maybe it was because I was always thinking about other things, but when I showed the forged sword to the stinking gnome, he just chuckled and ended today's lesson. Well, I was not at all offended by this, since I myself understood that this time I had failed. It is precisely because the mentor always clearly expresses his opinion that I can correctly assess my own abilities and put more effort into practice. And the fact that I'm not angry only shows my immaturity as a blacksmith. If you can't fully concentrate, then continuing to forge is just a waste of time. And in the worst case, it can even cause injury. So now I better give up and switch to working behind the counter. Towards evening, just as I stood behind the counter, a lonely young man visited the store. And although his appearance was miserable, the atmosphere he emitted did not belong to a homeless mongrel. Although he obviously leads a difficult life, and he has to earn his own food, his straight back and expression of conceit shows that he is not at all ashamed of this. Nice young escape. He looked around the inside of the store with deep interest and headed towards the shelf on which goods were displayed for sale. Naturally, the equipment forged by the stinking gnome will never end up on this shelf. Everything placed there are things forged by me and, although with difficulty, recognized by the mentor as suitable for use. Since these are training products, the prices are correspondingly low and they are popular among novice adventurers. In other words, the young guy who visited us today is most likely a newcomer who has saved up some money from running small errands in the city. It has become standard practice for adventurers living in Wiscoth to visit the nearby Pula Forest to mine materials and hunt monsters. Even White Lake littered with contracts, does not hesitate to dive deep into the forest when they have free time. Although I was interested in what they plan to do after earning so much money, it seems that for them, the adventure itself has long become much more important than money. But even if someone plans to go to Pula just to collect herbs or the like, this does not change the fact that this forest is full of dangerous monsters. Therefore, the availability of self-defense means is fundamentally important. Knowing this, novice adventurers first save money for weapons by completing various small errands within the city. And although the product I forged is relatively cheap, for beginners even such a purchase is a major one, and they always take their choice seriously. That's why I don't bother with unnecessary advice. Naturally, if asked, I will select something that is ideal for your skills, preferences, and budget. But I think it's rude to interfere when someone wants to independently choose the equipment on which their life will depend in the future. Of course, sometimes it also happens that some beginner decides to choose a weapon that he clearly cannot handle, or simply takes the first one that comes to hand. In such cases, I will not remain silent. After some time, the young man chose a morning star. Good decision. Morgenstern is a type of weapon that does not have a cutting edge with a metal tip using crushing blows. To some extent, it can even be called a mace. Its main advantage is durability. Again, because the center of gravity is close to the tip, it can easily make a powerful attack with just a good swing. On the trade-off, it is harder to maneuver than a sword, so it is not intended for feints. In other words, if the enemy is a human, then it will be difficult for you to hit. But if it is a monster, then you can hit him with all your heart. And also, this is a good choice against well-armored opponents who cannot be taken with cutting weapons, easy to handle, and produces good power, a thing that can be recommended to any beginner with sufficient muscles. However, many novice adventurers have gotten it into their heads that since they are warriors, they must carry a sword, and they treat such striking weapons with disdain. Excuse me. I wanted to buy this, can you tell me? I don't have any suitable protective equipment, and I have enough money to meet it, the guy asked, taking out a handful of coins, a little ashamed. Indeed, 
Due to the fact that the Morning Star does not have a cutting edge, its price is much more reasonable than other weapons. Can you handle it with one hand? Are you staggering because of the weight? If not, then it would be nice to take a shield. If it's heavy, then the shield will only be a burden, and it's better to think about how to hold the weapon more firmly. Again, if, if you're planning to go to Pulha, then you need to protect your legs with at least leather armor, I jabbered, delighted that the guy finally decided to ask me. Doesn't it make you feel like a capable salesperson when people rely on you? I can feel it. While high elves do not require protective equipment in the forest, it would be a mistake to expect the same from humans. So frankly, it would be better to minimize the exposed areas of the body by wearing a helmet, bracers, and greaves. In a deep forest, you can get hurt even just while running carelessly. But considering a guy's budget, it's better to protect your upper body with a thick jacket and your lower body with protective gear. Unlike people who walk on two legs, most monsters in the forest move on four legs or even crawl. Therefore, they are often shorter than people. Moreover, with a weapon in your hands, you can protect your upper body quite well, but it's harder to preserve your legs. But a person is a creature whose legs should be damaged, and he will fall and be killed without the opportunity to do anything. That's why you should first prepare armor for your legs, and later, as you earn money, buy everything else. I think this is the best option in cases of young men. Ideally, of course, it would be better to continue completing tasks inside the city until there is enough for full equipment, but it's not up to me to decide. I am required to answer only the questions asked. Maybe it's just my baseless intuition, but I think this guy will make a good adventurer. One has only to look at how he waves his morning star, trying it on, and you can immediately see that, although he is a beginner, his body is well developed and the foundations have been carefully laid. This is not given from birth, but is acquired through long and hard training. Looking at the young man, it suddenly dawned on me. Although it depends a little on whether he is lucky to find reliable comrades or not, but if everything goes well, he will definitely be able to save some money and visit the store again to buy better equipment. Well, of course, maybe he will stop by before then to get some repairs, but in the near future he will clearly be missing just such simple equipment. And it will be very pleasant if at this moment he again chooses the weapon forged by me. It's just that we need to do everything possible to ensure that he survives until that day, and I'd better improve my skills. Just thinking about it made me feel extremely motivated. After listening to a simple way to care for a weapon and learning about the need for regular maintenance, the guy introduced himself and thanked me. After that, he left the store contentedly clutching his morning star. The guy's name was Astra. Even if not for shopping, I was looking forward to his next visit. It is very difficult to determine the age of a high elf by his appearance. Rather, even impossible because we have bodies that are not subject to aging. However, the men of the gnomes who wear a beard, from young to old, are in no way inferior to the elves. That is why I was shocked to such an extent that my lower jaw practically reached the floor when I heard what exactly the mentor told me. This happened exactly ten years after I became a blacksmith's apprentice. The stinking gnome received a letter from his homeland, telling him to marry his bride and inherit the family business. Since he has already spread his name not only in Visca, but throughout the entire kingdom of Ludoria, his practice in the human world is considered complete. Simply put, it was a demand for his return to the land of the dwarves. The lifespan of gnomes is three to five times longer than that of humans, which means it is approximately 200, 300 years. My mentor will turn 90 in a couple of years. In other words, by human standards, he was a young man, not yet 30 years old. Judging by his blacksmithing skills and full of self-confidence and dignity, I thought that he was certainly approaching old age. Therefore, the cruel truth came as an incredible blow to me. Besides, bride, seriously. And although I understood that it was rude, I couldn't help but laugh. It was so inconsistent with the appearance of a stinking gnome. Naturally, without leaving my place, I received a tasty poke. 
Well, okay, perhaps this all happened at a very opportune moment. Over these 10 years, in addition to me, the mentor accepted several more students. It cannot be said that there were not those who did not expect excuses at all, but still the majority were talented people who became skilled and subsequently opened their own workshops. And in general, the blacksmiths who apprenticed to the dwarf were already recognized as full-fledged masters, and to tell the truth, they possessed very remarkable skills. Asking a dwarf to teach you blacksmithing when you are a completely inexperienced beginner is the height of arrogance, and this is common sense in the world of farriers. No, well, I didn't know. The students who came after me, all as one, were shocked by my presence, but since the stinking gnome accepted me voluntarily, that's okay. I was satisfied with our relationship with him. Be that as it may, even if the mentor leaves Viscott now, this does not mean that there will be no good masters left in the city. They are like sown seeds that sprout and sprouted into strong trees. Although it's sad to admit this is also the right time for me to say goodbye. After all, the changes over these ten years lie not only in the increased number of forges. For example, the best group in this city, which had the highest rank among adventurers, White Lake, was disbanded three years ago because the warrior Cliff and the priestess Martin got married and had a child. The more important thing is that they are both people whose peak physical abilities are very short. Before weakening and making an irreparable mistake, they decided to retire and raise a new generation. I think this was the right decision. Being an elf and then having nothing to do with aging Irene, even after the disbandment of the group could not forget the exciting days of adventure and went on a journey in search of new comrades. Perhaps she wanted me to go with her. But knowing that I would not give up my training in blacksmithing in the middle, I said goodbye with a smile on my face and, leaving at last like a worried mother a bunch of instructions, I left the city. Rodner, who was a simple guard when I first arrived in the city, has been promoted and is now the chief of the guard. And although he no longer guards the gates personally, this has not in any way affected the trust placed in him by the residents of the city. To this day, from time to time, we go for drinks together at that same diner. Astra, who was just a youth, became a fully accomplished warrior. It's true. It seems that, not so long ago, he was promoted to five stars, which, although inferior to in the days of their prosperity, is still a sign of a completely successful adventurer. Ten years cannot be called a long time for a high elf. But still, I feel that these years were more eventful than my entire life in the deep forest. And much of what happened was the merit of the stinking gnome, and the fact that, although he cursed, he still accepted me as a student. So, I'm going to return to the land of the gnomes, and what do you intend to do now? My benefactor asked me. And that's right, where should I go next? I have an interest in too many things. A sword and maybe magic? I'll go to the capital and enter a dojo or a magic academy. Fortunately, I've saved up a lot of money. I've saved a lot over ten years of working in a store. I also have a tidy sum left as rent by Irene, who, claiming to be worried about my lack of common sense, took over from me after I moved out of the hotel and bought my own house. So I can easily learn both fencing and magic without worrying too much about finding a job. Eh? You can borrow the power of spirits, but still want to study magic? You come up with strange things, however, as always. Well, okay, it's up to you. Wherever you go, stinking elf, no ace. Nothing will change one thing, fact. You are my best student and good friend. For the first time, my mentor called me by name, making me very surprised. I turned away out of embarrassment. Ha, that's not funny like him but I still didn't laugh. Until now, I didn't know that at the moment when you are happy, really happy from the bottom of your heart, what comes out is not laughter, but tears. Hearing what he called me, for the first time, I decided to accept this nickname, Ace, for my real name. Ha ha ha, what is this? It doesn't look like you at all. And although I, being an elf, no, being a high elf, will not be able to go to the land of the gnomes, 
I will never forget that you, Aswald, are my mentor and friend. I answered in a trembling voice and extended my right hand, and he, my friend, shook that hand tightly, after which we finally laughed heartily. Good. This doesn't suit you. It's your good side that you don't hesitate to poke around like a madman in any place you want. However, Ace, it turns out you were a high elf all this time. Aswald hit me in the chest, and although it was a little painful for some reason, at the same time it felt warm in my soul. It's a pity, but we probably won't be able to talk like this anymore. However, at the moment when I came to this sad thought, the mentor, who did not lose his smile, told me, Okay, give me fifty years. In fifty years, come to the land of the gnomes. During this time, I will become the best blacksmith in the country. I will get the throne, and I will make sure that the elves can come and have fun. Therefore, at this time, you can come with your head held high and proudly declare that you are my student. And these are not empty fantasies. For dwarves, the most important thing is blacksmithing. If your skill is good enough, then not only the respect of others and social status, but you can get whatever you want, even a crown, exactly. In other words, I am the friend and disciple of the future dwarf king. Oh, what an honor it is. Then I will also make every effort so that my skills do not disappear. No, even so that they move one more step forward. Aswald nodded proudly at my words, and a month later he left the country of people. One of his students inherited the mentor's weapon shop, and he left me a license of the highest level issued by the Blacksmiths Guild. This document is valid not only in the kingdom of Ludoria, but also in all countries around, and indicates that its owner is a first-class master. The guild, heavily influenced by the dwarves, was very reluctant to grant a license to an elf. But according to rumors, the mentor was able to suppress this resistance, sometimes with skill, sometimes with persuasion, and sometimes with his fists, and still ensured that they gave me the documents. In short, this is our pride. For the next few weeks, I locked myself in the forge, borrowed from the apprentice who had inherited the shop, and carved myself a knife from the fang of the great wolf, carefully, slowly, little by little, after which, hanging the completed knife on my belt, I left Viscott behind. It takes ten days to get to the capital by cart, even more if you walk. However, reveling in the thrill of finally completing my long-awaited masterpiece, I decided to enjoy a walk to the capital. For the first time in a long time, I took out Apua from my luggage, picked more than ten years ago, but never losing its freshness and chewing it, set off on the road. Note Purr The first arc of the book has ended. A new volume, a new city, and new meetings await us ahead. Well, in the absence of Apua chewing cookies, I will continue to work for you on the next arc called The High Elf and the Princess of the Sword. Viscott, located next to the Pulha Forest, is the westernmost city of the Kingdom of Ludoria, and Galareto, which I visited earlier, is on the northern border. The capital, as expected, was located in the very center of the country. Although this is not exact, if we assume that the cart travels an average of 80, 100 kilometers per day, then the distance from edge to edge of Ludoria turns out to be approximately 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers. Even if we take into account that these are very rough estimates, although the kingdom of Ludoria cannot be called large, it leaves the impression of a spacious country. In this connection, being the center of concentration of people and goods, the capital, Wofiel, although it is obvious, is a more prosperous city than Wiscott. Wofiel is surrounded by several layers of tall walls, although I find this unnecessary due to its location in the very center. If the enemies invade all the way here, then it doesn't matter whether the capital survives or not, but the kingdom will definitely fall. Well, I don't really care about that. Residents of the capital live inside these walls, but the poor, who cannot obtain citizenship, huddle in the slums formed outside the walls. 
it is easy to understand that based on the size of the capital, the slums in its vicinity are also not small. But they say that even despite this, the situation in the gate area is calm. But as soon as you go deeper into the slums, you find yourself in a lawless zone in which all types of crime flourish. And although I was a little curious, now I have another goal. You can experience danger even after you get used to capital life and have time to get tired of it. In all cities of the kingdom of Ludoria, a tax is collected when crossing the gates. Well, yes, the same one. 20 copper coins if you have an identity document, and if not, a silver one. Due to the fact that I lived in Visca for a long time and was not late in paying taxes, I was recognized as a citizen. And although this applies only to Viscot, it is still a confirmation of my identity. Again, I have in my hands a blacksmith's license of the highest level, obtained for me with great difficulty by Aswald. It also serves as a convincing proof of identity. In principle, one of these two is sufficient. But since I plan to stay in the capital for a long time and do not want to start working right away, I decided to use the Viscott Citizen card. But after thinking carefully, I still showed the guard my license, reasoning that perhaps I might need to use the forge in the future. An elf blacksmith living in the city came to the capital to study magic and fencing. Although I know that you shouldn't say that, but damn, you're a strange guy, I mean, an elf. The guard laughed when he heard the reason for the visit and compared the documents three times in my face. And although it's hard to call it laughter, more like a forced smile, but since I didn't feel any enmity or hostility from him, it's okay. However, strange elf? Well, I was so used to what my mentor called me that I wasn't even offended by something like that. When I worked in a shop, I heard from merchants I knew that a healthy gatekeeper is a sign of a safe city. And vice versa, if you are asked for a bribe upon entering, then you need to be extremely careful in such a city. The guard's behavior is a mirror reflecting the Lord's policies and the mood of the townspeople. If judged by such standards, then the behavior of this particular soldier falls into the favorable category. However, although he used a friendly manner of speech, he still constantly maintained a certain level of wariness towards me and those around me. This is proof that there is something in the area that requires vigilance. Although I didn't know whether he was on guard because of the presence of slums nearby, the increased incidence of smuggling, or because the city was not so safe inside, I better be on my guard. Welcome to Wofiel, the guard greeted me with a standard phrase as he returned my documents. After arriving in the capital seething with passers-by, the first thing that needed to be done was to find a hotel. No matter how things turn out, you still need a place to live. And since I don't know anything or anyone here, it would be safer to avoid cheap lodgings. On the contrary, I will feel more relaxed if I stay in an expensive place first. Ask me why. Yes, because in this world a high price is the equivalent of good service. Of course, this includes the quality of the furniture in the room and the taste of the food served. But most importantly, customer safety is also included here. Of course, you can't say anything with complete confidence until you know about the security system and look at the staff. But still, in this regard, it's easier not to make a mistake if you choose an expensive hotel. Now, having lived among people, I understood why Irina did not allow me, who had just left the forest, to move. And anyway, no one said that you can't move after choosing a place to stay for the night. First, I'll stay somewhere decent. And then, if I find something more suitable in terms of service, safety, and food, I'll immediately move out. Again, my purpose for coming to the capital is to find a dojo or magic academy, and I wouldn't want to live too far from the place of future training. In short, a serious search for a base for activity in the capital can be postponed until I get used to it here. However, during the search, one thing extremely attracted my attention. A street performer, or rather, a swordswoman. The sword in her hands could hardly be called something worthwhile, even if you tried to pay a compliment. However, the girl, 
after a short concentration, swung it horizontally and perfectly cut the fruit placed on the pedestal in two. To me, it looked a little unreal. All my accumulated experience as a blacksmith told me that swinging such a sword, at best you can chop the fruit, at worst, turn it into paste. Perhaps we should put it a little differently. You need to have good skills to turn it into a paste. An inexperienced swordsman will simply send him flying. But despite all this, the fruit was cut. I could hardly restrain myself from going up and checking the sword. Even looking from afar, I did not think that I could make a mistake in assessing the weapon. Moreover, it would not be polite to show suspicion towards a warrior who showed such excellent skill. So I took out the silver one and walked up to her. Thinking she had shown me something good, I handed her the money. She was momentarily stunned by the brilliance of the coin handed to her, but immediately bowed in gratitude. Unfortunately, as entertainment, her performance was too low-key, and no one left anything except me. However, after seeing such an interesting sword technique on the first day, I was satisfied. Surely the capital is full of amazing swordsmen, and I too can learn something similar. Just thinking about this, my heart began to pound wildly. And although I planned to find the Magic Academy first, at that moment I changed my mind. It's late today, so I need to find a place to stay for the night. But tomorrow the first thing I'll do is go in search of a dojo. Having firmly decided everything for myself, I left this place. After asking around here and there, I found out that there are currently three large dojos teaching fencing in the capital. They are popularly known as the Three Great Sword Schools. Until recently, there were four of them, but one went bankrupt and no longer accepts students. Among these three schools, one is the official style used by the Royal Knights, Ludorian Fencing. As one would expect from a school bearing the kingdom's name, it has the largest following. Among them are mainly knights and children of nobles, so she is in a special position. Since it is wielded mainly by knights, this style is a very righteous, no-dirty-trick set of one-handed sword and shield techniques. And although other weapons are used in the dojo, such as spears and bows, if we talk about military training in the capital, then Ludorian fencing is the first thing that comes to mind. In other words, a very ordinary and boring style, so it was immediately rejected by me. Next on the list is the school to which the leader of the former cliff belongs, Rodlin style of two-handed sword. As the name suggests, this school specializes in the use of huge two-handed swords, allowing you to heroically crush your enemies. Also, in addition to fencing, this dojo also teaches hand-to-hand -hand combat, which allows you to evade enemy attacks. This allows the armor worn to be minimized to that which only covers vital parts of the body. This reduces the overall weight of the equipment, giving the user additional agility. The last one is Glenda's fencing style. And although he uses a shield and sword just like Ludorian fencing, but unlike him, he pays more attention to defense. Although it is called the sword style, it is more like the shield school hitting with a shield or repelling the enemy's weapon, breaking the balance and only then finishing with a sword is the so-called ideal way of fighting Glenda. This style also does not suit my nature, so I was excluded from the list without hesitation. As a result, among the three great schools, only the Rodlin style remained. This, of course, does not mean that there are no other dojos in the capital, but Cliff also belongs to this school and you have to start somewhere. So I decided to go on an excursion. Hmm, however, looks like luck is not on my side. No, if I hadn't seen the skills of that swordswoman yesterday, I would undoubtedly have decided to study the Rodlin style, but now that graceful swing of the sword is firmly embedded in my memory. So much so that I didn't find the sight of beefy men waving huge swords at all exciting. I even began to think that if I wanted to learn this style, it would be much better to return to Wiscott and ask Cliff to teach me. And all because, not to mention his followers, even the mentors here were not even close to him in terms of skills. It depends on how you look at it. It's possible that I was even lucky.
If I hadn't met that girl yesterday, I might have ended up becoming a student here. However, things take a bad turn. At this point, yesterday's swing has become something of a standard for me. The problem is that the ability to cut fruit is not something amazing. And in order to perform such a technique, the swordswoman concentrated her spirit for a long time. And this is a weak point because in a real battle, no one will give you so much time to carry out an attack. That is why, although that sword was beautiful, it is not practical. I understood this perfectly well, but I still wanted to learn just such beautiful fencing. Ah, that's it. Now I have only one choice left. After leaving the dojo, I immediately rushed to the street where the swordswoman was performing yesterday. When I arrived, she wasn't there, so I sat straight down on the ground and waited. But she never came, so I came the next day too. After tossing a couple of coins to other street performers, I learned that this swordswoman appears here every few days and demonstrates her swordsmanship. Because her performances are so low-key, she earns virtually nothing, but has continued to come here regularly for the past year. Therefore, my expectations were not in vain, and one fine day she finally came again. Um, Mr. Elf sitting here, did something happen? It seems like I've already seen you before. The girl turned to me. Oh, apparently she remembered me. Well, the elf who lives outside the forest, like it or not, stands out, but now I'm even grateful for it. In response to her question, I stood up and, staring at her, took a deep breath. And so it was not. I fell in love with the sword I saw that time. Please make me your student. I want to learn this too, I said, bowing my head deeply. Of course, that sword is not about the blade of dubious quality hanging on her belt, but about her skill. Even if I received such a sword, my first instinct would be to find a forge and forge it into something worthwhile. Sorry, but I will pay the fee. I will also do all the auxiliary work. I will do whatever you say, so I beg you, I added, not allowing her to complete the refusal and bowed even deeper. I'm sure she was happy when I complimented her fencing. She probably has some reasons for refusing to accept a student, but these are her reasons, not mine. Right now, I just want to learn sword skills. Therefore, I am ready to smash all obstacles to smithereens. I won't give up for anything. Battle. That's right, it's a battle. You only have to give up a step and you lose. And now she has just taken this step. Being cut off mid-sentence, she could only silently open her mouth a couple of times and fall silent with a worried face. Therefore, without a doubt, I will win this battle. Although I don't know the name of this style yet, I want to become a swordsman who uses it. I continued to advance, not giving her time to come to her senses. I understand. I will listen to you in my dojo. I am sure that you will change your mind when you see him. Finally, after much thought, the warrior gave in, with doubt written on her face. Surely if Aswald were here now, he would share words of compassion with the poor girl, feeling deja vu. So let's go to her dojo, the place where I will learn the way of the sword. Note per. Asterisk school in this work denotes the style, the path of martial arts, and is not used in the sense of an educational institution. To say that the dojo the swordswoman took me to was in poor condition would be an understatement. Although its territory was vast, everything here resembled ruins. Everything in sight had clearly been destroyed by someone. A rickety door, rainwater seeping through a roof full of holes. Columns so rotten that they are ready to collapse at any moment. However, despite all the destruction in the dojo, the residential building located in the very depths looked quite ordinary. This place is a dojo where they taught the Yosogi sword style, which was once considered one of the four great schools of the capital, the girl said, looking sadly at the ruins, as if implying that the rest can be understood without continuing. And of course I understood. To be honest, I heard about Yosogi's style when I was researching information about the dojo in the capital. The head of this school lost in a battle at a sword tournament to a warrior using the Rodlin style, and although a special competition weapon with a dull blade was used, he was killed right in the arena. Well, 
You can easily imagine what would happen if you hit someone like crazy with a hefty two-handed sword, even with a dull blade. But the troubles for Yosogi's school had only just begun. The older students, who had lost their mentor, rushed into the dojo of the killer's school with a vendetta, but they themselves were all killed. Although these two schools had approximately equal strength, Yosogi's heirs fought among themselves for the right to become the next head, so they could not do anything to the united front of the Rodlin school. The followers who were not involved in the vendetta, fearing persecution, left us one after another. And although they did not touch either my mother or me, who was still a small child at that time, the dojo, with the exception of the residential building, it was clear even without continuation. Yosogi's school had met its end. By the way, it was here that I noticed that based on her age, she could still be called a girl. My technique is something that I developed myself from part of the style I inherited from my father. It is not even close to what it should look like in its original form. Right now, it is only suitable for being a performance for the public, nothing more. Yosogi's true style is already in the past, the warrior said in a voice full of sorrow, in a voice riddled with frustration and devoid of all strength, and on her face was written a reluctance to accept the facts and pain from her own powerlessness. If you study the path of the sword here, the followers of the Rodlin school will find out and may cause trouble. I'm afraid it's not worth it. I think you'd better change your mind. These words, although they were clearly spoken out of concern, are they not too contemptuous? Towards me? Has the legacy of Yosogi's style been lost? Problems with some school there? When did this ever bother me? Everything is fine. What I want to learn is not a style that has disappeared in history, but your sword, which you demonstrated then. And besides, the other day, I went on an excursion to the dojo of the Rodlin School. Their warriors are at such a level that no matter how many of them show up, it won't be enough to even frighten me. Exactly. I want to learn exactly her techniques, those that she created with her own hands. Whether they reach the level of Yosogi's former style or not, I don't care at all. Besides, okay, I still understand someone as strong as Cliff. But damn, even if those guys from the dojo come at me in a crowd, all I need is one word of request addressed to the wind spirits, and they will be left without pants. Literally. But hey, naturally, I don't have such a hobby. Don't think so. Ah, but when I said sword, I meant your skill. And besides, don't you think that this sword can't keep up with your skills? If possible, I'd like to reforge it. If you don't mind, don't... Can you lend it to me for a week? I finished off the swordswoman with words who had already fallen into a stupor. If I already said that I am not going to retreat, then nothing can convince me. But, based on the current situation, shouldn't we start with rebuilding the dojo? There won't be any problems with money, but as for a reliable carpenter, I don't have any connections in the capital yet. Well, oh well. Anyway, for some time, no one except the two of us will train here, so we don't need such a big building. Once I get used to the capital, we'll see. If so, then all that remains is to do something with her sword. And at the same time, don't forget to prepare it for personal use. Otherwise, I don't have anything other than a knife. I wonder if I can borrow a forge somewhere if I use my top-tier license. Suddenly, the look of the girl I had half forgotten about turned into one that looked at something impossible to understand. Eh, who are you anyway? Perhaps I pushed it too hard. Come to think of it, I didn't even introduce myself. I am Ace, a high elf from the deep forest. I specialize in the bow, and, if necessary, I can borrow the power of spirits. I also studied with a gnome for ten years, so I am a blacksmith of the highest rank, and also... It was interesting to watch the changes on the girl's face, surprised at every new phrase of mine. Band your student. The first student of Yosogi's new style, I finished and extended my right hand. Although she still couldn't recover from the mixed feelings of stupor, fear, joy, and hope for some time, she eventually shook my hand. And so I found a new teacher, 
and took my first step towards becoming a swordsman. That same day, I checked out of the hotel and moved into a guest room in the house of my new mentor, Kaiha Yosogi. Naturally, I was against it, but she insisted with a gleam in her eyes that looking after the students is the sacred duty of the master, so I gave in. It was probably because, during her childhood, older students often trained in residential dojos that she got the idea into her head. Moreover, although she was wary at first as soon as she became her student, she immediately shortened the distance. I decided that this attitude of hers needed to be corrected before the dojo was repaired and reopened, thinking that this was not normal. So Kaiha's mother, who was waiting at home, was confused that her daughter suddenly brought me into the house. Kaiha's mother suffered from lung disease. She had been in fairly poor health since birth, but the death of her husband, the destruction of the dojo, and malnutrition due to financial problems made things even worse. Kaihi's street performances were to earn money for medicine, but when I saw that it was nothing more than an infusion of herbs, I decided that next time I would start mining the ingredients myself in the nearest forest. Don't forget that I am a high elf. Finding a couple of herbs is a breeze for me, especially since I can collect fresher and more effective specimens. All I need to do is ask about their location near the trees in the area. To start, I gave her some Apua juice. The vital energy contained in these fruits is good for promoting health, certainly better than any cheap medicine. I also sent a letter to Viscuit. The recipient, naturally, is Cliff, the former head of White Lake. He is probably an important figure in the Rodland School since he is the owner of the highest rank of adventurers, Seven Stars. The process of rebuilding the Yosogi School Dojo may attract the attention of enemies, so I asked Cliff to put a spoke in the wheels of the people from his dojo. I have no reason to antagonize them, of course, but if they come looking for trouble, they will get the treatment they deserve. Therefore, it would be better to nip the very possibility of conflict in the bud. Maybe Keha and her mother had their own thoughts on this matter, but I don't think they want the feud to continue so I didn't inform them of anything. The next day, I went to the guild to find a forge that can be rented. Thanks to a top-level license, not only a place was immediately prepared for me, but also all the necessary materials. I was also asked to take on several orders. But naturally, my master's sword had the highest priority, followed by my personal sword. Warning that this would only be after I had finished my business, I agreed to accept work occasionally so that my skills would not be dulled. After that, in order to collect information, I walked around many shops nearby. While purchasing everything I needed for everyday life, I asked the employees and shop owners about this and that. The information that interests me is the attitude of the two other schools towards Yosogi and all because the Rodlin school may be held back by Cliff, but I couldn't say anything about the remaining two. There is a possibility that they will come to challenge Yosogi to increase their own fame among the population, or they simply see our recovery as problematic for themselves. I don't know whether anything will happen or not, but it's better to collect the information necessary to make assumptions. Again, since I am an elf, and my appearance stands out very much, along with the collection of information, I made a completely overt warning with my very appearance. Look, Yosogi's school is supported by an elf. Don't forget, an elf has joined Yosogi's school. Well, or something like that. Then again, if someone has ill feelings towards my master and her dojo, then spreading such rumors might cause them to stir. In other words, I decided to make myself a target for possible aggressors. If something happens to Keiha or her mother, it will interfere with my fencing studies. The necessity of Keiha for my training is a self-evident fact. As for her mother, if something happens to her, the master will have no time to study with me, so I need to protect both of them. I don't think this fits with my role as a student, but I want to do it. Again, this will serve my purposes too, so everyone is happy and satisfied. If we talk about inconveniences, then there was one. Due to the fact that I had to move around all day, I had absolutely no time to study magic. Well, there's nothing you can do about it.
I can learn magic at any time, but if I leave Kaiha in trouble, then her style may disappear, and then I definitely won't be able to study it. Therefore, I decided to forget about magic for a while and focus on learning the way of the sword. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Suddenly, the spirit of the wind whispered in my ear, warning me of the approach of a person who had bad intentions towards me. Turning around, I stared at the approaching man, a shabby-looking man. Looks like a pickpocket. Realizing that he had been spotted, he quickly left the area with a fake smile on his lips. As I thought, public peace and security in the capital is much worse than in Viscott. People from all corners of the kingdom flock here. So the fact that some of them go bankrupt and slide to the bottom of society is inevitable. And unfortunately, the number of people who having reached the edge, decide to covet other people's goods, is not at all small. And although Wiscott, teeming with adventurers due to its proximity to the forest of Pulha, did not have an elegant atmosphere or attractiveness, the people there, I think, were more cordial. Change the place and the people will change too. Thinking about these words from my past life, I continued to wander through the streets of the capital. In the forge rented from the guild, I sat in front of the forge and communed with the spirit of fire dancing among the flames. Looking at him, I concentrated on the upcoming work. Starting today, I started reforging the blade I borrowed from Kaiha and creating my own weapon, as well as several training swords without a blade, exactly matching them in size, weight, and balance. We can say that her sword is a hard worker, having gone through all her training with her, starting from childhood. Keha's current style was developed from techniques passed down to her by her father as a child. If you think about it this way, you can easily imagine her training process. The only way to practice alone is to swing the sword and perform techniques. And although I have not yet learned anything from the master, but only asked around a little about the style of the Yosogi school, I think that my assumptions are correct. But considering that the dojo will soon be rebuilt and Kaiha has a sparring partner, she will soon need training equipment. Therefore, this time I decided to forge several additional swords along the way. Kaihi's sword is a straight blade with a one-sided sharpening, rare in these parts, something between a gross messer and a falchion. It turns out that Yosogi's style came to Ludoria from outside and took root here. Initially, this school used a slightly different shaped weapon, I'm afraid, something very much reminiscent of a katana. And due to the fact that such weapons were impossible to obtain on the territory of the kingdom, a compromise had to be sought using what was available. In truth, since my blacksmith mentor was a master famous even among the gnomes then, of course, I learned how to create everything, even a katana. But I'm afraid that even if I give her such a sword, Keha will only be confused. To begin with, I will start using the katana myself, and if the master shows interest, then I will forge a new sword for it too. For now, I will simply improve the quality of her current weapon without changing the shape and balance. Getting up early in the morning, I ate the breakfast Kahi's mother had prepared and hurried into the forest to get some herbs. Herbs that are highly effective in treating lungs wither very quickly after being picked. Therefore, if possible, the collection of materials for the medicine should be carried out daily. However, no matter how close the forest is to the capital, even taking into account the fact that I practically do not need time to search for the necessary herbs, I returned afternoon. Having had a little snack at a nearby eatery, I immediately headed to the forge. Having worked with the iron until the night, I returned home, and after dinner and a bath I began to prepare tomorrow's portion of the medicine, after which he went to bed, and this process was repeated over and over again for several weeks. One fine day it dawned on me that I had absolutely no time to study fencing. Of course, I understand that this is only a temporary schedule, but still... Once you finish forging swords, your trip to the forge can be reduced to once or twice a week. And having cured Kaiha's mother's illness, there will be no need to spend a good half of the day collecting ingredients. And although I felt sorry for the master who 
Over the joys of having her first student spent several days preparing training plans, she would have to wait a little longer. Well, in order for her mood not to deteriorate at all, the first thing I did was finish and give her her sword. Judging by how touched she was at this moment, she could wait a while longer. If nothing unexpected happens, then I will finish the forging in a couple of weeks, and as for Keha's mother, then, thanks to the healing properties of Apua, everything should get better in two to three months. And although she was initially in poor health, her cough and pale face are gradually disappearing, so at least the lung disease should recede. And although practice with the sword has not yet begun, solving accumulated problems one after another is also a kind of training. Just a couple of days before I was ready to finish making the necessary equipment, I received a letter from Viscott. This was the answer from Cliff. By the way, in the kingdom of Ludoria, of course, there is no post office, so there are only two ways to deliver letters. The first is to ask a merchant you know who you trust, and the second is to hire an adventurer. Merchants, even if they just have a small shop, all, one way or another, have the connections necessary for the supply and circulation of goods. For example, a nearby shop that sells grain buys it from nearby villages and stores it in warehouses rented from large trading companies. So even if you are a grain store, you can pay them a little, and they will forward your letter to one of these villages. However, due to the fact that in this case all letters are transferred en masse to the head of the village, it is almost impossible to conduct correspondence containing secret or personal information. And even if you seal a letter, the head, under the name of checking the contents, can open the seal and read the contents. And although the second method requires more money, it is used when a message needs to be delivered quickly, or it contains something not intended for prying eyes. Letters assigned to the Adventurer's Guild for delivery are passed on to groups moving between cities, and when delivered to the desired city, newcomers who perform all sorts of small work will deliver the letter to the addressee's door. Or, although this will require a much larger sum, you can hire a specific adventurer who will specifically go deliver your letter. In this case, you can clearly discuss how long it will take to deliver, to whom exactly to deliver it, and other small details. Cliff's letter was delivered to me by an adventurer with whom I knew back in Wiscott. This means that he was specifically hired for this job. Having accepted the letter and learned the latest news from Wiscott, I gave the adventurer some money as a thank you. Although he probably received a decent amount for the order from Cliff, it wouldn't hurt to hand over a couple of coins for having to come to the capital specially. And so, in the letter from Cliff, it was written that he had taken on the role of a break for the Rodlin School, so he asked that if something happens, I at least drop him a couple of lines before destroying the dojo. In this case, it will immediately send them a warning. They also mentioned the fact that, in about half a year, he would visit the capital for work and would personally convince his comrades not to poke their nose into my affairs. Yes, I wonder who he even thinks I am. I'm not one of those people who will go and destroy someone else's territory without any warning just because they annoy me a little. No, well, if they do something out of line, then I'm unlikely to be in the mood to write a letter so his request is a little inappropriate. However, will Cliff personally come to the Capitol? After retiring, he remained to teach fencing at the Guild so as not to lose touch with his past as an adventurer. Surely he will want to see the conditions in which I live now. But I'm not sure that it would be a good idea to introduce him to Keha and her mother, since he is a follower of the Rodland School. And even though by the time that incident happened, he had already moved to Viscott a long time ago, logic and feelings rarely get along with each other. Therefore, it was not clear to me whether the master and her mother could accept him. For me, I think that Keha will gain a lot if he can become friends with Cliff, since although his style is different, he has achieved unprecedented heights in the field of fencing. But these are all things that won't change, no matter how much I worry about them. Whether to date Cliff or not, let Kaiha decide for herself. My only job is to tell her that 
He is my friend who will come to keep the Rodlin School from further interference. As a last resort, I can just rent a room in the same hotel as him for a while. And although I can push ahead when it comes to my relationship with someone, resolving issues between someone is too delicate a matter for me. It is at such moments that I understand a little the reluctance of the elves to communicate with the outside world and their habit of seclusion in the forest. True, really only a little. Finally, my training with the sword began. Everything was as I thought. We started with simple swings. Well, there's nothing you can do about it, because this is the basis for mastering any type of weapon. At the same time, the master did the same thing next to me as I did. And it was quite interesting to watch her, compare our movements and gradually adapt to her. She just did all the exercises without telling me anything. Perhaps this is due to the fact that Keha has never taught anyone, and therefore she does not know what to say to a completely inexperienced student. Demonstrating her own techniques, she allowed me to repeat after her and feel the essence of the way of the sword on my own. Only from memories of childhood lessons with her father, she was able to recreate some of the techniques which shows her predisposition to fencing. But this does not mean that everyone else is the same. Perhaps this way of teaching an absolute beginner is a little incorrect. If you don't explain some things from scratch, then no matter how much you look at her execution of the technique, you won't be able to repeat them yourself. However, this method suits me very well. Repeating the same action over and over again, etching all the movements into my memory, is what I did in the deep forest when I trained with a bow. Again, during my training in blacksmithing, I got used to comparing my results with the work of the master. He swung his sword, thought, corrected himself, and swung again. Over time, I learned to do all of this at the same time, which allowed me to significantly reduce the time between swings. Gradually, I began to notice that, although I could exactly repeat all the movements of the master, the trajectory of my sword was significantly different from hers. I realized that the reason for everything was the difference in body structure. Not only were the lengths of our arms and legs different, but also the shape of our pelvis, the degree of flexibility in our elbows and knees, and worst of all, our muscles were completely different. Naturally, no matter how many times I repeat her movements, the results will not be the same. Especially, this was caused by the completely different center of gravity caused by the two heavy weights below her neck. Therefore, I was forced to correct and adjust the movements myself in order to one day achieve the same results as the master, and in the future, surpass her. Yosogi's sword style was originally intended for a katana, so it is based on the use of two hands to swing the sword. But some techniques needed to be performed with one hand, and this was a really difficult task. Even though I'm a high elf, having worked in a forge for ten years, I'm certainly not inferior to Kaiha in terms of muscles. However, compared to her smooth and precise movements, as soon as I take the sword in one hand, its movement begins to resemble the dance of a drunken goblin. Thinking that there must be some secret hidden here, I began to look even more closely at the master's movements and try to perform them myself. And this happened over and over again. Spending time in this spirit, I noticed that six months had passed only when Cliff arrived in the capital. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Before heading to the territory of the Rodlin School, Cliff visited me and, seeing the destroyed dojo, listened with a heavy look to the story of Keha and her mother. The fact that he chose to visit Yosogi's school demonstrated his position. By this, he showed that he had arrived in the capital precisely to support his friend and not the members of his school. From beginning to end, Cliff showed respect for the Yosogi school in his interactions with Keha. If for me, he is nothing more than a strong adventurer, then in the eyes of his daughter and mother he was seen as a noble warrior. To be honest, before they met him, they both had mixed feelings towards Cliff, but by the end of the conversation, their attitude had clearly softened, especially Keha. She clearly wanted to ask Cliff, who is a much superior swordsman, about a lot of things. 
Therefore, it all ended with him being accommodated in a guest room instead of a hotel. In other words, the same development of events as in my case. Looks like I still have a lot of work to do to correct this habit of hers. It looked like Kaiha didn't have much confidence in the techniques based only on her own work, so all her questions were limited to actual battles and the training that preceded them. Cliff was able to grasp what exactly the girl wanted, so instead of the practice methods used in the Rodlin school, he began to tell in detail his personal experience. Although Cliff is a follower of one of the schools, he spent most of his life as an adventurer. Due to this, he often did not have a sparring partner, so he was often forced to practice alone. But in turn, he has a lot of experience fighting against monsters and bandits, so in his training he tried to improve his shortcomings based on this experience. As a result, one of the strongest adventurers was born in the world, who was able to single-handedly play the role of the vanguard in the Seven Star Group. So if you want to understand what your techniques are lacking the most, then real combat is the fastest way to do this. Naturally, this is just what I came to from my personal experience and does not mean that it will suit everyone. Cliff finished his speech and looked at me expectantly. I perfectly understood the meaning of this look. Although from my point of view this conclusion is not at all fun, but as they say, the shortest road is not always the fastest. On the other hand, if Keha cannot complete his techniques, then my sword path will not be perfect. As for me, I am quite happy with Keha's current beautiful sword style, but I can't do anything if she herself is not satisfied with it. Three years, although no, one will be enough. You should try yourself as an adventurer for at least a year. Moreover, on your side is a guy who is the strongest of all the people I know, Cliff advised. He clearly emphasized that I am the strongest he knows and not the most reliable. For him, the most reliable forever will be only Irina and Martin, in other words, comrades from the White Lake. And nothing changed, even though he left his job as an adventurer. Kaiha stared at me as if she was very surprised by Cliff's assessment. I felt so embarrassed that I even turned away. But I told her when we first met that I was good at using a bow and could borrow the power of spirits. Apparently, she didn't think that my skills could be recognized as the strongest by someone as outstanding as Cliff. Of course, this doesn't mean that Cliff and I ever fought together. It's just that the impression left by me after that incident with the water spirit was very deep. However, he greatly overestimates me. If he attacks me from the distance we are at now... I will undoubtedly be cut in half before I have time to react. However, if there is enough distance between us, the result will be the opposite. There's just one problem for Kaiha when becoming an adventurer. If she takes on missions to hunt monsters or capture criminals, then only her mother will remain in this house. I don't think that the master will be able to abandon one mother for a long time, who, although she has recovered, has a weak body and health. The next day, before Cliff went to his school's dojo, Keha asked him to spar with her. He agreed, and both, with training swords in their hands, stood opposite each other. And of course, Keha lost, unable to do anything. To be more precise, the girl did not know what to do from the moment Cliff raised the sword. For her, who had only been persistently practicing her swings and techniques, the enemy, who had no gap in her defense, was too difficult a target. She clearly lacks either the skill to threaten an opponent's life or the determination to do so. To her own regret, Keha was trained enough to know that she had no chance. It was this realization that was the reason for her hesitation and inability to do anything. Looking first at the swordswoman, then at me, Cliff left the dojo. What was left of him was a deep scar on the girl's self-confidence. However, if she cannot recover from such mental trauma, then it is better for her not to continue on the path of the sword. Most likely, Cliff was thinking about this, forcing Kaiha to face his own shortcomings, and I decided to leave the rest to me. Damn what a man he is, but still I am very grateful to him. After all, if Kaiha had learned about her weaknesses by meeting with an enemy weaker than herself, 
This could have caused a mortal wound to her warrior's heart. But even so, Cliff underestimated Keha too much. After all, be that as it may, she is a sword mentor chosen by me personally. Ace, what do I do now? Swinging her sword, Keha asked me after lunch that day. While practicing next to her, I couldn't help but smile at her question. Now the master looks very timid, all because, having gone against Cliff, she completely lost, unable to even bring herself to move. Most of all, she was disgusted not with the loss or the difference in power, but with herself for not even trying to do anything. Her pride as a swordswoman and my mentor is also crushed now. But although it is suppressed, it is not completely destroyed. I mean, what should I do? Isn't the answer clear yet? Well, Master Keha, even after what happened today, you were still able to immediately resume your practice. This means that you have a future. Exactly. Even after experiencing the loss of her father in early childhood, witnessing the destruction of the dojo and the escape of all followers, and caring for her sick mother, she was still able to find the strength to continue her training. Such a person cannot have an outstanding future. At least now Kaiha has me on her side. And although not even a year has passed since I started training, and I have not achieved anything outstanding as a swordsman, the master is no longer alone. This means that she has moved forward compared to the past. Besides, today the girl found out what she was missing. Therefore, I am sure that she herself already knows which path she should follow in the future. Naturally, many obstacles will await her. But even if she is stopped by them and cannot move forward on her own, then in return I will destroy everything to hell for her. If the load on her shoulders is too heavy, then I just need to share it with her. After all, my path of the sword has merged with her path from the very beginning, and we share a common fate. All you have to do is open your mouth and tell me what kind of future you want. I finish my answer without stopping the movement of my hand holding the sword, just like the master. If the decision were up to me, then I think it would be better to just take Kaiha and her mother and return to Wiscott. My house remains there, and the Polka Forest is nearby, so she can fight monsters and not leave her mother alone for a long time. And the problems with Rodlanskaya and other schools there will obviously not concern us. I'm just afraid that the girl will not choose such a simple and naive path. Ace, I understand that I just continue to take advantage of your kindness. This sword, my mother's recovery, and this meeting with Master Cliff are all thanks to you. And although I know that this is arrogant of me, I want more to ask you something. With every movement, her sword felt sharper and sharper. Now, speaking these words to me, she was preparing her heart for the decision she had made. I want to become an adventurer to gain experience in real battles, but I can't leave my mother alone. And although she tells me not to worry about her, she is my only family, the only thing that supports my heart. That's why I... I want to ask you, Ace, my only and reliable student, to keep an eye on her, the girl said, abruptly stopping her hand with the sword. It's clear. That's how it all turned out. Well, if that's what she wants, then fine, although I feel a little left out. As you wish, Master. However, I have two conditions. First, before you begin your activities as an adventurer, allow me to create a set of armor for you. Second, use my house in Viscott as a base for your training. I did not say the condition is that she must return unharmed. I understood that anything could happen in the work of an adventurer. However, this is precisely why my two conditions are undeniable. There is nothing to even talk about weapons, but without suitable protective equipment, it is impossible to carry out normal activities as an adventurer. Whatever one may say, Kaiha will choose missions not to collect medicinal herbs and search for missing cats, but exclusively to combat missions. So I decided to use everything I had learned from Master Asvald and create a set of armor for her that would not prevent her from using the sword as she pleased, but would still protect her body. As for living in my house in Wiscott, this will allow her to use all the connections I have left in this city. And although the dojo was destroyed and bankrupt, Kaiha was treated here like a young lady. 
You could even say that she was the princess of Yosogi school. Therefore, she absolutely does not know how to make money. And this bad habit of hers to immediately trust people made me worry about her. God forbid she runs out of money and gets involved with suspicious people. There will clearly be no time for training here. By using my house, not only can I save on rent, but I can also ask my friends to keep an eye on her so that she doesn't get close to bad people. Although it is difficult to talk about a comfortable life, at least this way she can avoid a situation where she will not be able to exercise due to problems with daily life. I don't mind letting Keha choose the path she takes, but I also want her to let me help her in any way I can. For some reason, I suddenly remembered Irina, who for some unknown reason took care of me in the days when I had just left the forest. Perhaps she experienced the same feelings as I do now. Understood. Until the very end, you... Thank you, Ace. I promise that I will become a master worthy of such a student. Therefore, wait a little. When Keha sheathed her sword and turned around, there was no longer any hesitation or timidity in her eyes. A huge crowd of carpenters were working in the courtyard, dismantling what had once been the Yosogi School Dojo. And although it cannot be said that the rubble disappeared right before our eyes, the speed of progress of the work was still very high, as you would expect from a team of carpenters recommended by the Blacksmiths Guild. I was once again convinced that this world is driven by the power of connections. I suggested taking advantage of the time Keha was away to rebuild the dojo. Since the master entrusted me with the care of her beloved mother, I did not want to leave her alone for a long time. However, because of this, I could not accept the blacksmith work offered by the guild. Then I thought, why not build my own forge on the school grounds? And since I already had plans to restore the dojo anyway, I decided to combine two tasks. In this case, all construction work will be completed at once, and it will be cheaper in terms of money. However, all this required quite a decent amount to the point that I had to spend all my savings. But I wasn't particularly worried since I could easily make money on orders that the Blacksmith's Guild was looking forward to entrusting to me. When Kaiha found out about this, she looked terribly apologetic. But since I was doing all this for myself, I didn't have any problems with it. And although it could not be said that this fully compensated my expenses, I still received a piece of land in the capital for the construction of my own forge. Besides, I plan to continue my sword training even in the absence of the master, so I will also use the repaired buildings. I felt a little sorry for the master because she was preparing to register with the Adventurers Guild and go to Wiscott, so she could not stay to see with her own eyes the restoration of the dojo. When the carpenters showed the construction plans, it was Keha who was the most happy. But upon learning that it would take at least six months to complete all the work, her face distorted into an expression of complete hopelessness. And all because the most time should have been spent on building the forge. But since I need to work, this work had to be completed first. Keha's mother, without any objections, agreed to both the restructuring and the fact that her precious daughter would become an adventurer. Naturally, this does not mean that she did not have any thoughts about this. And although it was difficult for her, who had lost her husband, to watch her only daughter decide to put herself in danger, she only hugged Keha tightly goodbye and thanked me. Even though she is in poor health, I still consider her a strong and noble woman. And since I was entrusted with this, I must thoroughly protect her, at least until the master returns. Since then, two seasons have passed and the work on restoring the dojo has finally been completed. True, this did not greatly affect my daily training. Only the place where I performed swings and techniques moved from the street to the building. Getting up early in the morning, I had breakfast and started practicing with the sword, continuing them until lunch, after which he accompanied Kaiha's mother on her shopping trips. When I returned, I locked myself in the forge until nightfall. The guild always sent its employees to get ready-made equipment, who also delivered me coal, metal, and, of course, a fee. To my surprise, I noticed that since starting my fencing training, 
my blacksmithing skills had risen to a new level. Perhaps the reason for this was that during practice with the sword, I often thought about the effect on movement of the center of gravity of the weapon and armor, and was able to apply the newly discovered conclusions to my work. Due to the fact that the new dojo turned out to be quite large, and rumors about a high-class blacksmith had spread, strange people sometimes began to visit us. Someone shouted that he was a famous warrior and demanded that I forge a weapon for him. Someone complained about the wastefulness of not using such a good dojo and stated that the rights to manage it would be transferred to him. In general, every month one or two fools appeared who spoke complete nonsense. Apparently, the capital of the kingdom of Ludoria, Vophil, is not only a gathering place for traders, adventurers, and workers, but also a gathering place for idiots from all over the country. Naturally, I did not hesitate to get rid of all such uninvited guests. One had only to ask the spirit of the wind, and without any effort he would throw the intruders out of the gate like paper airplanes. Of course, I thought it was a little inappropriate to use the power of spirits to protect a martial arts dojo. But even shoot with a bow, even cut with a sword, whatever one may say, it leads to unnecessary wounds and bloodshed. It would be a shame to stain a dojo that has been restored with so much effort. But if you ask the spirit of the wind, it takes almost no time, and no traces are left. If the opponents belong to some organization, then it would be possible to destroy their base in order to cut off all problems at the root. But unfortunately, most of the weirdos were loners, or at most, belonged to small schools trying to spread their name. In other words, there wasn't even a smell of a sensible base here. It is certainly good that none of the three great schools gave us any trouble. But on the other hand, it was also a little pity, since it would have been a good reason to crush them and make them a memorable example for others. Noticing that my thoughts began to lean in a dangerous direction, I realized that the written words in that very letter from Cliff no longer seemed so funny to me. If we talk about letters, Keha wrote to us about once a month, and although she was sometimes busy on missions, this interval never exceeded two or three months. I entrusted the transfer of correspondence to a merchant I knew who was engaged in the delivery of materials from Viscott to the capital. Naturally, all letters received were first read by Keha's mother. She also wrote the answer. I could read the contents only after that. However, letters addressed to me personally were very rare. Because of my lifestyle, I also didn't have much to talk about, so I only occasionally asked for a few words from myself. Keaha's letters conveyed her joys and sufferings, and her mother and I always looked forward to them. Just a year after she became an adventurer, the master wrote that she had risen in rank to four stars, and not in a team, but alone. And although we were worried that it was too fast and that she was going too overboard, I had faith that Cliff, who lives in Wiscott, would certainly hold her back if necessary. In other words, it didn't mean that she was overdoing it, but she still managed to fulfill all the necessary conditions for promotion with incredible speed. This indicated that she was not only adding stars to her license at a high rate, but was also quickly gaining combat experience and applying it to her training. This means that the seeds planted by her persistent training have not only sprouted, but have already begun to bloom. To be honest, I was even a little jealous of Cliff, who could watch this up close. In the end, I was so in love with her sword that I even asked her to become my master. Well, I could only wait with great anticipation for the day when she would return home. In the second year after Kaiha set out on her journey, I received an invitation from the Blacksmiths Guild to a tournament to choose a master who would forge a sword for the king. As a result, I took third place. The first two went to the gnomes living in the capital. They say that I could even claim second place, but the king prefers ornate weapons, so mine, focused on practicality, ultimately lost. Actually, I think that such things should be said before starting. However, my sword was very much to the liking of the captain of the palace knights, who bought it for a decent amount, so I was pleased with the results. 
Several elves were active in the capital who, having heard about me, began to come to consult about equipment. True, at first they were only attracted by rumors about the existence of an elf blacksmith, but in the end they all ended up on their knees the moment they realized that I was the highest. However, it was enough for me to just say that I did not require special treatment, and they quickly adjusted and began to communicate with me as equals. Say what you like, but the elves who left the forest and became adventurers were, for the most part, originally weird so they could better adapt to the situation. Be that as it may, my number of acquaintances in the capital gradually continued to increase. By the way, this year Keha has already reached five stars. In the third year, the number of orders from nobles transferred to me by the Guild of Blacksmiths began to increase. Probably the reason for this was the fact that the Head of the Knights has only used my sword since then. Although, in principle, no matter what the client's social status, my work has not changed. However, I was already fed up with the fact that envoys from the nobility began to creep in among the uninvited guests visiting the dojo. Someone demanded that their weapons be made with the highest priority. Someone wanted me to become a personal blacksmith in their domain, and someone invited me to boring banquets. And although I refused everyone, some of them were too annoying, so I couldn't do without the proven method with the wind spirit. The influence of nobles in human society may have been high, but this had nothing to do with me, a high elf. After the next batch of guests was thrown out, I filed a complaint with the Blacksmiths Guild. Realizing that I was even more stubborn than even the dwarves, the nobility of the capital gradually gave in and gradually stopped sending their people to me. At the tournament this year, I again only took second place, even though I had well decorated the forged weapon. The dwarf who took first place, the same as last year, is without a doubt an outstanding master. However, the top three in this tournament were always occupied by dwarves. Therefore, the fact that someone managed to get on the podium for two years in a row, moreover an elf, was an unprecedented case. Well, I guess there hasn't been another blacksmith from my people in history, so that's not surprising at all. By the way, as for my training with the sword for the sake of which everything was started, here I have reached a level close to that at which Keha was before she became an adventurer. This is because the image of a master practicing with a sword is clearly etched in my memory, and I use this as an example for my own development. As they say, I followed the well-worn path. From the letter we received at the end of this year, we learned that Keha has received the rank of six stars and plans to soon return home to our dojo. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Since the day we received the last letter from the master, her mother has been preparing luxurious treats every day, waiting for my daughter's return. Naturally, all this remained, but since I couldn't let the good stuff go to waste, I had to eat it all up every time. I'm afraid that if Keha doesn't come back quickly, I'll get noticeably fat. On this day, I practiced with the sword in the morning as usual, accompanied Kaiha's mother to the shops and began to forge metal. As I wiped away the sweat from the heat from the forge, a cool breeze filtered through the half-open door and tickled my skin. And although the forge is supposed to be tightly closed, I deliberately left a small crack, sufficient for the wind to get inside. I did this so that, like this time, the wind spirit could warn me if someone decided to approach the dojo. Uh-huh. Thanks for warning me. I'll go out to meet you now. I hung the sword on my belt and headed towards the gate. If my intuition is to be believed, then my role as watchdog should end today. However, nothing in this world goes as planned. After waiting outside the gate for a while, I saw two figures walking up the stairs. One of them, without a doubt, is Keha. If she could still be called a girl when she set out on her journey, now she has become a beautiful adult lady. The atmosphere emitted by her also changed noticeably. In front of me was no longer that timid young girl, vainly trying to put everything on her shoulders. Instead of her stood a strong woman full of self-confidence with her back stretched out and her head held high. However, the problem was the girl standing next to her. 
Having a bad feeling about the presence of this painfully familiar figure, I pulled out my sword and took a stance. Understanding my intentions, the master did the same. The moment our eyes met, we simultaneously took a step forward and swung our swords. There was no expected sound of metal hitting metal. Instead, the top half of my sword fell to the ground with a dull thud. If we talk about quality, my weapon should be much better. This is because the sword in the master's hands is a blade that I forged three years ago, and the piece of metal lying in the dirt is something that I made six months ago. Even if not so much, over these three years my skills in blacksmithing have clearly grown. Therefore, without a doubt, the problem was not the weapon. The point is the overwhelming difference in skill. I see, so this is Kaihi's new style, acquired over three years of countless battles and persistent efforts. Oh, how handsome he was. And although he was hardened in blood instead of becoming rough, he became even more graceful. At that moment, I thought that these years of waiting were absolutely not in vain. After all, in just a short three years, such a beautiful flower blossomed. Welcome back, Master. Also, long time no see, Irina. I guess my strength is needed. I greeted the two with a sigh and looked back to look at the dojo. Although I treated my sword unfairly, I had no regrets about this. However, I am afraid that the fact that Irina showed up with the Master means only one thing. She brought with her another problematic piece of work. Oh, goodbye. My dreams of long-awaited training, you were so wonderful. As they say, there is no truth in the legs, so we change the place of conversation to the room. The image of Kaiha, the rightful owner of the dojo, looking at everything around him in surprise was so funny that I couldn't help but laugh. Well, she can be understood because she saw only the plans and not what they turned into. Long time no see, Mr. Ace. I visited you today to ask for help in freeing the captured tribesmen. I asked Cliff for your location, and he introduced me to Kayaha, who subsequently brought me here, Irina said, as always with excessive politeness, bowed her head the moment we sat down. According to her, some of the nobles of the kingdom of Ludoria secretly hunt elves and turn them into slaves. It's not that I didn't believe her but I still couldn't help but wonder if it was even possible for a person, even one with the support of a noble, to capture an elf. Irana, apparently guessing about my doubts, immediately added with slight self-irony, All those elves that Mr. Ace knows, including me, are slightly strange representatives of our race, who have chosen the path of an adventurer to live in the forest, or are as high as, and you yourself, aren't you? Ordinary elves who settled in quiet forests, not like Polsch, are completely unaccustomed to battles. That is, it turns out that even if they can borrow a little power from the spirits, they absolutely do not know how to use this power in battle. Well, in that case, it is not impossible that people, armed to the teeth, can catch an elf. In other words, one of the nobles, using personal troops, ordered defenseless elves to be caught in the forest on their territory. Whatever happens to the hidden elf settlement, people won't even notice. In order to break the connection between the captured elves and the spirits, they are fed drugs that take away their vision and disrupt their perception. In place of the emptiness created by the loss of this connection, a human master is imposed on them, as if they are being detrained, Irene said with shame in her voice. All clear. It is true that if the ability of spirit awareness, also called communication, is taken away from the elves, they fall into a very unstable state. For them, who have a specific perception, this is akin to cutting them off from the world. And if at this moment you forcibly become the only one with whom the elf is connected, then you will replace the whole world for him. Despite his complete shamelessness, the person who was able to come up with this idea is very smart and must have extensive knowledge about elves. Elves are a people far from worldly concerns, but at the same time with a very pleasant appearance, which they maintain for many years. And although I don't understand the very desire of people to own slaves, I can understand the demand for elves. This time, albeit indirectly, 
the kingdom should have also noticed something. However, it does nothing, since the culprit is a very big shot who is not so easy to punish. The Count and Marquis had a hand in the current incident nobles ruling the territory in the eastern part of the kingdom. The trends they initiated, that it is possible to quietly turn elves into toys with impunity, in the near future may serve as the basis for the legalization of slavery throughout the country. Therefore, this time it will not be enough to just secretly release the captive elves. It is necessary to force the high-ranking nobles who caused everything to be punished, and to force the kingdom to make a public apology to all elves. People forget about the pain they experienced with the change of generations. Therefore, so that the elves who have a long life expectancy do not experience such a disaster again, it is necessary to cut out the memory of pain in the history of the kingdom itself. That is why, this time, it is not just my strength that is needed, but also my position. I finished explaining everything to Irina. If it was necessary to simply free the prisoners, one elf would be enough. After all, she is an active seven-star adventurer and has enough influence in the human world. But this time, even her influence will not be enough. First, it is necessary to organize a powerful pogrom on the territory of the nobles involved, so that it is clear to everyone that this is a manifestation of the wrath of the elves. While everyone is distracted, secretly rescue the prisoners. Next, it is necessary that all elves living in the kingdom raise a voice of protest and move outside the country. Elves most often live in forests full of natural forces. As soon as they leave the forest, the territory they previously controlled will be immediately occupied by monsters. By breeding and multiplying, their population will quickly increase and, as a result, crowds of monsters will rush outside the forest. It is precisely because they know all this that the elves do not want to leave their acquired territory. What they hate most is the change in their environment in the forest they love. That is why, in order to convince them to leave their homes and move, as well as to come to an agreement with the inhabitants of the forest into which they will move, the intervention of me, the High Elf, is necessary. Also, to ensure large-scale destruction, my strength will be required. I understand everything. Irina, you don't need to bow your head. And even though after this I will no longer be able to live in this country, the same applies to you and the rest of the elves. And you are not at all to blame for this. I agreed in ultimately with Irina's request, accepting all the consequences for himself. However, Kaya, sitting with her eyes wide open, clearly turned pale upon hearing my words. Wait, I haven't even taught you anything yet. I couldn't even thank you for everything you've done for me all this time, Keha screamed, grabbing my hand. And although it looked like she had become calmer during her absence, if you look closely, the fire of emotion still shone strongly in her pupils. Taking a quick glance, I saw that Irina was still sitting with her head bowed. It's clear. This means that she asked the master to bring her here without really telling her anything about the current situation. Therefore, she bowed her head not only as an apology to me, but also to Kaiha. Of course, I understood that she had no other choice. For Irina, the most important thing now is the safety of her people. To do this, she clearly needs my help. However, deep down, I was a little resentful of her for dragging me into this matter. It's okay, Master. I have already carved into my memory the sword that you used just now. This has given me a new signpost on my path. I just need to follow it the same way I have been doing for the last three years, I reassured Kaihu, putting palm on top of her hand, clutching my sleeve. I didn't feel like she didn't do anything for me. On the contrary, I believed that I received much more than what I invested. And while I can't say I'm leaving this place feeling completely satisfied, at least I don't have any regrets. But if you still think that you owe me something, then please continue to improve your style. And one day pass it on to your student or child. Well, I, being a high elf, have plenty of time. 
It will be enough if one day, when all the hype is already forgotten, I suddenly appear and continue my training. I don't know whether this will happen in 10, 30, or maybe 50 years. But even if you are no longer here by this time, I will come to complete my training with your child, or maybe grandson. Keha put even more strength into her hand, squeezing me. In fact, to such an extent that it even hurt me. However, this pain showed me how much she was looking forward to the day when she could meet me again and finally begin my training. Okay. I promise that I will develop my skills even more and will definitely pass it on to my descendants. But I can't forgive one thing. Your master is me, and only me. Therefore, please come back while I'm still alive. As if squeezed out of himself in Keha's quiet voice, I released her hand, took a step back and bowed deeply. Having imprinted her technique in my memory and her words in my heart, I once again thought how lucky I am. In order to prepare for everything, I needed to visit not only all the elf settlements in the kingdom, but also all the forests in its surroundings. It took me about six months, and although I felt sorry for the elves experiencing the hardships of slavery during this time, this time it was necessary to free all the prisoners in the country at once. Otherwise, those who remain will simply be disposed of as unnecessary evidence. Therefore, Due to the fact that it was necessary to prepare a place for relocation, confirm the location of all the captured elves, and also prepare a detailed plan for their release, I could not afford to act carelessly. And now, when all the necessary preparations had finally been completed, I was in the forest in the territory of the Marquis, located in the east of the kingdom of Ludoria, in the place where there was once an elf settlement, attacked and destroyed by the personal troops of the Marquis. I have weighed in my head many times how best to attack the lands of the nobles behind the enslavement of the elves. For example, I could ask for help from the Spirit of Water, whom I met during the incident in Galaretto. Using her abilities, it was easy to remove all the rivers in the east of the country from their banks. Or I could borrow the power of the spirits of wind and fire, and send a tornado of fire to wander through the fields and forests. In fact, I had many ways. However, if you flood the lands, it will harm not only the eastern lands, but also the entire kingdom. So this method was rejected by me. The fire whirlwind is too straightforward an attack, and as a result, it can lead to a full-fledged war between the two races. We needed something that would look scary, but would actually cause less damage. And after much thought, the conclusion I came to was, O spirit that lives in the mighty land that gives life to all, grant me your power. An earthquake in the eastern region centered on the territory of the Marquis. Having finished my words, I placed both hands on the ground, which immediately began to shake. In order to cause any phenomenon, the most important thing is to be able to imagine it correctly. If you do not convey your thoughts accurately, the excited spirit will begin to rage, which will entail unimaginable destruction. Imagining in my head the map of the eastern territory that I had drawn up during preparation, I focused on the lands of the Marquis. In terms of attack, I chose not sharp vertical thrusts, but a smooth movement of the earth from side to side. Perhaps among all the high elves, only I, who had knowledge of tectonic plates from the memory of a past life, could cause an earthquake in such detail. If we use the gradation from the earth, the tremors reached approximately four points and lasted a little longer than usual, several minutes. As far as I remember from the previous world, this is enough to cause concern, but will not cause much harm. However, for the inhabitants of the kingdom of Ludoria, who had never even heard of earthquakes in their lives, the rising earth under their feet should have instilled enough fear. Soon the truth about the abduction of the elves will be revealed, so that people will know the reason for everything that happened. Fear will give rise to anger, and it will be directed at the nobles who were to blame for everything, and the government that turned a blind eye to everything. However, this will not change the fact that it was I who set the earth in motion, and the shed blood of the innocent will forever remain on my hands. 
Well, no matter how much I torment myself about this, nothing will change. The roar and groans of the earth, heard throughout the kingdom, became a sign for the elf adventurers that it was time to free the prisoners, and for the tribesmen waiting for them in the forest, that it was time to begin the resettlement. The number of displaced people reached approximately 8,000, and although this was insignificantly small compared to the people living in the kingdom, it still far surpassed all my imagination. And so, that's how it began. If the kingdom immediately takes action, punishes the culprits, especially the Marquis and the Earl, and makes a public apology to the elves, then everything will quickly be resolved. In such a case, I instructed the elders of the settlements to interrupt the migration and return to their forests. I'm just afraid that this will never happen. If the kingdom decides to punish the high-ranking nobles, it will first have to admit that it turned a blind eye to their crimes. However, only an official apology on behalf of the entire country will remain in history and will serve to prevent a similar tragedy in the future. Therefore, I will not give in on this for anything, even realizing that I was causing harm to those very weak creatures that I so zealously told the spirit of water about. The gap between humans and elves will not be so easy to bridge. But according to my plan, the first step towards this will be Irina. She is a seven-star adventurer who is highly regarded in the human world. Again, with peak power even among the elite, the country will not be able to handle it carelessly. Unfortunately, the problems caused by this case do not end there. If it turns out that one of the kidnapped elves is carrying a human child, then a new tragedy will break out. This is because the elves consider half-elves to be vile, disaster-causing creatures. This is because, due to their inherited human blood, half-elves cannot harness the power of spirits, which causes hatred among the people who value connection with spirits above all else. Again, there is a large difference in life expectancy and development rate between elves and half-elves. Because of all this, most children born to humans are killed by the hands of the surrounding elves. And although I tried to explain that traditions cannot be applied to this case, whether those around me accepted this or not remained unclear. At least my words will prevent senseless killings, but I should probably think about the possibility of taking such children into my care. Whatever it is, I will not be able to stay in this country. Being busy over the past few years, I somehow didn't have time to remember that I also wanted to study magic. So where should I go now? I stood up and, shaking off the stuck earth from my hands, took my sword out of its sheath. The chilling shine of the blade calmed my restless heart a little. I began to slowly swing the blade, completely absorbed in comprehending everything that I'd encountered during my stay in the kingdom of Ludoria. And to the question of whether my choice was the best decision or not, I will let history answer. Note. Trans. End of the second volume. See! A cry involuntarily escaped me. For the first time since I was born into this world, I could feel the wind with my whole body, bringing a nostalgic, salty smell. I think that for a former resident of an island state, locked on the continent for more than a century and a half, this is a completely forgivable attack of uncontrolled joy. Having overcome the small country located in the south of the kingdom of Ludoria, Palovia, and moving even deeper to the south, I reached the sea-facing Republic of Velestrica. As the name suggests, there is no concept of a monarch in Velestrica. It is governed by a council of representatives of famous houses, led by a chairman elected by the majority. And although the Republic cannot boast of vast territories, it is quite prosperous due to maritime trade, and therefore maintains a very decent army. Due to Paulology's desire to gain access to the sea, it often invades the territory of the Republic, so the border between the countries is always in a state of martial law. And since the kingdom of Ludoria supports its neighbor with food, Velestrica's relationship with her is far from the best. And although I knew that the road from the capital of the kingdom to the southern port would hardly be called peaceful, I still had several reasons to choose this direction as my goal. 
One of them was that quite a lot of time had passed since I was reborn in this world, but I still had absolutely no chance to enjoy the taste of seafood. If I didn't know anything about them, then there wouldn't be any problems. But from the memories of the past world, I perfectly remember the taste of seafood. Suddenly, remembering this, I wanted to eat fish so much that neither the lack of roads in the vast steppes nor hungry monsters in the dark forest could stop me. Having crossed two countries, I was still able to get to the desired sea. No, really, it was really hard. I also had a huge interest in overseas goods because Vilestrica traded not only with the countries located along the coast, but also with the continent located on the other side of the sea. Who knows, maybe I can come across something here that I can't even imagine. Another reason was that many worrying things happened to me in Ludoria, so I decided to unwind by looking at the endless sea. In general, for starters, seafood. Most of all, I wanted to eat shellfish. If there was also soy sauce, it would be absolutely excellent, but perhaps I am asking for too much. Well, maybe if I search really hard, I'll suddenly be able to find something similar, but in extreme cases, I'll make do with simple salt. Excited with anticipation, I stood in line in front of the gates of one of the port cities of the Republic, Sorote. As you might have guessed, I could not use my Viscott resident card to enter the vile streaky cities. Naturally, I still had my blacksmith's license with me, which, as elsewhere, had its validity here. But I decided that the traveling elf already stood out a lot, and if they still found out that I was a blacksmith, then a fuss would certainly not be avoided. Therefore, I identified myself as a swordsman on a training journey and simply paid the due tax. In the Republic, if someone refuses to show documents, then the entrance tax is as much as three silver. And this is several times more than in Ludoria. But on the other hand, if you can confirm your identity, then entry will be free. It looked like the Vila Strica authorities were encouraging trade in every possible way, allowing trusted people to travel between cities without extra taxes. And on the contrary, in order to avoid the penetration of suspicious individuals, they not only set a high amount for those who do not have documents, but also carried out a thorough search of them. So I was met with a storm of questions. First, name and age. Next, where did you come from and what is your final destination? For what purpose did you come to this city? How long do I plan to stay? And so on and so on. I got off easy because I'm an elf. My appearance stands out too much, so I don't look like a spy at all. However, the fact that I came from Ludoria made the gatekeepers a little wary. Sorry, Brother Elf. Too often the northerners poke their noses into us, so we have to thoroughly check everything. So don't be angry. Welcome to Sorote. By the way, the shellfish you're looking for are really bad in our city. The guard who had been interrogating me for the last half hour told me and let me into the city. I didn't even think about blaming the soldier dedicated to his work for anything. If he deliberately delayed the conversation or demanded a bribe, then it would be a different matter, but his attitude only proved that the guy did not neglect his official duties. From this, we can assume that the city should be quite safe. And besides, he told me about three stores that are popular. After thanking the guard, I headed inside the city, barely holding back my salivation with anticipation. If you ask why three places were recommended to me at once, it is because they all have their own characteristics. One shop caters primarily to tourists and does not serve dishes not intended for novices, such as shellfish, raw fish, and carpaccio. Another place is favored by locals and is something of a canteen for habitual eaters. Well, the last place is a store where they serve food delivered directly by the fishermen themselves and serve it with alcohol. It is intended only for true gourmets who know a lot about the delights of seafood. Naturally, I chose the latter without hesitation. So, after all, a store located near the port with freshly caught fish. It just has to be delicious. Undoubtedly, no matter where you go in this city, only fresh produce will be waiting for you. But since you can choose, you always want to get the best. 
When I opened the door and was about to go inside the store, the first thing that greeted me was a nasty, creaking sound. Apparently, the hinges were completely rusted due to the sea breeze. And although this is a completely natural phenomenon, lately for some reason I feel sad when I see rusted metal. I guess I'm just getting sentimental. Sooner or later, all metal eventually becomes covered with rust. This is the law of nature. There are even works of art that use metalwork in which the oxidation process is used as part of the composition and is necessary to complete the entire painting. Well, okay, instead of thinking about nonsense, it's better to quickly find an empty seat. Unfortunately, the counter was completely occupied and I had to choose one of the few free tables. Poking my fingers at one of them, I asked the young waitress if it was free. Wow, what a handsome elf brother came to such a place. Rare things happen in life. Of course, freely, come in, come in. The girl chattered a little surprised, but still very friendly. I don't understand what such a place means. Just the smell from the kitchen makes me already filled with anticipation. Well, yes, if you look around, the visitors are mostly pumped-up fishermen and sailors making drunken noise here and there. However, they cannot even be compared to my blacksmithing mentor, Aswald. Moreover, the conversations coming from everywhere about fish dishes only fueled my interest. A couple of fish dishes one raw and one fried at your discretion, as well as six large fried clams. And please find some drink to go with it all. I have no idea what fish is called in this world, so I decided entrust the choice to the waitress. I had a strange confidence that no matter what was served to me, I would not be disappointed. And in general, even if it's just fried fish, for me now it will be beyond my eyes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Brother Elf, you're so skinny, but you eat so much. Oh well, you look surprisingly strong, so I think everything will be fine. Smiling, the girl accepted my order and headed towards the kitchen, wagging her butt and dodging the hands of visitors who kept trying to grope her. Having sipped the first drink brought, I realized that it was a type of dry cider, so I decided to obediently wait for the food. Although I only drank a little, the alcohol that got into my mouth stimulated my taste buds, which increased my appetite even more. Oh, how I want squid, either fried or dried. Our fish is huge, so it takes a lot of time to fry it well. So wait a little longer. My inner voice screamed with delight when I saw the dishes brought by the waitress. The first thing that caught my eye was the fried clams. In the wide open shell lay a hefty fist-sized piece of meat. Now I understand why the girl was so surprised by my order. Try to master this here. The size was such that it obviously would not fit into my mouth, so I grabbed the shell of the shell with one hand and scooped out the contents with a fork. Having cut the meat into three parts with a knife, I put the first piece into my mouth. And although when I cut, a lot of juice flowed out, but... It was enough for me to enjoy the taste of the hot broth, slightly burning my tongue. It was so tasty that the absence of the usual seasonings no longer mattered. Why is he suddenly acting as if he had nothing to do with it? It's good that the owner, a man named Grand, correctly understood what was happening. No, Doris, that you're guilty. That goes without saying. This is the umpteenth time you've been rampaging through my store, huh? Look, you'll wait for me. No matter how much we've been childhood friends, at this rate, I'll still reveal yours one day. Empty Head Grand began to threaten my fight partner. Fuck! Scary as hell. The atmosphere that hovered around him was very similar to the one that I felt from Master Aswald at the moment when he was distracted from his work by all sorts of trifles. It seems that even though their sphere of activity is different, all artisans have the same merciless anger towards things that interfere with their work. No. Well, it's all because that damn sailor from the Loretto Trading Company accused the food of this store of lack of grace and called it low quality, Grandora stated in a depressed tone. Exactly. Such words cannot be ignored. It is true that local cuisine lacks elegance, but visitors to such stores do not demand it but words about low quality cannot be forgiven. 
By the way, the guy who was hit by Doris at the very beginning ran out of the store as soon as the fight started, and this despite the fact that he is one of its causes. A, is it true? Then I'm sorry. Hearing such words in relation to such delicious food, but one can't help but get angry. It seems I made a mistake with who to beat. Doris, exuding anger, blinked three times in surprise, after which he calmed down and smiled. When he caught up with me, he patted me on the shoulder. You think so too? Brother Elf, it turns out you're our man. I spoiled your food, right? So it's not surprising that you hit me. Are you sure you'll be in our city for a long time? If so, then let me as an apology. I'll treat you to the fish I caught, Doris told me with a satisfied face. The unexpected but very tempting offer lifted my spirits. Oh, have you made up already? That's good, of course, but you wouldn't want to apologize to me first, would you? And don't forget to pay for the tables and chairs you broke. Since you called my food delicious, then so be it. This time, I will forgive you. By the way, Doris, you will bring your catch here for cooking, won't you? Said Grand, touched by our words, and calmed down his anger. Before I arrived in Sorot, I had already made three new acquaintances. The fisherman Doris, the owner of the bar Grand, and his waitress Karen. True, I did not yet know that this would be the reason that I would be involved in the events that began to move in the shadow of the city. The Grand advised me of a hotel located relatively close to the port, and I, having decided to stay in it for the duration of my stay in city, paid for the room for a week in advance. The room was well tidied and the staff was polite, as you would expect from a place recommended by a native. And although it is difficult to call it a high-class hotel, it made a good impression. Perhaps it was due to the sea wind, but my whole body itched a little. Therefore, I borrowed a fair amount of boiling water and began the water procedures. As I wiped my face with a wet towel, the cheek that Doris had hit began to tingle and hurt. It will probably swell tomorrow. And although I think I acted stupidly, it was an exciting and interesting day. However, my right hand, which I used to hit, also hurts a little, but I need to be careful with this. I need it for both blacksmithing and sword practice. So if anything were to happen to it, my skills in both areas would be greatly affected. But I just can't break my word to Aswald and Keha. Well, as for the smelly gnome, he obviously could have said something like, Weakling, you just don't have enough training. That's why you injured your arm. But no matter how much I practice, my hands will never become as thick as my mentors. And so I wondered if I should make leather gloves, especially for fights. Well. Okay, let's forget about fights for a while. I had plans to go see Doris's ship. It looks like he decided to go fishing tomorrow to catch something as an apology for what happened. Maybe I can even get some squid or octopus. Even if it turns out that they are considered strange food in this world, I can always excuse myself by citing the special preferences of elves. I was looking forward to tomorrow, but at the same time I was haunted by an elusive feeling of the wrongness of what was happening in the behavior of the guy sent flying by Doris. This is not to say that there are no fools in this world who consider paying customers to be gods, but when there are only regular visitors around you and, moreover, pumped-up fishermen, it is stupid to say disparagingly about the food served. So in reality, he received it in full from the enraged Doris. And despite all his courage in his statements, he immediately ran away as soon as a fight broke out. His attitude and words and behavior varied too much. Of course, there are times when you cannot hold back a strong word when you are served food that tastes disgusting. However, the dishes in that store are undoubtedly so tasty that there is simply nothing to complain about. I think Doris said that the guy was a sailor from some trading company. Something is still wrong with this whole story. Continuing to puzzle over everything that had happened, I finished washing myself and, in preparation for tomorrow, decided to go to bed early. The next morning I went to the port that Doris had told me about, and finally found out the answer to the question that had been tormenting me all night. At the moment I arrived, 
Doris and his friends were surrounded by a crowd of people that in appearance resembled sailors. Among them was also an acquaintance from yesterday, with a huge bruise covering half his face, clearly not of natural origin. Looking at the tense situation, I realized that I had come straight to the site of the lynching of fishermen by a crowd of sailors. No, not in the bad sense of the word, I meant I arrived on time. Brother Elf, don't come closer. This doesn't concern you, so get out of here, came the voice of Doris, who noticed me before anyone else. Hearing the concern in his words, I decided to take the side of my new acquaintance, although I had no idea about the current situation. Because of his exclamation, both the sailors and fishermen focused their attention on me for a moment. Morning, Doris. I came for the promised fish. Things are a little tense here. Is everything all right? To be honest, there is something that I want you to catch for me. Ignoring the words addressed to me glances, I, without slowing down, headed towards Doris. It seems like I've only encountered violence every now and then since I arrived in Sauroth. Therefore, I decided to adapt to the customs of this city and not particularly restrain myself in using brute force. However, having learned from bitter experience, I decided to refrain from using my bare hands. Although Doris is quick-tempered and quick to kill, I already realize that, deep down, he is not a bad guy at all. And since he promised to catch seafood for me, then helping him in difficult times is my direct responsibility. Hey, slow down, elf. It's none of your business. The sailor who tried to block my path was knocked down by a mass of water that flew in without any warning. However, the most that could happen to him from such a blow is loss of consciousness, so he escaped without serious wounds. Fuck off! I now have important business with Doris. If someone wants to interfere, then get ready for it to hurt a little, I warned, just in case, out of the kindness of my heart. Even though we are in the harbor, whatever one may say, this is already the sea. The spirits that live in such a large accumulation of water are incredibly courageous and strong. Knowing this, I honestly plan to hold back, but still the power of the water turned out to be several levels higher than usual. They started the fight first. We just came to avenge one of our own. You have nothing to do with this, stranger, so mind your own business. But I warned, but despite this, the sailors began to surround me with open hostility. It's clear. This means that yesterday's mess was just a pretext for retaliation, and that guy deliberately provoked Doris. Well, then this concerns me even more. Oh, are you talking about yesterday? That guy behind you knocked over a plate of my food and got me into a fight, and you're saying that this doesn't concern me? As soon as I remembered the spoiled fried fish, anger began to boil inside me again. And as if sensing it, the sea foamed, Tall waves rose and began tossing the anchored ships from side to side. But I haven't even asked for anything yet. Isn't this water spirit living in the sea too warlike? Don't make me laugh. The sailors attacked me with abuse but were scattered one after another by the incoming water shells. Many fell to the ground, but those who were unlucky fell straight into the sea. The morality of the sailors, who realized that they could not win, disappeared without a trace, and they took off running, not even caring about their fallen comrades. The only ones left standing were the stunned Doris and his friends. Even if you are going to hand them over to the patrol, don't you first need to pull out those who fell into the water? Or, do you want to put them as fish food? I asked, half-jokingly. The fishermen, who came to their senses, immediately began to pull out the drowning sailors in a panic. Apparently, there were some circumstances in this case that I know nothing about, but the fishermen did not hand over the sailors rescued from the sea to the guards, but immediately released them on all four sides. Brother Elf, it turns out you are incredibly cool. If you are so strong, then why did you let me beat you yesterday? If you had used something similar, even one blow would have been enough for me, Doris asked me in surprise. Some fishermen who apparently were present at yesterday's mess, began to nod their heads after his words, indicating that this thought was also spinning in their heads. Eh? So it was a one-on-one -on -one fight and especially without weapons. Why would I suddenly ask the spirits for help? 
Doris, are you going to call your friends if someone drunk comes at you alone with their fists? Spirits for me are friends and comrades. Therefore, borrow their power in a brawl when both sides are already a little under the weather and are at equals, somehow not for me. True, this was my first drunken fight in both my lives. Now, if the enemy had called his friends or pulled out a weapon, then that's a completely different matter. A wide smile broke out on Doris's face. Apparently, he was satisfied with my answer. Apparently, he was worried whether I was looking down on him, since I didn't use all my strength yesterday. But I really couldn't hold back. My fists even hurt. Is that so? Elf brother, you're a funny guy. Apparently, I owe you again. We are going to the sea here, you say. Is there something special that you wanted to eat? In fishing, of course, a lot depends on the mood of the sea god, but at least I can accept the request. Doris quickly changed the subject. Apparently, he doesn't want to drag me into the problems between fishermen and sailors. Well, if he plans to hide everything, then it would be impolite to try to meticulously question everything. So I pretended that I didn't notice anything and began to describe the appearance of squids and octopuses. Oh, yes, these are octopussy and decapipede. Elf brother, are you really going to eat them? Yes, they spit black liquid out of their mouths. Won't you die if you eat this? As was to be expected, the surrounding fishermen all contorted their faces in surprise. Besides, what are these ridiculous names? Well, I'm an elf, so I know cooking methods unknown to people. But I didn't find anything similar in the market, so even if you can't catch them, then all I can do is give up. As soon as he told me this with a sad look, Doris shook his head and rushed to prepare the boat for going out to sea with the other's fishermen. Of course, I don't know what fish are like in this world, but since my request was not rejected, it means they have complete confidence in their own ability to catch anything. Well, I'll wait impatiently. As I thought, Doris is quite a nice guy. And although I am not going to ask him about anything, since he himself does not want to tell, this does not mean that I cannot independently investigate what is happening between the sailors and fishermen. This decision was made half out of pure curiosity, but also half out of concern for the safety of my new acquaintance. And although a fresh breeze was blowing from the sea, there was an alarming tension in the air of the port. When you cook octopus, you must first remove the insides, rinse it thoroughly with salt, and then, after rinsing thoroughly, boil it in clean water. All that remains is to cut it into pieces of suitable size and you're done. If only I could get soy sauce somewhere else, everything would be great, although it's quite good without it. Delicious! What a pleasant sensation! The light, salty taste and this aroma are simply chic. I even wanted to drink. Ignoring Dora's, whose face changed from the realization that I could really eat something like that, I continued to throw the octopus into my mouth piece by piece. If I had a desire to distribute this dish, then it would be worth preparing everything on the sly, without showing the process itself and presenting only the result. But I just wanted to eat deliciously, so I didn't even worry about it. To make takoyaki... I would have to immediately lock myself in the forge and start making a metal slab with suitable indentations. Asterisk. This is too troublesome. Wait, or is copper plate better in terms of thermal conductivity? Oh well, I'm not going to do anything right now anyway. I really surprised. I tried a little, and it really turned out delicious. Perhaps if you do a thorough research, you can cook a lot of things from the eight-legged one. Grand praised and placed a bottle of cider in front of me. It seems, as befits a real chef, he first took a sample himself before serving the dish to the client. Are you kidding? Oh, Brother Elf, let me try it too. Half convinced by the words of his childhood friend, Doris hesitantly extended his hand to the plate. Of course, I had no complaints if he ate some because he was the one who caught the octopus. No. If he sweeps everything away, of course I'll be angry. By the way, Squid, what do you think the decapod is? They are also very good. If you remove the internal organs and suckers, you can dry them in the sun or fry them over a fire. 
I shared with Grand, looking out of the corner of my eye at Doris, who had fallen into a stupor from the unusual taste. To my great regret, he returned from the sea only with an octopus, talking some nonsense about how an eight-legged and a ten-legged are the same thing. No, of course, I am very grateful to him for catching the octopus, but how can I put it correctly? He is too frivolous. Hearing my words, Grande's curiosity awoke and his eyes sparkled. Oh, Doris, why didn't you bring the ten-legged fish? Well, I quickly rushed and caught it. The excited cook made an absurd demand. As for me, I don't mind waiting until tomorrow. I'm already full enough anyway. Besides, I plan to stay in this city until I get enough of seafood. And for this, it is necessary to protect Doris from any interference in his work. After asking around in the hotel and in the market, I immediately found out what exactly was happening in the city. It turned out that there was a serious conflict over the right to use the port between a trading company that owned large ships and fishermen who went to sea in their small boats. Originally, Sarot was a town where everyone made their living from fishing for a long time. The city has always been led by the famous Pasteri family, who gathered all the fishermen under their wing. She not only had the right to vote in the parliament of the Republic of Velestrica, but was also respected by local residents. However, the control system was greatly shaken when another large family settled in the city, Tritolin. This family, like the Pasteris, had a seat in parliament, but its field of activity was not fishing, but trade. She took control of many small merchants and created several companies such as Loretto, after which the Tritolin family set its sights on the entire city, planning to make it their trading base. They say that at first the two families developed the city together. After all, the more people arrived for trade, the more food was required, and this meant that the fishermen would also prosper. It is unclear when, however, cracks began to appear in the relationship between the parties. The reason was the growing appetite of the Tritolin family and its selfish demands. For example, due to the fact that her merchant ships had a low draft, she demanded that the port be deepened. Arguing that there were a large number of ships, she wanted to use a large part of the harbor. Claiming that fishermen with small boats had no reason to use the pier, she tried to drive them out onto the sandy coast, which in turn tried to seize for the construction of a new port, explaining this by the need to attract new trading partners, and so on and so forth. I don't know if this is a typical problem for all port cities, but just such a conflict occurred in Soro, and if only one of the families had a parliamentary seat, then it could quickly outlive its competitor, and then everything would quickly calm down. However, the families who settled in this city had equal political power, but at the same time completely opposite views. It was because of this that the conflict only continued to escalate, and increasingly both sides began to resort to violence. Doris, although quick to kill, is highly skilled and knows how to keep an eye on others. That is why he plays the role of a kind of coordinator for young fishermen. This was the reason why the Loretto Company decided to get rid of him under the pretext of revenge. What a troublesome problem. And most importantly, although the very idea of lynching by a crowd is pure evil, there is no one who could be single-handedly blamed for everything that happened. At the same time, the very fact that both sides are trying to make their lives easier, in my opinion, is not something so bad, and let fishermen and traders be at enmity with each other. But if one of the parties completely disappears, then the other will also be in a difficult situation. Assuming all the merchants leave the city, Surat will turn back into a fishing town. However, Fishermen who once experienced the prosperity of the city will take a very long time to forget about the good days and return to their old lives. On the contrary, if all the fishermen are expelled, there will be a food shortage, and there will be nothing to feed the crews of merchant ships visiting this city. Of course, you can always arrange for the supply of products from neighboring cities, but then the benefit from using Sarat as a trading base will be significantly reduced. In addition, we should not forget that the safety of the city, visited by all kinds of people, is maintained precisely by the Pasteri family, who use strong fishermen as guards.
Simply put, both sides, while at odds, support each other's existence. Therefore, although so much time has passed, a solution to the problem is still not visible on the horizon. Elves stand out very much in the human world. And although getting lost in a large crowd turned out to be a surprisingly easy task for me, everyone who saw me up close was surprised at first and looked at me as if I was a curiosity. However, I won't say that it was so disgusting. The very fact that I stand out sometimes cause problems, depending on the situation, but there were times when it really helped me out. For example, because my arrival at a new place is quickly spread by rumors, it is difficult for me to do things quietly. On the other hand, even if I am not particularly active, I am immediately noticed everywhere and the right people find me themselves. There are people who try to avoid strangers who stand out, but there are also those who treat me specially because of my rarity. In other words, it all depends on the situation. I wonder how the cards will fall this time. On the fourth day of my stay in Soro, I received a letter. The content is an apology for the misunderstanding and an invitation. The sender is the Loretto Trading Company, which is under the jurisdiction of the Tritolin family. In short, they asked to come to their headquarters to sort out all the problems. Among the family's subsidiaries, Loretto is the most ardent proponent of tough measures. They are ready to do anything for profit. I even heard talk that they sometimes go to sea and, pretending to be pirates, rob competitors or their own clients in order to drive them into debt. Most likely, they want to lure me to their side, but given their notoriety, this will most likely turn out to be a trap. Naturally, I am not stupid enough to negotiate on enemy territory, so I simply ignored the invitation. Even if they want something from me, this does not mean that I have anything to do with them. I will still waste time listening to fake apologies from some hucksters. The only thing I want to focus on now is eating all kinds of seafood caught by Doras, which Grand, grumbling something under his breath, only had time to cook. Perhaps it was due to the fact that I ignored the letter, but on the evening of the fifth day, when I was trying to shake off my fat with a walk on the beach after another hearty dinner at the bar, I was surrounded by several armed men. Having encircled me, they silently drew their weapons. It was clear from their behavior that they had not come to intimidate me, but to feed a stupid stranger who had wandered onto a deserted coast on a dark night as fish food. Maybe everything would have been resolved with simple threats if we were within the city. But since such a great opportunity arose, they decided to take advantage of it without hesitation. Did they really think that if they swooped in en masse, someone's blade would be able to reach me before they were all swept away by water arrows? Naturally, it was not by chance that I wandered into such a quiet place. From the moment the port incident happened, I knew I was being followed. And although the guy watching me is clearly a master of his craft, capable of blending into the crowd and remaining unnoticed in almost any situation, all his skills turned out to be just pathetic attempts in front of the omnipresent wind spirits. Moreover, this letter seems to be warning me. Everything developed as if, according to the script of some cheap Hollywood action movie from my past life. Therefore, I prudently did not order alcohol today and deliberately chose a roundabout route to the hotel. I didn't think that the other side would take the bait so easily, much less use such extreme measures. Is it correct to call their action rash? Or they see me as such a threat that they decide to get rid of me as quickly as possible? Or was I simply underestimated? But among the people around me, there was no one who had been watching me all this time because I still felt his gaze from afar. I don't know about Loretto, but you definitely shouldn't be casual with this guy. The attackers, still without a single word, harmoniously attacked me from all sides. They were armed with boarding sabers, the curves of the blades reflecting the moonlight. It was the weapon of choice for sailors because of its short blade, which was easy to handle in battle on the narrow decks of a ship. But in such an open place as the embankment, it cannot be called a suitable choice. Behind me was the seashore, strewn with sharp stones blocking all escape routes. 
but from the very beginning I didn't have the slightest desire to retreat. Oh, spirit of the earth, I shouted, pulling my sword out of its sheath, stepping forward and swinging. The edge of the coast is the worst place to fight for an unaccustomed person. At the same time, an experienced person initially plans all his movements taking into account the fact that his feet will sink ankle-deep into the sand. That is why, due to the unexpectedly hardened support under their feet, the attackers momentarily lost control over their bodies. The next moment they were overtaken by my sword, belonging to the Yosogi style, which is not inferior to anyone in terms of sharpness. Against five opponents, I made three swings. However, this was enough for me to turn all the sabers in their hands into harmless toys. I don't know who made their weapons, but their quality is very mediocre. Moreover, they didn't really take care of him. Without even offering any resistance, it fell into pieces, as if resigned to its fate. Apparently, the sailors were only wary of water attacks and did not at all expect that I could fencing. Having lost their weapons, they froze for a moment, not knowing whether to continue their attack or try to escape, although it didn't matter what conclusion they would come to. Spirit of the Earth, one more time, please. In response to my voice, the sand under the attacker's feet opened up, forming deep holes in which they were immediately buried up to their necks. Having checked the faces of the sailors, I did not find anyone familiar. The sense of the observer's gaze also disappeared without a trace. Even though the wind spirits warned me that he had fled to the city, at that moment I was focused on carrying out the attack and could not trace where exactly he was going. Smiling at the idea that suddenly came to my mind, I turned to the spirit of the earth for help for the third time. I asked him that those who come to save these five should also be buried in the sand. I wonder how many more people I can catch this way. I didn't plan to kill anyone, and I was going to call Doris and his guys before the surf came, but as punishment for pointing a gun at me, they would have to experience unforgettable fear. The number of people arrested due to the recent attack was no less than 15 people. Those five who directly attacked me, and ten more people who fell into my trap when they tried to rescue their comrades. Due to the fact that they were all sailors from the Loretto Trading Company, it was no longer possible for their employer to hide the planned murder attempt when I handed them over to the guard. Again, this incident prompted the city guard to conduct a thorough investigation at the company's headquarters. And although I found this too lucky to be a coincidence, as a result of checks, it turned out that the company's management, in order to increase its own profits, repeatedly harassed fishermen, hid a good part of the profits, and the like. Loretto may not be completely destroyed, but the head of the company and most of the key figures were declared guilty and arrested, which would lead to a sharp reduction in its scale. In other words, the attempt on my life led to the discovery of facts that forced the Tritolin family to abandon the Loretto company and burn all bridges behind them, putting several people behind bars. Okay, my case. But I don't believe that all the other crimes could have been discovered by chance, and all at once. There is a possibility that the family decided to take advantage of this opportunity and pin some of their sins on scapegoats. However, this once again shows that an attempt to eliminate one traveler using the resources of an entire trading company, which also failed, turned out to be a very major scandal for a family moving in the trading world. Of course, this does not mean that the problem in Soro will be solved. The reduction in the scale of one of the subsidiaries, although it caused some damage to the Tritolin family, is clearly not a serious reason for Pastel to begin the full destruction of its longtime competitor. Even if the fishermen and sailors from Loretto do not understand anything, this does not mean that both families are not aware of the fact that the existence of both of them is vital for the further development of the city. Perhaps they themselves are the organizers of all these small conflicts that allow their subordinates to let off steam. In short, this whole matter will be hushed up as an unforeseen escape from the control of one of the small companies. And although the developments were quite rapid in the end, nothing changed for the city. Everything looked like it was planned in advance. 
and perhaps someone simply used my arrival in the city for their own purposes. The more I continued to delve into my suspicions, the more terrible I became, so I decided to quickly put it all out of my mind and never return to it again. After that incident, all I did was eat and drink at the Grand Store. It took me almost about a month to be completely satisfied with seafood. Today was my last night in this city. Your order, Ichi Aboshi Asterisk from the Decapod. Your favorite, right, Ace? Recently, there are more and more people ordering this dish, and others, from the Eight Leg. Because of this, I'm so busy that I don't have time to rest. Karen said, laughing, and placed in front of me a plate of squid, dried over coals for one night. Asterisk. Well, she doesn't have enough time not only because the store is thriving. If you're so busy, why don't you tell me about this to Grand? Maybe he'll hire another assistant or raise your salary. He'll soon add more new dishes so there will only be more visitors. Laughing at the girl who was pouting at my words, I poured myself more cider. Although I got into some minor problems, overall it was a good city. Due to the fact that it is in the development stage, clashes and conflicts are inevitable, but they are what give energy and life to the city. I was completely satisfied with both the seafood and the contacts I made in this city, but I felt it was the right time for me to move on. Well, it looks like you have your hands full too, Karen. But I'm leaving this town tomorrow morning, so you'll have a little less work to do, I said subtly. Hearing my words, the girl opened her eyes wide and stared at me with an incredulous look. Well, yes, the true identity of the one who has been following me all this time is none other than Karen. But I wasn't the least bit worried about this. Even after the Loretto Trading Company ran into difficulties and they clearly had no interest in me, the surveillance of me did not stop. This means that it was not them who assigned the girl to follow me. It was probably one of the Tritolin or Posteri families, or perhaps even both. In other words, the waitress standing in front of me is a so-called undercover agent. Whether Gran knows about this, or whether he himself is part of all this, I do not know. The only thing I'm sure of is that it was Karen who drove Loretto into a corner, although I have no evidence of this. As I thought when we first met, she is clearly a capable girl. It's true that you, Ace, eat a lot, so I'll definitely have less work to do. But Doris and Gran will miss you, and so will I, Karen said a little ambiguously. I just took a sip from the mug and smiled bitterly. If you think about it, then she was the one who spent the most time with me in this city. And whatever the circumstances, this led to the emergence of some feelings in her. When you're united by a secret that you can't tell anyone about, doesn't that add charm to the relationship? Thank you. Perhaps I will stop by in the near future. There will be so many more things here soon that I will definitely want to try. This did not mean that we were saying goodbye forever. Although I've had my fill of seafood for now, maybe in six months or a year I'll want to try it again. Therefore, I would like this city not to experience major changes until then. Well, where should I go next? It's time for me to return to blacksmithing. Otherwise, my hands will lose the habit and the desire to learn magic in me is getting stronger and stronger. I'm also interested in what happened after that incident in the kingdom of Ludoria, and the fact of whether half-elves were born or not also worries me. Therefore, after I settle down somewhere, I will need to contact Irina. Okay, let's do this first. I plan to head to the northeast, to one of the small eastern countries, Odin, popularly called the Land of Magic. Without hesitation, I reported my destination to Karen, who was a spy. There was not a drop of lies in my words. Telling her this is the same as conveying a message to her management that I have no hostile intentions towards the city. I think that she will be able to correctly understand the meaning of my words. I'll look forward to the day we see each other again. Next time, let me show you around town, Ace. Nodding at her words, I raised my right hand and she high-fived me with a slight pop. And the next morning, I left Sorote. Translator's note, asterisk Ichiaboshi, literally translated from Japanese, to dry for one night.
A method of preparing seafood and at the same time the general name of the resulting dishes, Eastern Union of Small Countries. Nothing more than a collection of states that declared their independence after a long civil strife caused by the struggle for the right to inherit the throne of the great empire of Azed. True, now all that remains of it is a mention on the pages of history. All countries of the Union are very small and more than half of them are city-states, at most including several surrounding villages in their territory. As for the largest of them, it unites only three cities. To put it mildly, they are just a bunch of small fish, but if you ask why they have not yet been swallowed up by the surrounding large predators, it is because they always act as a united front against external enemies. The agreement, called the Alliance of Azeta, comes into force only in the event of an invasion of the territory of one of the cities of the Union by an external aggressor. At this time, all internal conflicts are immediately put aside, and a common army is formed, akin to how small fry gather in a school to resist the aggressor. And although the members of the Alliance do not stop fighting for resources among themselves, they are well aware that they cannot survive on their own. Therefore, in addition to the Defense Pact, the agreement also includes the regulation of trade relations and many unwritten rules. Odin is the only city founded after the fall of the Empire, which is precisely the embodiment of all such rules. The main purpose of its existence is to train wizards and develop magic, which plays a key role during any battle. That's basically all I needed to know about the final destination of my journey. For me, who is neither a local resident nor a person in the first place, the structure of this so-called union was too difficult to understand. But I knew one thing for sure. If you go to Odin, then the chance of meeting outstanding magicians is very high. Even if I cannot find a mentor here, I will be quite satisfied just wandering around the magical city. Before leaving Sauroth, I sent my elf friend Irina a letter saying that I was heading to the Eastern Union, so if I stayed there for a while, then maybe I would receive an answer from her in one form or another. However, one of the inconveniences of this world compared to the one where I lived before is that you never know whether your message got through or not. However, we will solve problems as they arise. If after my arrival in Odin there is no news, I'll just write to her again, and that's it. Whatever one may say, all I can do now is continue on foot towards my chosen goal. Well, nothing can be done about it because I get seasick in the cart. It's a pity that I didn't have a chance to check in Soro how things were going with my ships. Still, the shaking from the waves is very different from the shaking in the carriage, but what if everything were normal? If so, then I will have more ways to travel. I should remember to ask for Doris the next time I stop by for some seafood. As we moved north along the highway, the wind began to change a little. The sea breeze was replaced by a cool mountain breeze. Raising my head, I saw how the wind spirits, as if having come up with some kind of mischief, descended to the surface and began to create gusts of wind with laughter. Holding my straw hat with one hand, I smiled as I watched my friends mischievously behave. Oh, if I had wings, I could soar with them. Then I could travel much faster, without fear of some kind of motion sickness. It's a pity that these are nothing more than dreams. As if reading my thoughts, the spirits began to push me in the back, and I began to skip, as if trying to ride the wind. Well, I'm a high elf and not some kind of bird, of course, I couldn't take off, but the spirits were clearly having fun, so I decided to play along with them. Continuing my walking path, I heard the rumble of wheels approaching from behind. I stepped aside to clear the way, and a cart passing by, catching up with me, slowed down its pace. Hey, brother, can you give me a ride? The driver asked me kindly. Apparently a merchant transporting goods between cities. There was a pile of cargo secured to the cart and two armed men were sitting. Thank you, but everything is in order. I'm not very friendly with transport, so I prefer traveling on foot. Hearing my words, the merchant nodded his head and, waving his hand goodbye, spurred on the horses. 
Although I refused the offered help, it was nice in my heart that there were still such responsive people in the world. Involuntarily waving at the retreating cart, I saw that the armed men answered me with a smile. Praying to the frolicking wind spirits for their safe journey, I continued on my way. Having thought a little in my mind, I realized that there was very little left to my destination. The Principality of Travoya is the southernmost kingdom of the Union, formed by the city of Jampamon and its surrounding villages. Here, as in other territories of the Union, a temperate climate reigns all year round. Due to the wide river and its tributaries, the population does not have problems obtaining water. Also, thanks to the fertility of the soil, there is never a shortage of food in these parts. In other words, this is the so-called blessed land. Although, on the other hand, such abundance is also one of the reasons for eternal internal conflicts. I arrived in Jampamon when the sky was already brightly colored by the setting sun. Around the city there are endless fields of wheat, which are the main product of the principality. The spikelet sparkling in the last rays of the sun evoked the feeling that the city was a stone ship sailing on a boundless golden sea. You ask, why did such poetry awaken in me? Yes, everything is simple. I just quoted what was said by a local poet who sang the beauty of his homeland in poetry. I heard about them from a traveling merchant with whom I had a conversation over a glass of beer in a bar in a previous city. To me, this landscape looked like just a stone city and a wheat field, nothing more. But there is nothing wrong with knowing a couple of beautiful phrases. Well, there's no point in acting like God knows what in a place where no one will even see you. And besides, it will be completely dark very soon, so I better hurry up. This is not the first city I have encountered on the way since I left the deep forest, so I'm already quite accustomed to the procedures carried out when passing through the gates. And although I understood that I would stand out greatly, I decided to use my blacksmith license to enter, since the inhabitants of the Union are very suspicious of outsiders. Since that incident in the Ludoria Kingdom, I have never picked up a hammer, so I am afraid that my skills may have begun to dull. And although I didn't plan to stay in this city for a long time, it would be better to take on a couple of jobs to get some exercise. Moreover, the attitude of the guards in subsequent cities will be better towards a blacksmith who has a record of work than a traveler who does nothing. Once in Jampamon, the first thing I did, as usual, was to look for a hotel. The sky had already completely darkened, and my stomach, having reached its limit, began to make plaintive sounds. Therefore, unable to resist the smell of cooking food in the air, I flew into the nearest shelter, on the ground floor of which there was a simple dining room. Since I decided to stay in the city for work for a couple of weeks, if something happens I can always change my vacation spot later. To begin with, I'll try to stay here for one night if I like it, I can extend it, if not, then I can ask the guild to recommend something decent to me. Good evening, dear visitor. Are you staying overnight or just to eat? I was asked by a girl working as a waitress. It is unclear whether or not she was at least ten years old. She is too young for a hired worker, and besides, she looks too used to her job. In other words, she is probably a child born and raised in this inn. I was planning to stay the night, but my stomach is already quite empty, so it's both, I guess. Hearing my words, the girl smiled happily. And although from a child's point of view, more clients should mean more work, but her smile looked very genuine. And this despite the fact that the dining room was already crowded. By all appearances, she is a very good girl. Mom, the guest has arrived. Oh, that's right. A room for one. 50 copper coins. Dinner is 12 copper coins and breakfast is 8. If it doesn't bother you, could you leave your name in the ledger? Just seeing the girl try her best made me smile. The overnight rate is a little low, but the cost of food is quite reasonable. This is probably one of those establishments that make money mainly on the number of visitors in their dining room. Deciding to have dinner first and stay one night, I paid and entered my name in the book on the counter. Mr. Ace, right? Well, Mr. Ace, let me show you your room. After you get settled, come down for dinner. 
if you need boiling water or washing, both for fifty copper coins. As if forgetting, the girl hastily added, to which I simply nodded. I'll order boiling water after dinner, and if I decide to stay here, I can also do the laundry. Although this is not a high-class hotel, the atmosphere here is not bad at all. Following the waitress, I went up to the second floor. Walking ahead of me, the girl kept glancing over her shoulder. When our eyes met, the girl was surprised and waved her hands in panic. Oh, well, this is Mr. Ace. Aren't you an elf by any chance? She asked timidly. She probably knew that it was not polite to question visitors. Therefore, she even turned a little pale, realizing that, out of curiosity, she had asked an inappropriate question. Well, things like that don't bother me one bit, so I put my hand on her head and stroked it to calm her down a little. Yeah, I'm an elf. Is this your first time seeing it? I asked in a warm voice. Elves living outside the forest could hardly be found even in the capital of large countries, such as the Kingdom of Ludoria, let alone some small principality. I only caught a glimpse of the elf once, but this is the first time for me to do this, as a guest. Here is your room. Please don't lose the keys, the girl said shyly, handed me the key and hurried back to work on the first floor. Although the room could not be called too old, the years had clearly left their mark on it. The bed was also well worth the price. However, everything was well tidied up, and there was even a small vase with a flower on the windowsill, making you feel that the hotel was taking care of the guests. The castle was also made very reliably, so it is quite possible to live here for some time. But the last word, naturally, will remain with the taste of the food served. Since the kitchen brings the main profit to this place, I expected a lot from it. Having looked around the room again and throwing off my traveling bag, I locked the door and headed towards the stairs leading to the first floor. It seems that it is not for nothing that Jampimon is praised as a stone ship floating in the middle of a sea of wheat, because the production of cereals here really flourished. Basically, in the Eastern Union, not only the Principality of Travoya has fertile land, but all other countries too. Therefore, they are all famous for the production of apples, grapes, and much more. In addition, the vegetables and fruits they grow each have their own characteristics. And of course, due to the fact that in this world bread is the main food, wheat is grown wherever it can be found. However, here, in the Principality, not only does the largest number of cereals grow in the entire Union, but also constant research is carried out on how to eat them. In the dining room on the first floor, where I went down holding my empty stomach, I was served pasta generously doused with creamy sauce. The bacon slices decorating the sides of the plate also looked very juicy and appetizing. All this was accompanied by a small piece of bread, apparently necessary to pick up the sauce remaining on the plate after eating, and wheat wine. Although I involuntarily broke into a sarcastic smile at the predominance of wheat in the preparation of local dishes, to my surprise the taste turned out to be quite good. During dinner the food seemed very light, but as soon as the meal was finished, she made me notice my existence with a bloated belly and a feeling of unprecedented satiety. As I was enjoying the aftertaste and the wine, the waitress came over and smiled when she saw the completely empty plates. I'll clean up now. Well, Mr. Ace, was it delicious? She asked me. I nodded and asked for boiling water to be prepared, paying for both it and dinner at once. I wasn't in the mood to force a little girl to carry heavy water, so I wanted to pick it up myself, since I was going down anyway. And since I was pleased with the local cuisine, I decided for myself that I would stay here for the duration of my stay in this city. The next morning I visited the Travoya Blacksmith Guild, located right here in Jampimon, and although the employees were clearly stunned when they saw my license, they behaved extremely politely. Well, you can't blame them for being confused by the presence of an elf blacksmith in a city where even just seeing an elf is a huge rarity. As a result, I was allocated one of the forges owned by the guild, and I immediately started working. However, 
No matter how much I am a blacksmith of the highest rank, no one will trust the most important work to a stranger who suddenly appears. Wherever you go, to get serious work, you first need to gain general trust. As a result, the work I accepted turned out to be making pommels for city guard replicas based on a template. I was given a week to complete a dozen copies and iron was prepared as the material. Also, the guild has undertaken to pay for all the tops that will exceed the required quantity. The rent of the forge, the cost of materials and the cost of coal fell on the shoulders of the customer and my reward would be one silver piece per piece. Well, although the pay is quite unremarkable, I think it is quite ordinary for a job entrusted to an outsider. Although this is different from the time when I could enjoy special treatment simply because I was the disciple of a renowned dwarven master, I was still treated quite acceptable. The established norm is less than two pieces a day. But since no one limited me in the amount that I could provide, I decided not to hold back and give it my all. If you work according to the norm, then minus living expenses for this week you will not save a particularly large amount. But if you exceed the norm by two or three times, the conversation is completely different. Having looked at the finial provided as an example, I was disappointed in its quality and decided to make something better and in larger quantities. Rejoicing that for the first time in a long time I was able to get to the forge, I became enthusiastic and got to work. The heat of the forge and the flowing sweat gave me nothing but a pleasant sense of nostalgia, and I became more and more focused on the production process with each blow of the hammer. I was surprised that my skill had not dulled as much as I had feared. I also tried to support the spirit of fire, joyfully frolicking in the flames of the forge and scattering sparks left and right. Of course, if a spark had hit me, I could have gotten burned, so just in case, I asked the spirit not to overdo it too much. By evening, I had finished making five blanks for the pommels. All that remained was to sharpen and polish them. But I decided to leave it for tomorrow, after which they can be transferred to the guild. Given the time it takes to complete today's work, the next day I can do no more than four pieces. Well, once I get used to the equipment and the process itself, I think I can significantly increase the production speed. From the second half of the day, my work was watched, replacing each other by the guild employees. And although the elf blacksmith is something unique, all that came from them were only words of pure praise for my skill. I didn't even think that although it's a little embarrassing, it's very nice when strangers praise your work. And although not much time had passed from the point of view of the elves' perception of time, for some reason I suddenly began to miss a little the scolding of the stinking dwarf who reviled me with every wrong swing of his hammer. Immersed in sentimental memories, I only glimpsed I noticed that the guild members came out to see me off as I left the forge and headed towards the hotel. Today, I was too focused on work and we couldn't even talk. But once I get used to it a little and increase my production speed, I'll definitely need to talk to them. Again, although I am pleased with the food served at the hotel, I would still like to visit a couple of shops that only locals can recommend to me and I would be very happy if they kept me company at this time. I wonder what will be served for dinner today. It would be nice if it was a creamy stew. Blown by the wind, pleasantly cooling my body, hot from the heat of the forge, I walked along the street with a light gait, not paying attention to the accumulated fatigue. What a pleasant day today was. Surely after everything I will be able to get a good night's sleep on the long-awaited soft bed, the lands of the former Azed Empire, now the Eastern Union, are very fertile. While there are wheat fields around Jampamon, other city-states are busy growing fruit trees and other things. And because I was served creamy sauce on the first day, I assumed that there were livestock farms in the vicinity. And if we add it all up, what do we have? That's right. Chances are that in addition to regular food, you can enjoy sweets in these parts. Flour milk and butter, and add here also fruits from neighboring cities. Well, just the perfect set for making all kinds of cookies and sweets. However, 
This does not mean that sugar and honey are absent in this world. They are simply very expensive, and if they are used, then only in extremely small quantities. Therefore, dried fruits play the role of a sweetener instead. By the way, it seems that starch syrup can be produced from malt. At least I heard about it in a past life, but since I don't know the detailed production method, I can't help here. So right now, I'm in the middle of a tasting tour of the city. A girl from the hotel, Nona, accompanies me as a guide. As soon as I lured her with sweets at a time when she did not have work, she immediately agreed. Hmm, seducing a ten-year-old girl with candy. But in my previous world, it would have smacked of a criminal case. But what can I do? I've only been in the city for a week, and the only person I know I can turn to is the ever-friendly waitress from the hotel. My work schedule has not changed since the days of Wiscott. Six working days and one day off. During the day, I allow myself to work just enough so that during the night all fatigue goes away completely. The basis of a healthy lifestyle is to eat well and sleep well. That's why I often take a lunchtime nap. The most I can do when working is to maintain a state of complete concentration for five to six hours a day. Then my attention begins to wander, which can lead to mistakes, so I always try to keep myself in good condition and stop the forging process at the moment when I feel the limit of my own strength approaching. The number of pommels I made over these six days was 32 pieces. I think the guild staff had no idea that I was capable of producing so much, so they clearly breathed a sigh of relief when I announced my intention to take the seventh day off. Even though it was very difficult for me to find the right balance from just one finial and I wanted to be entrusted with making the entire copies, it's not in my rules to complain about the work provided, so I had to get out as best I could. Moreover, starting tomorrow, they promised to offer me something new, so it's okay. Wow, delicious, Nona said with a wide smile, devouring cookies with whipped cream and dried fruit on both cheeks. To my great surprise, I was able to find sweets in Giampamon that were decorated with whipped cream. True, due to the fact that it takes a lot of sugar and fruit juice to prepare them, their prices were sky high. What Nona is eating now cost me no less than a silver coin. The girl tried something like this for the first time in her life, so she was incredibly happy, or better yet, frolicking. Well, you really can't argue that it's delicious. Having tasted the long-forgotten taste of sweets, I really wanted to drink tea. But to my bitter regret, tea is not common in this world. Taking out a clean handkerchief, I wiped the cream from the tip of Nona's nose. As soon as I did this, she blushed and stared with obvious regret at the remains of the cream on the scarf. Of course, I was not going to let her lick it off, as I consider it extremely indecent. I quickly folded the scarf and put it away. Nona, who came to her senses, immediately returned to eating cookies, trying to show with all her appearance that nothing had happened. After a couple of seconds, a satisfied smile appeared on her face again. Delicious, she purred. A really funny creature. Most likely, Nona no longer has a trace of memory of what happened a moment ago. Infected by her joy, I also involuntarily began to smile. I thought about this back in the Republic of Vilastrica. It's so good when the choice of dishes is plentiful. Instead of eating the same thing every day without any feelings, it is much more pleasant to be happy and sad about each new meal. This definitely makes a person's spiritual world richer. Perhaps this is what is called culture. However, not everyone can enjoy it. Do you already know? My long ears caught a voice from the opposite side of the street. I paid attention to it only because it was mixed with feelings of anxiety. It is said that the border fortress of Northern Zaire was attacked by Darat's army. Northern Zaire, a city-state in the very north of the Union consisting of two cities. It is famous for the fact that it gathers mercenaries who are confident in their abilities and is popularly nicknamed the Northern Wall of Azed. By the way, one of its two current cities once belonged to Southern Zaire, but was absorbed by its neighbor, which is why there is one less country in these parts. 
The army opposing them belongs to Darat, a country in the east formed by nomads on the former territory of the kingdom they destroyed. The fame of their cavalry quickly spread throughout the area, instilling fear in their neighbors. The descendants of the nomads constitute the dominant layer of society, while the offspring of a kingdom that has sunk into history are the controlled layer. The difference in their social status is as great as between the earth and the sky. Darat is a very warlike country, and its people prefer battles and looting above all else. If you love to fight so much, then why not direct your energy to exterminating the monsters that exist abundantly in this world? No, give them human opponents. What troublesome guys. It seems that the time has come to convene the Azed Alliance. Alarming words ended the dialogue. And even if at this stage these are only unconfirmed rumors, the very fact that they reached from the distant north to the very south meant a lot. Even if you consider that not all of the content is true, this is still disturbing news. And then I noticed that Nona was staring at me with concern, deeply immersed in her own thoughts. Mr. Ace, is everything okay? asked the girl. To distract her attention, I broke my last cookie in half and placed it on her plate. Talking about the war would only alarm a girl who had just turned ten, so I used a secret technique for avoiding uncomfortable topics bribing her with cookies. I easily managed to fool Nona, whose eyes lit up with happiness. As for the disturbing rumors, I decided to ask the Guild about everything in more detail tomorrow. The next day I came to the Guild, where a very impressive job awaited me. Without thinking about the cost, use all my abilities and forge a single sword. I was told that it would be used as an example to measure the advancement of blacksmiths. Apparently, my skills were highly appreciated by the guild branch in the Principality of Travoya. It's a great honor, but also a huge pressure. When I asked about yesterday's rumors, I found out that the part about Durat's army invading was true. But the current situation has not yet crossed the border of a small skirmish, and although the country's neighboring northern Zaire will send their troops, it is not yet completely clear whether the gathering of the Azed Alliance will be announced or not. In any case, all this is unlikely to affect me. I think that the army has long had its own blacksmiths, who are responsible for preparing all the equipment. Perhaps there will be a need for craftsmen to accompany the army in the event of a campaign, and to maintain and repair military equipment, but no one will entrust such an important job to an outsider like me. Not that I particularly want to take an active part in the coming war. I just felt somehow uncomfortable, knowing that important events were happening somewhere nearby, and I had nothing to do with it. Perhaps curiosity can destroy not only a cat, but also a high elf, but nothing can be done about it. It's just my character. Naturally, no matter how worried I was, at the moment I had neither the reason nor the obligation to get involved in all this. Now that I've been given such an important job, I need to fully concentrate on it. The guild told me that any sword would do, so I decided to forge the one that I know and understand best, namely, a sword used in the Yosogi style. In other words, a straight blade with a one-sided sharpening. In order to prepare my state of mind before the big work, I ask permission to go up to the roof of the guild building. In order to prepare for forging the sword, I decided to go through all the techniques of the Yosogi style, which contains nine basic swings, slashing from the left and right shoulder, left and right reverse swings, left and right cutting blows, vertical fall and takeoff, and finally, a direct injection. For each one, you need to consider shape, balance, center of gravity, and more. To give a simple example, albeit not related to Yosogi style, a two-handed sword, due to its weight, is suitable for a vertical fall, and for the same reason is not suitable for a vertical takeoff. But due to the fact that it is necessary to use all nine techniques with one sword, as a result, it should be ideally suited for each of them separately. This makes it very difficult to manufacture, I continued to take swing after swing, searching for the perfect fit, shape, balance, and weight. Unfortunately, 
Despite several years of searching, this has remained impossible for me to this day. In my heart is the ideal figure of a sword, like the silhouette of a court lady on the other side of the curtain, which coquettishly beckons, but as soon as you reach out your hand, it disappears. However, as I continued my search, my heart began to glow like a red-hot forge, filling me with an irresistible desire to realize at least a piece of the ideal. This is the same state of mind in which I usually forge a sword. The guild staff looked at me with blank expressions, but I didn't pay any attention to it. At the moment, only my mentors, Aswald and Kaiha, could understand me. And if they understood me, then it would be enough for me. I would even say it would be undeserved happiness. As for other people, the only thing that is required of them is to see the result of my work, which is about to take a form that can be easily recognized by anyone. The next three weeks, or rather 18 days if you subtract three weekends, I devoted to making the sword. Every day I gave it my all, putting all my energy into the hammer. For the first few days, every time I returned to the hotel, my appearance made Nona worry. As expected, she understood that I was now completely devoted to work and took care of me at the hotel as best she could. Despite the severity, the girl brought boiling water to my room and, secretly from my mother, increased my portion of dinner. And even though these are all little things individually, the attention from her motivated me to work even harder. And today, having swung the steel blade exactly nine times, I went to report the completion of the task. And although the entire guild of blacksmiths praised my product, not one of their words lingered in my head. I was so exhausted. I think that I will hardly be able to do anything for the next three days. So I decided to lock myself in the hotel room and, reveling in the feeling of satisfaction, get rid of the mortal fatigue. They promised to pay the fee after the final analysis, but now, to be honest, I didn't care. I think after I come to my senses, I will be able to both enjoy the reward and be a little proud of the work I did. All these three weeks, Nona has been very diligently looking after me, so after I receive the money I will need to invite her again to eat cookies. And I myself wanted to try something sweet again. Most of all, I regretted that neither Aswald nor Keha could see my forged sword. Instead of a pile of gold, I'd rather hear their opinion. Although I was able to complete a satisfactory job and the reward was exceptional, ten gold pieces, I began to feel that I was overstaying my welcome in Jampamon City. Therefore, I spent the next three days practically without getting up, lying in the room, and spent another four having fun with Nona and sightseeing. Having sufficiently restored my mental strength, I decided to continue my journey. Due to the fact that I spent longer in this city than planned, I did not have any time left. If I delay the departure, I might miss the message from Irina. Considering her character, I'm even afraid to imagine what she might do out of excitement. Before I reach Odin, I will have to visit several more cities. I'm not talking about carefree living in them, but it would be a big waste to just rush past without even looking at anything. Therefore, I can no longer stay in Jampamon. When I notified Nona of my imminent departure, she looked a little sad, but since the girl had spent her entire life in a hotel, she was accustomed to meetings and separations. Realizing that this was not necessarily a farewell for life, the girl smiled and said, See you. When they say this to you with such a face, you want it or not, but there is a desire to stop in this place the next time you visit the city. It seems Nona is a born businessman. After saying goodbye, I left the city and the Principality of Travoya behind, and heading northeast, went to the land of magic, Odin. One of the problems of traveling in this world is that you have no other way to get information about the situation at your destination other than listening to the conversations of the people you meet and catching random rumors. As for the maps, it's not that there were none at all, but most of them were under the strict control of the governments of different countries. Because of this, a stranger like me couldn't get hold of them. Of course, if you stay in one place for a long time, 
as for example I lived for more than ten years in the kingdom of Ludoria, then you will roughly imagine the shape of the territory of the country and its environs. That's why when I headed to the Republic of Velestrica, I could cut through the fields and forests and cross Pologia without any problems. But if I try to repeat something similar here in the Eastern Union, I will, without a doubt, immediately get lost. Even if the roads that go around mountains and forests sometimes seem redundant, in the end, it will be quicker to obediently follow the beaten path. At the end of the road along which I was walking at the moment lay a small country, Ardno, consisting of a lonely city bearing exactly the same name. Although banal, it is easy to remember. If you change the direction of movement there exactly to the north, you can reach a large lake located in the city of Foca, in the Republic of Tver, which also bears the name of the land of water lilies. After boarding the ship and continuing your journey across the lake, the city of Lurante awaits you on the opposite shore. By the way, the lake also bears the name Tver. The founder of the Republic swore an oath to heaven that his country would live and die along with the waters of this lake. Finally, taking the path leading from Lurante to the northeast, you can reach my destination, the city of Odin. And although I can break my tongue pronouncing the names of all the cities and countries that I need to overcome, in reality the distance is not that great. Even though I travel on foot, even so, the journey from one city to the next takes at most three days. Of course, you can get there in a day if you use a cart, but since I get seasick, I'd better refrain. Stopping for the night on the side of the road, I continued my journey on foot along the main road. When I estimated that I was approaching the city of Ardino of the kingdom of the same name, apple trees planted and even rows began to come into my field of vision more and more often. Peasants darted between the apple trees, harvesting crops and tending the orchards. Apparently noticing my curious gaze, one of the trees located very close to the road asked me if I wanted an apple, and although my throat was dry from the long walk, I just smiled and shook my head. For a fruit tree to consider an apple as part of itself is absolutely correct and natural, but if judged from the point of view of farmers taking care of the orchard, then this is a completely different conversation. Even if I pluck the fruit after receiving the tree's permission, in their eyes I will be nothing more than a thief. Between humans and the high elves there was an insurmountable gap in terms of perception of the world, naturally, between plants and people too. However, I was glad to see the scene of a large number of apple trees growing here carefree, receiving care from human hands. Suddenly, my thoughts were interrupted by a loud sound and scream coming from the other side of the dense rows of fruit trees. Having looked closely, I saw a fallen and crushed apple tree, as well as a huge boar that had bitten into the crown and devoured the fruits. Compared to the trees in the forest, the fruit trees seemed a little thin, but even so, if the opponent was an ordinary boar, he would clearly be one blow short of knocking down the entire tree. However, the one who knocked down the tree and ate the apples was none other than, it's the greedy boar, someone quickly run into the city and call the adventurers. Exactly as this voice shouted, greedy boar. In other words, it was a monster that boasted power and a huge body that was incomparable to an ordinary wild boar. Monsters are the same animals modified under the influence of magical power or their descendants. And although they often have greater strength and size than their original, this does not mean that they are evil creatures. Magical power is also just one type of energy that exists in nature. Therefore, monsters can be called the end result of animal evolution. And although I said that they are not evil, many of them are quite violent. And why? Yes, because they are strong. The pride that ordinary animals could not defeat them made the monsters arrogant and warlike. To protect their lives from them, People needed adventurers who knew how to fight well and could defeat such monsters and reduce their numbers. But it seems that this time the adventurers will not arrive in time. They should have run away as soon as they saw the boar, 
but the poor farmers could not leave the place due to concern for the garden, and this irritated the monster. He paused his meal, looked at the people with angry eyes, and, hitting the ground with his foot, began to threaten. If he attacks right now, then everything will end tragically. I had no choice but to throw my bag on the ground, take out my bow, and knock an arrow. In principle, I don't think that the greedy boar is to blame for anything. He simply walked out of the forest by mistake and, driven by curiosity, accidentally stumbled upon some delicious-looking food. It is useless to forbid monsters and animals to feast on the treats in front of their noses, trying to appeal to the rules of human society. However, I had no choice but to kill this boar. If he had attacked me alone, I could have outwitted him and avoided unnecessary bloodshed. In fact, this is exactly what I did throughout the entire journey, hiding and dodging every time I sensed the monsters approaching. Unfortunately, I don't know any other way to stop him from harming farmers other than killing him. The arrow I fired whistled through the air and unmistakably pierced the monster's left front paw. And even though the monster's skin could easily deflect even an iron arrow, my tip was made from the fang of the great wolf, who was also a monster. Depending on the skill of the shooter, such an arrow can even pierce the bone of a huge boar. The monster, which had already begun its rush, stumbled from sharp pain and a twisted paw. His eyes stared with hatred at the offender who dared to hurt him, that is, at me. But this was the last thing he managed to do before the curtain was drawn on the riots he had caused. For at that moment, another arrow I shot reached its target and pierced the boar's skull, and with it, his brain. No matter how high the survivability of monsters is, no one can survive after receiving such a wound. A damaged brain means that commands for body movement, including breathing and heartbeat, are no longer received. Among monsters, and not only, there are representatives who have several separate brains, so you cannot behave carelessly with them, but judging by the lifeless body of the greedy boar, he is clearly not one of them. By the way, living creatures that are not monsters but at the same time have several brains include the octopus that I recently ate, or, in local terms, an octopus. It turned out that a separate brain was responsible for the movement of each leg. Throwing aside extraneous thoughts, I began a race against time. This time, I killed the greedy boar. Even though I did it to save people, if I leave it like that, it will only turn into a wasted death. In order not to insult the fallen monster, I was responsible for skinning the carcass, eating its meat, and turning it into my own blood and flesh. Or that was just an excuse for the fact that I just wanted to taste its meat. Again, if you process its skin, you can make a robe or good quality boots. This is my character and path in life. If the prey is edible, eat it. If not, then you need to collect fangs, claws, and other materials that can be used, all because I was against senseless killings. Therefore, I needed to hurry up and cut up the body of the greedy boar I had defeated before it began to rot. True, if you believe the elders, there is nothing useless in this world. When a living being dies, its soul returns to the circle of rebirth, and even if its flesh is not eaten by others, it eventually returns to the earth. And although from the point of view of the world, people, animals, and monsters, they are all the same, and he does not care about their life and death, but this does not mean that their existence is meaningless. If we continue to reason as some kind of spirit, then my so-called character and the path of life will turn out to be no more than fleeting sentiments. Probably because it's not my style to be so rational, people around me consider me a strange elf. After all, a normal high elf from the deep forest does not distinguish between people and monsters, and therefore does not see the point of contacting them in vain. Oh, thank you. I helped out, the farmers rushed to thank me, who had finally come to their senses after the horror they had experienced and began to realize what was happening. I put away my bow, threw my bag over my shoulder, and headed towards them. The main thing is that everyone is safe. 
Sorry for being unscrupulous, but I would like to cut up and cool the catch. So could you show me, I wanted to say, could you help me drag the boar to the nearest reservoir? I was glad that they were okay, and although it was a little rude to them, one of the reasons for joy was that I could ask them for help. Well, no, it's really impossible to simply drag such a carcass away alone. No matter how devastated the environment was by the monster, we were still in the middle of an orchard. I don't think the farmers would be too happy if I started gutting the carcass and got blood all over it right next to the trees they cared for with such zeal. Oh, wait a little. Now I'm going to fetch the cart. It would really be better to cut up such a hefty carcass as soon as possible, said one of the farmers, apparently sharing my opinion. And in gratitude for the borrowed cart, you can share the boar meat anyway. I can't handle that much alone. In order to deal with the tough skin of the monster, I took out a huge knife from the fang of the great wolf, my first creation after parting with my mentor. And so, the menu for today's dinner is fresh meat steak. And although I wanted to make nabe from the wild boar that so luckily fell into my hands as far as I know, it is impossible to get miso in these parts. A hotel in the mountains, a hot spring, fresh vegetables, and boar meat nabe. I'm afraid there is no place in this world where such extravagant desires can be satisfied. But perhaps one day I will be able to find him, because the world is so vast and the life of a high elf is so long. Come on, Ace, eat your fill. I owe you my life. I was invited by one of the rescued farmers, Azilta, to his home, where a full table of dishes awaited me prepared by the hands of his wife. The menu was great. The first thing that caught my eye was the greedy boar ribs, generously seasoned with applesauce. Apples not only softened the meat, but also suppressed its specific smell. In addition to this, there was also meat pie and apple pies on the table, and to my great surprise, even apple soup. Sweet apple cider completed the picture. Whatever you say, it's just a grandiose banquet. The reason for such a rich treat was my refusal of the reward for exterminating the monster, which the farmers tried to give me. I'm not an adventurer, and I didn't kill a boar for money. When someone is being attacked before my eyes, my first instinct will be to save that person and not think about whether he is rich or poor. But if I consider the victim unworthy of salvation, or my intervention will harm me and my loved ones, then I most likely will not help. However, I don't see anything wrong with adventurers receiving a reward for saving someone's life. After all, this is their job. But I just happened to pass by and just knock down the monster. Moreover, I already got all the materials. But the farmers, especially the acting leader Azilta, had a different opinion, declaring that they would not rest unless I at least allowed them to show me hospitality during my stay at Ardeno. The farmers refused to give up, so it ended with a banquet. Although this was not the mountain hotel of my dreams, I was received warmly and the food served was very tasty. The flavor of the ribs was very strong, but the presence of apple soup helped soften the heaviness of the meat dish. Also, the apples tasted a little like a pua, so I really liked them. And prepared in all possible ways, they acquired a certain new attractiveness. Trying my best not to seem uncultured, I stuffed my belly with a little of everything. I once again thought that I did the right thing by leaving the deep forest, because on my journey I had so many chances to eat deliciously. Ha ha, apparently you liked my wife's cooking. I must say I was a little worried because we are not aware of the preferences of the elves, Azilta said, laughing cheerfully, nudging his smiling wife. It was a pity to upset him but I could hardly be used as a reference if he was going to find out the tastes of the high elves. After all, unlike my brothers who eat monotonously, I eat almost everything without being picky in the least. Judging by the packed banquet, the size of the house, and the richness of the interior decoration, Azilta was clearly not in poverty. It seems that growing fruit is quite a profitable business. This means that the kingdom of Ardeno itself whose main industry is gardening, is very prosperous. Naturally, 
it would be worth adding to this definition the words, despite its size. The next day, I thanked the Azilta family and left their house, and then the city. They tried to stop me, asking me to stay longer, but I felt it would be wiser to leave before I changed my mind. I don't think it's right to live a life in which you depend on strangers for housing and food. If this happens over and over again, you might get used to it. I know it firsthand. First of all, at the moment I most wanted to process the boar skin hanging in a bale on my back. According to Azilta, on the road to the Twire Republic, there is a small village called Parner. It already belongs to the territory of the Republic and is located on the banks of a river flowing from the main lake of the country. This village is famous in the area for its leather craftsmen. I have heard that one of the processes for tanning leather is to expose it to the flow of a river and then soak it in water. I don't remember where, perhaps during my training in the smelly gnome's weapon shop. To tell the truth, I myself have used tanned leather in my work more than once. For example, in the manufacture of a sword hilt, a shield mount, or the interior decoration of steel armor. Therefore, all I needed was to find someone who would agree to process the raw leather for me, and I would think about what to do with it next when I had time. The skin of a huge and hard monster can be useful for many things. It took me a whole day to walk to the village of Parner. Having made an order and spent the night, I immediately went to the city of Faka, which took me the same amount. It's not that I don't have an interest in the process of tanning leather, it's just that, Unlike large cities, in such small villages they are very sensitive to the secret of their craft because it is their only source of income. Moreover, I made a very large order so it would be inconvenient to distract the villagers from their work. And if I suddenly really want to learn how to work with leather, then I can always get a job as an apprentice in a workshop in some large city. Say what you will. But after 10 years of living in human society, I've learned to be somewhat considerate of other people. In addition, the problem was also time. It will take at least several months to properly process leather of this size. Even for me, it was a little, oh well, if I wasn't in a hurry to get to my destination, I could have waited much longer. But now, I had to give priority to arriving in the land of magic as quickly as possible. Having decided on where to stay in Odin and waiting a couple of months, I can visit this village again, ask one of the merchants to pick up the leather for me, or, as a last resort, hire an adventurer. Therefore, albeit with some reluctance, I left the skin of the greedy boar and continued my journey. Wow, this is amazing! This isn't the sea, is it? Strongly impressed by the view of the horizon, I put my hands in the lake and washed my face. I believed that this was not the sea only when I was convinced that the water had no salty taste. The main industry of the Republic is the water transportation of goods along the rivers flowing into and out of Lake Tver, which gives its name to the entire country. Although it could not be said that all transport companies of the Eastern Union belonged to this Republic, at least most of them belonged. Both wheat from Travoy and fruit from Ardeno were transported along small rivers to Tver, after which they were distributed throughout the Union. In other words, this country prospered by maintaining an entrepot. Leaving the village of Parner, I moved along the river until I came across a wide, huge lake. Then, after walking another two hours along the road that runs along the coast, I reached the city of Foca. As usual, I was asked for identification to enter the city for which I provided a blacksmith's license of the highest category and a document containing the history of my work, issued by the Guild of the Principality of Travoya. If you use only a license, you can get the treatment of a stranger with good skills. But if you add a work history, then your status will be upgraded to a useful outsider for the union with good skills. Hmm. In the second case, of course, there will be a little more trust in you, but it sounds a little offensive. However, 
Not every work could receive a corresponding record, so the detailed history in my document is a kind of gratitude from the members of the Guild of the City of Jampamon for the sword they left behind. Although it is valid only on the territory of the Union, it is a very convincing proof of my identity. The tax required to enter the city of Fokka was a small sum of ten copper coins. In addition, if you use a boat departing from the city, once you arrive in Lorante, there will be no additional charge. But from the complaints of a traveler sitting with me at the same table in a bar, I learned that the low prices for entry into the city are more than offset by an expensive ticket for a boat carrying passengers across the lake. Well, I don't know how it really is, but to me it didn't sound like something unreal. I believe that the tax on entry and exit from the city, in other words, the customs duty, was deliberately reduced in order to revive trade. Low entry fees lead to an increase in the flow of tourists and merchants, whose money ends up in the city's shops and establishments, leading to a direct increase in taxes collected by the city. As for me, this is a completely acceptable policy for a country that prospers only due to water transportation. Anyway, I didn't plan to stay in the city of Foca for long. Although I have tried so far to avoid ships, this lake is too wide to go around on foot. Due to the fact that water monsters come to the surface of the lake at night and are impossible to fight in the dark, the ship to Lurante departs only in the morning but he reaches the opposite shore before sunset, so this did not cause any problems. A ticket for this ship cost me as much as three silver coins, and it's actually a little expensive. Now I understood why my drinking companion was so dissatisfied. However, this price is due to the fact that the ship must have a decent number of rowers maintaining high speed and armed guards, so it can be called acceptable. If the ship can barely plod along or remains defenseless when attacked by monsters, no matter how cheap the ticket is, there will be no point in it when the ship sinks and the passengers become food for the fish. Since I have already decided for myself that I will sail, all that remained was to grit your teeth and go to the end. Having paid for the ticket, I boarded the ship and took my assigned seat on the central deck. Due to the likelihood of monster attacks, the area near the side of the ship is considered dangerous, so all passengers were placed closer to the central part, and despite the fact that the boat was rocking on the waves even before departure, I did not feel uncomfortable. At the moment of casting off, the roar of a drum was heard at the stern, and the rowers took up the oars, adjusting their movements to the rhythmic sounds. With a well-coordinated group of strong men rowing with all their might, we picked up speed significantly until the wind began to whistle in our ears. The swim turned out to be much faster and more fun than I could have imagined. Watching the magnificent scenery of the sun reflecting on the surface of the water, I listened to the cheerful voices of the wind spirits frolicking in the cool morning air currents. Perhaps because of the feeling of freedom, but I absolutely did not experience those unpleasant sensations that rolled over me during the carriage ride. The sound of the drum continued to echo over the lake. It turned out that it serves not only to coordinate the rowers, but also to scare away cowardly monsters and attract the attention of the strong. The crew members in charge of the drum are selected from among the bravest and strongest sailors. I was inspired feeling like a character from one of the fantasy books that I had loved so much in my previous life. True, this does not mean that the master will necessarily reveal to the student the secrets of his magical tricks. Of course, I understood his feelings perfectly, but don't these words seem painfully familiar to you? Having questioned the guy more closely, I was surprised by the fact that his teacher was called home around the same time as the stinking gnome. Do you have any preferences? First, tell me what you've learned so far and where you want to start. Throwing in the coal I bought at the guild, I asked the guy and looked inside the furnace to look at the spirit of the flame's mood. This is what is called in one word, technology. If it's a girl, I'll dote on her and cry when she gets married. Being the creator of magical tools, he himself finds the use of magic more convenient. Therefore, he overnight became a leading expert in this field. 
However, this only applies to its suitability as a sword. As for testing magic circles, I believe that this right belongs to Fidel. Three sorcerers who were watching from the side applauded me. Just as I thought, I wish I could say, to tell the truth, although I was confident in myself, I was still a little nervous. Such people are popularly called heroes. But apparently this child was born with very good eyes. I'm surprised. It turned out that the sword I forged then is still kept in the guild and is occasionally put on public display during holidays. Such a thing can only be entrusted to someone I trust, so I remembered you. Patting Vin's head, I decided not to miss the favorable moment that had turned up and immediately switched the conversation to the main topic. If possible, I would visit this family one more time, but will they remember me after so many years? As we walked, holding Vin's hands and matching his step, I felt glances thrown in our direction every now and then. When it comes to meat, you can get it almost anywhere, so it's hard to say where it's best, but I thought there was some good in it too. The latter serves to protect one's own life. Whatever you say, the church is the concentration of religion. Like, we are travelers and our races are different. Returning to the hotel, he, stretching out his short arms with all his might, hung the pendant on the neck of the girl crouching in front of him. Or even more, it looks like you didn't study the sword in order to become stronger at all, the girl stated. However, this does not mean that I devoted myself entirely to blacksmithing. I still continued to take part in morning sword training. Moreover, the twins always treat Vin well, and I would not want to refuse such a trivial request. Quite naturally, but the guard guarding the gate was a young soldier unfamiliar to me. Rodner, who was a simple security guard at our first meeting, was promoted to commander guards during the time that I lived here. Your place? I'll hire people to clean it tomorrow, Martin stated with a kind smile. He may not realize it himself, but it seems like he just wanted to communicate with the man he considers his father, even if only with the help of a sword. I think that upon returning to the capital, I will be able to start forging again, this time without being distracted by extraneous thoughts. She knows how to enjoy previously unseen things and does not avoid being in the wild. From now on, I will tell you about the grudge that I hold against you, she stated. How did I make her life such a mess? Seeing my face, Keha's mother smiled tenderly. The time stream for gnomes and half-elves is very close, so maybe Vin can find friends there who will stay with him for a long time. Come on, stop! What the hell are these crappy elves doing in our country? Oh, here it is, the right opportunity. None of those present could even imagine that after just one blow from the elf's fist, the stocky body of the dwarf would fly into the air and fly several meters away. Instead, I was more interested in the royal treasure, the forge that allows me to process mithril. Well, there's nothing to be done. I'll have to play the role of bait and lure my opponent onto land. Mithril is the embodiment of hardness and indestructibility. A wanderer who returned from the north brought them and immediately told Aswald, from whom I learned everything. Ace, it seems that the Fodger Empire has begun preparations for an invasion of the kingdom of Ludoria, the mentor told me with a gloomy face. At first, I didn't even believe my ears. After all, I personally sealed the only route between the two countries, and as far as I know, no one has paved a new road. Both sides are afraid that the elves might interfere again, and therefore do not want to waste time and money. Thus, although the dwarves can climb these steep mountains, it is clearly not possible for ordinary people. Is this information reliable? I couldn't help but ask again, to which Aswald nodded confidently. Despite the fact that the road is still blocked, the Imperials began to gather supplies and weapons in the area of the former guard fort and the southern city. In addition, one of ours saw an advertisement about recruiting people and conducting military training, considering that to only Ludoria and the Kingdom of the Gnomes are located south of the Empire, then their purpose can be assumed. If everything he said is true, then it really does look like preparations for war. So they found a way to move troops over the mountains? Although it is difficult to imagine, everything is possible in this world, because the very fact of how the path was sealed cannot be called something ordinary either. 
We also cannot exclude the possibility that another high elf appeared in the north and decided to join human society, or they learned about the connection of the elves with the incident in the mountains and gathered the forest people from their side. In the worst-case scenario, no one said that I am the only one who has memories from a past life and it remains to be seen what world the others came from. No matter how small the probability of all this is, it is clearly not zero. If the Empire is able to transfer its troops, then Ludoria, confident in the security of its border, will face a surprise attack. To be honest, I don't care much about human wars, but the kingdom is home to those I consider my friends and family. Will you go? Aswald asked me with concern. Without thinking, I nodded my head confidently. I promised that I would spend Kaiha's last days with her, and I don't want the war to darken our lives. Therefore, I decided to go to Fodre in order to investigate what exactly was happening there. The issue of my mentor becoming the next king had already been decided, so I could safely leave the country of the dwarves. I understand. You can entrust Vin to me no matter how, and he is my student, the dwarf stated firmly. I nodded again. I did not plan to take my child with me to a place that, according to our assumptions, contained great danger. I think I can go back within a year, I said bleakly. It gave me no pleasure to part with Vin for so long, nor to poke my nose into the brewing war, but I had no choice. In order to ensure a peaceful life for my family, I was forced to take action personally. That same day I collected everything I needed, mixed with a trade caravan heading north, and left the country of the gnomes to which I had become so accustomed. The road from Ludoria to the kingdom of the gnomes was very steep, but even that turned out to be nothing compared to what I had to overcome on the way to the Fodder Empire. This was especially true of the volcanic belt, where progress was hampered not only by the landscape, but also by frequent monsters, so even the gnomes preferred to bypass this zone. Oh, Ace of the Elves, look, this is the steepest mountain in the entire area. It's called Dragon Peak because there are legends that these powerful creatures live on it. True, neither I, nor my grandfather, nor even his grandfather ever... We haven't seen a dragon, so maybe it's just stories, said one of the dwarves, carrying a backpack with goods for exchange on his back, laughing good-naturedly pointing to the volcano which stood out for its size and shape. Honestly, judging only by its appearance, one can understand why the dragon chose this place, because the mountain radiated a mysterious grandeur. However, dragons, right? If you think so, then when I was not even a hundred years old, I heard stories from the elders. If I'm not mistaken, they sounded like this. There are five races of immortals in this world. Spirits are our friends who support this world. Dragons in a deep sleep waiting for the end of this world. Giants looking at this world from behind the clouds. Phoenixes that having died turn into bright flames and are reborn again. And finally, we, the High Elves, having met the end, will become spirits. Well, to be honest, it was more like self-praise. I thought it was all fairy tales. But after I learned about the forge that could process mithril, I began to change my point of view. The fact that the dwarves stole the flame from Mother Nature and trapped it in the hearth turned out to be a reality, so it wouldn't be strange if the existence of dragons, giants, and phoenixes turned out to be true in one form or another. One way or another of the listed races, elves and spirits are not fiction, right? Moreover, they are all found in human mythology, which says that these races were created by the gods along with the world. But those lines had a continuation. But it's not them you should be aware of, but mortals who thirst for eternal life. It started something like this, but I vaguely remember what happened next. There was definitely something about demons, but the stories of the elders were always so boring that I ignored more than half of them. One thing is for sure, if suddenly a dragon attacks us now, then their bikes are unlikely to help me, so I haven't lost anything. A dragon, right? I'd like to look at it from afar once, but to meet it on a mountain path. No, thank you, I expressed my opinion, to which the surrounding gnomes nodded in agreement. I won't argue I had a certain interest in the dragon, 
but I didn't want to increase the risk of an already dangerous journey. The journey from the land of the gnomes to the Fodor Empire takes about three weeks. Due to the fact that we were skirting the territory of volcanoes, it would take more time than it took me to get from Ludoria. It's good that the gnomes who trade with the outside world often travel back and forth, so they were used to such travel and could climb the rocks without any problems, and this despite the heavy backpacks on their backs. I considered myself an experienced traveler, but I didn't even try to imitate them. However, no matter how reliable my companions were, I planned to part with them the moment we reached the borders of the Empire. Whatever one may say, an elf mingled among a group of gnomes is quite striking. Even if you put on a hood and look like a person, it will still look very suspicious. I found out from them where they are going to stay so that, after successfully entering the country, I can meet with them at any time but it is better to contact them only in case of emergency and secretly from others. This is due to the fact that the gnomes' goods mainly consist of weapons and everything connected with them, and since they trade with both countries, the coming war would put them in an awkward position, so they wanted to get at least some information. Dwarves are very proud and stubborn people, and they treat strangers coldly, but Vin and I have already become practically fellow tribesmen for them, so even though their help would be significant, I didn't want the dwarves to be suspected of anything because contact me. My main goal was investigation. First, I needed to find out if the Empire was actually preparing to attack Ludoria, and if that was true, then I needed to know how they were going to do it. And if there is still a possibility of a successful capture of the kingdom, or if the elves have anything to do with all this, then I will not hesitate to take the necessary measures. It would be good if all our assumptions turned out to be simple delusions, and if I had come all the way in vain. If the Empire does not have any special method, but simply mobilized a cloud of soldiers in order to make a new road between the mountains, then it will be enough for me to notify Irina about this, and she can take care of the rest herself. In this case, I can buy souvenirs for Vin and the Aswald family and return back with peace of mind. But the closer we got to the border, the stronger the strange pressure in our chest became. I only get this feeling when something bad is about to happen, so I realize that significant problems still awaited me in the Empire. Hey, Ace of the Elves, we caught a rock lizard here. Although it's still a little early, we decided to have a snack. Leave the butchering and cooking to us while you light the fire. The voice of one of my companions pulled me out of my thoughts. Apparently, the dwarf who went to scout the road was attacked by a monster, which he deftly killed and dragged with him. When it comes to food, my reaction is always the same. I nodded approvingly and began to do the work assigned to me. Initially, finding wood for a fire in such a place is quite a task, but do not forget that I am, after all, a qualified wizard. So as long as I have mana left, I can keep the fire going anywhere. When the dwarves first heard about this, they were very happy, because usually they had to make do with only canned food and dry rations. Our journey will continue for some time, and as for the question of invasion, I would rather postpone it until I reach the borders of the Empire. Whatever awaits me, I'll definitely come up with something. But now it was much more important to focus on maintaining the fire because I've never tried rock lizard meat before. I didn't even have time to notice when, but the mountain path along which we were making our way turned out to be completely covered with snow. Although only a few days had passed, it was as if several seasons had changed. The climate of the kingdom was so different from that of the empire. The mountain range blocks the path of the cold north wind, so it does not reach Ludoria, but instead takes its full effect on Fadra. In other words, it was very cold. I usually live on my own wavelength and don't really pay attention to the seasons, but if I'm not mistaken, it should have been winter now. The gnomes whom I parted with some time ago easily tolerate temperature changes, and they don't care. Be it the heat of a forge in a forge, or an icy blizzard in the mountains. Well, 
I can also call myself seasoned to some extent, so I shouldn't complain. Although I separated from the group, I could not be called lonely because I could always see spirits everywhere and always, although I was not in a particular mood now to play with those guys who settled in the northern wind currents or snow covers. Don't think that I have a bad attitude towards them. By no means, it was just really damn cold. My fellow travelers headed straight to the nearest town, but I couldn't enter it just like that, so I chose a nearby forest as my destination. I planned to spend a few days there, after which I would take advantage of the cover of darkness and penetrate beyond the city walls. Then I will need to get in touch with the first gnomes who arrived and settle in the safe house they prepared. If this was the territory of warm Ludoria, then fine, but it was almost impossible to lead a normal life without a base in such cold conditions. Walking through the snow, I moved towards the forest. It would probably look very strange from the outside because not only did I not fail, but I didn't even leave any traces behind me. Someone might think, he eats so much, but doesn't he weigh anything? How enviable. But that's not the point at all. Of course, I do not have the ability to walk on snow or water, as was often shown in films in my past life. I simply enlisted the help of the spirits living in this snowy flooring, and they happily helped me. Although these snowdrifts were the main reason for the terrible cold, I could not bring myself to hate them, because the sight of this shimmering silver world could easily be among the top five among all that I saw in both worlds. A little more and I will reach the forest after which I can take refuge among the trees, where the frost will not be felt so sharply. I only had a camp ration with me for food, but I didn't believe that I wouldn't be able to find anything. It was, of course, useless to wait for fruits or berries, but root vegetables could be found even under the snow. No matter how unknown the territory is to me, I would become a laughing stock among my people if I died of hunger in the forest. Three days later, I stood at the foot of the towering walls of the city of Cortolia, which I planned to penetrate. To be honest, it wasn't that difficult. The hardest thing was to calm my teeth chattering from the cold in order to correctly cast the levitation spell. And then all I needed was to take advantage of the flow of wind, kindly provided by the spirits, and jump to the other side. Having pulled my hood down further so that even if someone accidentally saw me, they would at most take me for a suspicious person, but would not recognize me as an elf, I quickly walked through the night city. I was not trained in spy skills, but the experience of many years of hunting in the forest came in handy. Hiding my aura, I quietly moved forward, avoiding brightly lit places and avoiding rarely seen people whose approach the spirits warned me about. The night air inspired an extraordinary feeling that made my heart beat faster. When I thought it was like one of those games I loved in my previous life, I even started to enjoy it a little. Sneaking through the streets and pretending to be a ninja, I reached the workshop, where the gnomes who had arrived ahead of me temporarily stopped. The lights in the building had already been turned off, but after I walked around, I discovered a piece of fabric on one of the windows, pinched between the shutters. It was a sign that had been agreed upon in advance, saying, Get in here. The lock is not locked. Using my magic again, I flew to the window and jumped inside. Having inhaled the warm air with pleasure, I immediately pulled myself together, because now was not the time for this. Although my comrades were here, this place did not belong to them, but to one of the local residents, a man who was engaged in trade. He may have been friendly to the dwarves, but that didn't mean he could be completely trusted so there was no way I could let him know about my presence. The gnome sitting on the chair looked up at me, but the next second he returned to his mug. He hinted that I was just enjoying the drink and didn't see anything, so I didn't say anything either, took the backpack prepared for me, and jumped out. Checking the contents outside, I found a simple map with a marked house and a key, as well as a summary of the information they had gathered so far. Apparently, I will be able to rest today only after I find the shelter allocated to me and deal with the dwarven scribbles. Having reached the place indicated on the map, I discovered an impressive mansion. 
It turns out that it belongs to a dwarven master who returned to his homeland to participate in the struggle for the throne. I had encountered him several times and knew both his name and his character, so I could be quite sure that he would not be angry if I used one of his rooms. In the absence of the owner, several of his students were watching the house, who were aware of my arrival, so not only warm food was prepared for me, but even a bath. I, of course, understand that it was also very important for the dwarves to receive information about the upcoming war, but their attitude towards me went beyond simple support. Most likely, they truly treated me as one of their fellow tribesmen, so I needed to make every effort to return their friendliness. But all this will wait until tomorrow, and now I only wanted one thing, to eat well and dive into a soft bed, because since I set out on this journey, I've only had to sleep on hard stones and cold snow. Trading gnomes can seek information about the empire's intentions from price changes, sharp increases in demand for a particular type of goods, as well as from rumors circulating among their clients. What do you tell me to do? Because even my mere presence in the city will cause so much attention that there will be no time for secret activities. The answer to this question lay not in numbers or rumors, but in much more reliable sources, which were army officers and government officials. In other words, I had to work on wiretapping. Of course, this does not mean that I could penetrate into the army headquarters or the mansion of the city lord, but here faithful friends came to my rescue, who are always and everywhere, and on whom you can rely at any time. Ah, how cold it is today. Winter this year is especially fierce. Oh, prices for potatoes and grain have risen again. How do you understand this? I wonder if the brother living in the capital can handle the job of a guard. At once, many different voices reached my ears. It was too cold outside, so I sat inside the house provided to me, with the window only slightly open. I think you understand that no matter how long and sharp the elves' ears were, it was impossible for me to hear conversations from all over the city. Naturally, all these voices were brought to me by the wind spirits, joyfully flying back and forth around. To begin with, I decided to listen to conversations in a wide area. Fortunately, the dwarves had provided me with a rough map of the city in advance, so I could understand the approximate location of each speaker. The spirit's ability to collect information was simply amazing, which could not be said about my head, because I could process at most a dozen phrases at the same time. The person in charge of the theft investigation in the Eastern Quarter. What is His Majesty thinking about? There aren't enough supplies at all. Among everything I heard, more or less important were phrases like these, coming from the location of the troops, the mayor's office, and other key facilities in the city. Again, the voices coming from the headquarters of the largest trading companies were also very significant. Whatever one may say, this is a way of collecting information was not omnipotent. Okay in the summer, but in winter, most rooms are tightly closed, which does not allow wind spirits to get inside. But their diligence and resourcefulness could not be underestimated because they managed to seep through cracks, keyholes, chimneys, and other openings that are inevitably present in any building. Although the spirits did most of the work, at this moment our hearts were connected, so I felt a lot of tension praising and thanking them all at once. In addition, I was forced to transfer all the important points onto paper because I was afraid of forgetting something in such an array of data. Thus, three weeks flew by, and I finally got a fairly clear picture of what was happening. As a result of the exchange of information with the dwarves, who conducted their own investigation, we came to the conclusion that there was no longer any point in doubting the Empire's intention to attack Ludoria. If we take into account that at a time when the roads are blocked with snow and it is difficult to move along them, supplies, provisions, and weapons are continuously supplied to Cortolia and other southern cities, then we can say with great confidence that the attack is planned for the beginning of spring, when the thaw. As for the most important thing, the method of crossing the mountains, we did not find out anything except that everything was entrusted to one man 
who came up with everything. If you think about it sensibly, it was too strange. Okay, just ordinary soldiers, but even the city lord, who was responsible for distributing the goods coming in for the army, had no idea what exactly was going on. One thing was clear. Although we did not know the details, preparations for war were in full swing. And the reason for this was that the emperor gave absolute powers to that same mysterious man. If anyone even raised a word against his decision, he would immediately be accused of rebelling against the empire. Everything was so serious. Moreover, these were not empty threats, because one general had actually already been executed for refusing to endanger his soldiers until he learned the details of the plan. And this despite the fact that he served the empire faithfully for many years and had the unconditional trust of the emperor. What exactly is happening in this country? To find out this, I had no choice but to arrange surveillance of Rehan, the very author of the whole plan. This Rehan is not a native inhabitant of Fadra, but came out of nowhere several years ago and pleased his majesty, who accepted him into his service. And in just a few years, he gathered so much power in his hands that he could afford to speak out on any issue. Naturally, there were those who did not find his existence pleasant, and there were even several attempts to get rid of him, but none of them were successful, and on the contrary, all the instigators were either removed from the court or died under strange circumstances. Although it was only rumors, I learned that he had the nickname of a slave eater. In this country, slavery was not prohibited, and human trafficking from poor villages, hostile countries, and the like was quite commonplace. So, Rikon continued to buy slaves in large quantities, and after they were delivered to him, there was no word or breath about their whereabouts. If he simply needed workers for the mansion, then there were too many of them for that. Moreover, no one had ever seen any of the slaves ever leave his house. Because of this, a rumor spread among the people that this stranger was eating the slaves he had bought. Perhaps all this was planned by those who feared or envied him, but as they say, there is no smoke without fire, and this does not change the fact that this man was very mysterious. Ultimately, until I look at it with my own eyes, I will not understand what is fact and what is fiction. However, I can make some very plausible guesses. For example, I'm afraid that the emperor has been brainwashed. However, it is unknown how deeply his consciousness is controlled and how this happens. Even in my past life, there were many cases when suspicious individuals approached those in power and controlled them from the shadows. And do not forget that neither magic nor spirits existed on earth. So what can we say about this world where almost everything is possible? If you think about the most plausible option, the first thing that comes to mind is witchcraft. But there definitely must be wizards among the courtiers, and it would be strange if they did not notice that their emperor was under the influence of some kind of spell. Moreover, I can still believe that the sorcerer was able to secretly eliminate his opponents, but to be confident in his own ability to open a path through the mountains is a completely different matter. Again, the power of the law, or as it is also called, the divine word, cannot be excluded from the list. He relies on the power of faith and is capable of causing various miracles. If we assume that this type of supernatural power includes something like telepathy, then mind control does not seem impossible. True, it was difficult for me to imagine that even the divine word was capable of moving mountains. Hmm, I don't understand. Whatever you say, one thing is clear. This Rehan is a very problematic and dangerous person. But the current situation was much better than my fears that the whole country was thirsty for war, and for the sake of this it captured my fellow tribesmen and forced them to resort to the help of spirits. One way or another, if the whole problem lies with only one person, then, as a last resort, he can simply be eliminated, thereby resolving all the problems. In other words, keep casualties to a minimum. Suddenly, a thought popped up in my head related to rumors about Rehan eating people, 
No, no, this can't be. If what I thought is true, then the situation is much worse than I can even imagine. Another week passed, which meant a month of my stay here. During this time, I found out one very funny thing. It turns out that, contrary to the will of the Emperor, some of his subjects are still making plans to eliminate Rehan. Naturally, all this was not made public, but happened in the Shadow World. The leader of the protest against the war with Ludoria was none other than Rubium Surizen, the son of the executed general, around whom part of the military gathered, and some of the aristocrats supported them in this. Their goal was to kill Rikon, who led the emperor astray from the true path on which the country should have followed. Well, from my point of view, Fodri never adhered to this very true path because the empire not only constantly invaded neighboring states, but even supported the slave trading system, which I absolutely could not accept. However, for residents of a territory with such a harsh climate, the use of other people's labor and encroachment on warm regions may seem quite natural. Do not forget that division and discrimination on social grounds is a fairly common example of the formation of society in a particular country, even in the vast history of my past world. So a foreigner like me cannot understand the natives and clearly should not impose his opinion and point of view on them. Naturally, if they invade my territory and try to enslave my friends and acquaintances, then I'm not going to feel sorry for anyone. That's why I wasn't going to feel sympathy for Rubium and his comrades, but their existence was very beneficial to me. If I ultimately decide to eliminate Rehan and take action, then if I don't leave any evidence, all suspicions will naturally fall on this group of conspirators, right? Moreover, they were simply an amazing source of information. This is because many of them occupied a very significant position in the capital and had access to information that the local lord did not even suspect. Moreover, they themselves arrived in this city only in order to find out more about the collected supplies, the deployment of troops, and, if possible, to gain confidence in their goal. Therefore, all that was required of me was to use their work and from time to time give them new leads. But, to be honest, Sitting locked up like this all the time, eavesdropping on other people's conversations and weaving intrigues has a bad effect on my mental health. The dwarves tried to take care of me as best they could, but it was dangerous for us to come into contact too often. Seeing people's lives before my eyes, hearing their funny stories, but I couldn't even leave the house. But the real hell for me was the smells. My window looked out onto a fairly busy shopping street, where every day the stall owners prepared all sorts of goodies. At first I even tried to block my sense of smell, but this prevented me from concentrating on the main task, so I had no choice but to grit my teeth and endure. Through all of this, I couldn't help but start to miss my family and friends, and wonder if Vin was doing well and keeping up with his blacksmithing training. Of course, I didn't need to worry too much, since he was taught by the stinking gnome himself, but still, it was very interesting. From time to time, I also remembered the face of Keha and her children, and in addition to them, my younger fellow students, however, the thought that I was trying for their sake also warmed my soul. I've always had spirits on my side, and I used to think that that was enough for me, but since I left the deep forest and joined human society, I've become quite sentimental. Well, let's put the whining aside. Otherwise, you might think that I'm lazy and have too much free time. Over the past month, I have collected a whole car load and a small cart of information, and not all of it was favorable. For example, the dwarves could not contact their fellow tribesmen living in the capital and the northern part of the empire. More precisely, the location of nine dwarves was unknown. Three blacksmiths from the capital, four miners from the north, and two guild employees. If these were ordinary people, then for such a huge country as the Fodor Empire, the disappearance of only nine people is quite an ordinary thing. But the conversation takes a completely different turn when it comes to gnomes, because their numbers in human cities are already extremely small, so it would not be surprising if this incident caused a big fuss. But despite this, 
There were not even rumors about this since the emperor ruled by Rahon had a hand in this. All the missing were summoned to an audience with the ruler, after which they mysteriously disappeared. Even considering that the palace was full of servants and guards, none of them saw the dwarves leave the reception hall, so it was strange to think that the emperor had nothing to do with it. But, for fear of persecution, neither the employees of the blacksmith guild nor other gnomes living on the territory of the empire dared to investigate the disappearance or even try to complain about it. Having learned about this, some of my companions hastened to return with a report to the kingdom of the gnomes, and the rest declared their determination to head to the capital to demand an explanation. The dwarven people cannot be called stupid, but sometimes they were too straightforward and stubborn, and this time their actions could only ruin everything. From the group mentioned earlier, I learned that Rikon seduced the aging emperor with an offer to grant him eternal youth, and to achieve this he performs rituals, the victims of which are slaves and representatives of non-human races. So it was too dangerous to release now groups of dwarves who harbored hostile feelings towards the ruler, because this could end pitifully for them. By the way, at first I thought that this was a complete lie, but judging by the data I collected, the emperor in recent years has not only not weakened, but on the contrary, is simply full of strength. Apparently, my bad premonitions turned out to be correct, and it was not for nothing that the other day I remembered the continuation of the lines I heard from the elders. But you should beware not of them, but of mortals who thirst for eternal life. Among them there are three races that defied fate. One of them is called demons. People who drown in evil become them. Still others are fairies who have cast aside the personality of the collective consciousness for the sake of it, thereby shaking off the concept of death itself. And finally, hermits, fools who merged with nature in an effort to become spirits. Demons were somewhat similar to the monsters that animals became under the influence of manna. It's just that people, elves, gnomes, and other representatives of intelligent races became the material for demons. Fairies are little people with butterfly wings, but their entire race is one continuous organism. They lead a lifestyle close to plants. Their characteristic feature is that, although there are many representatives of their species, they all share a common mind, a kind of collective unconscious. That is why they do not pay much attention to the death of their fellow tribesmen, because for them it is the same as falling leaves for trees or falling hair for a person. At the same time, they have absolutely no fighting power, so they do not pose a threat to other races. The most they can do is kidnap a few children and raise them as warriors who will defend their settlement. If I am asked to describe them in one word, it would be pests. And finally, hermits. And if my guesses are correct, then Rahon is exactly one of them. Although Rikon could be called a hermit, it was clearly not in the traditional sense of the word. The hermit's path itself is a road to immortality. By confining natural energy into one's own body, absorbing it and attempting to become one with it. To put it simply, a hermit is a living being who tries to get closer to spirits, but at the same time maintain his physical shell. Thus, the path of the hermit is nothing more than a type of supernatural power that allows the user to interfere with the natural orders of this world. But in order to poke your nose into the affairs of Mother Nature, you must not only have an amazing innate talent, but also make a tremendous amount of effort. Many of those who tried to achieve the final goal along this path either could not endure the harsh training or died of old age before they could complete it. Over many years of trial and error, one of the hermits emerged who came up with an extremely terrible way to facilitate the learning process. In his opinion, if a person cannot absorb the power of nature due to the difference in its source, then won't it be possible to achieve immortality if he replaces it with something closer to himself, for example, the vital energy of other people? Of course, in this case it would never be possible to bring one's own existence closer to spirits, but at least this solved the problem of a short life expectancy. 
The hermits who took the wrong path were called heretics, and those who were particularly successful in their endeavors were called bloodsuckers. In fact, they were no different from those vampires who often appeared in movies or books in my past world. One of their abilities was the ability to control blood, not only their own, but also that of others. Thanks to this, they could give someone a life much longer than an ordinary person. Naturally, this did not mean that there were no disadvantages to it. The most obvious of them was the need to constantly replenish energy from the bloodsucker, which made a person practically his slave. If the owner stops supplying his ward with blood, the latter will begin to starve, suffer from irresistible thirst, and ultimately lose the ability to think and turn into a monster, driven only by the desire to kill and devour. In other words, there is a very high probability that Rahan is a hermit, or rather, a perverted version of it, a bloodsucker who holds the life of the current emperor in his hands. Most likely, the dwarves came under attack because the ruler still had some kind of mental resistance to drinking the blood of his own tribesmen. Who would have thought that the knowledge received from the elders of the deep forest could be useful to me in exactly this form? Yeah. I shouldn't have called them grumpy old farts to myself, and I should have listened more carefully to what they had to say. Whatever one may say, the High Elves really have much more information about the ancient secrets of this world. If we assume that all my guesses are correct, then everything falls into place. Since Rahan is a hermit, he can naturally find some way to open a road through the mountains. And if we consider that he is a bloodsucker, then we can understand why he wants to start a war. The larger the battles, the more casualties there are, the more profitable it is for him. This development of events was far from favorable for me. It would be nice if it were all a figment of my imagination, but I'm afraid the world is not such a kind place. Everything matched up too well, so I was almost 100% sure of the correctness of my conclusions. Damn. This was the first time in my long life that I wanted to be wrong. The next morning, I sneaked out of the mansion and left the city, heading towards the capital a short distance away from a group of dwarves that I was ultimately unable to stop. This is despite the fact that I revealed to them Rahan's true identity and the fact that they were heading straight to a banquet where they would be served as the main course. Forgive me, Ace of the Elves, but we... The gnomes who are engaged in trade are not only responsible for the delivery and sale of goods, but are also the only thread connecting our fellow tribesmen who are undergoing training in the human world with their homeland. According to them, they simply could not run home with their tail between their legs and leave their brothers who might still be alive to their fate. And even if they are already dead, then they should at least return their bodies to their families. What's more, we're going to create such a commotion that it will put the whole city on edge, and while all the attention is focused on us, it will be easier for you to do your job, right? After listening to their such decisive words, I could no longer find the strength to contradict them. This time, twelve dwarves arrived in Cortolia, three of whom returned some time ago in order to deliver a report on what was happening. Thus, only the remaining nine of them set off, and me, of course. The journey to the capital took about two weeks, during which all we did was unwaveringly step forward. During breaks, I sat down with everyone if I was sure that there were no strangers around, and the rest of the time I walked at a short distance. We did not enter any villages or cities, but only continued our way along the road. It would seem that our journey should have been hampered by the heavy snow falling at this time of year, but apparently the spirits read the anxiety in my heart. So not only did we not fail while walking on the white flooring, but the clouds along our entire journey were constantly dispersed by the passing time from time to time gusts of wind. All this allowed us to overcome the seemingly difficult and dangerous road even faster than we had planned. So already on the tenth day we reached the capital. According to our plan, the dwarves entered the city straight away, but I stayed outside until dark. Although this did not mean that they would be summoned to an audience with the emperor and become someone's food as soon as they got inside, I still had little time. So I decided to take advantage of the cover of night, 
find Rayhan and finish him off if he really turns out to be a bloodsucker. Pulling the hood of my coat up to my eyes, I crept around the city, trying to avoid prying glances, especially those from the guards. Before leaving Cortolia, the dwarves obtained an approximate map of the capital and found out in which area Rykon's mansion was located. However, this turned out to be pointless, because I felt an ominous presence as soon as I entered the city. The capital of the Fadris Empire, Gadaria, was as gray as the clouds covering the sky above it. No, I, of course, do not argue that it is night and this only adds black colors, but even when I saw the city from afar, it did not seem to me a particularly bright place. But all this seemed just like flowers compared to the gloomy aura hovering in the direction of Rahan's mansion, which clearly did not belong to a person. It was difficult to describe this feeling in words, but if I tried, I would say that it stank. I once encountered the problem of river pollution in the kingdom of Ludoria, so if the situation there had not been resolved and the drainage waters would still have flowed into the river, then the resulting dead swamp would have caused exactly the same feeling that I was experiencing now. In other words, Rayhan radiated as much negative energy, an aura of death as a huge piece of territory with ruined nature. I no longer had any doubts. He was definitely a hermit who had set foot on the path of evil, because besides the high elves and spirits, these were the only living beings capable of influencing the world around them on such a scale. A wave of trembling went through my entire body. Don't think that I was afraid, not at all. I was just trying to somehow restrain the impulse to immediately resort to the power of spirits and eradicate this vile creature. Although with difficulty, I could still control my body, which cannot be said about my thoughts. At that very moment, ideas were born one after another in my head about which attack would cause the most damage in this situation. Snow was falling from the sky so conveniently that the air was filled with moisture. It could be collected by the wind and combined into a huge block of ice. Surely, if you drop several of these frosty rocks from a sufficient height, this disgusting feeling will immediately disappear. The only thing that stopped me was the fact that innocent people would suffer from such an attack, including my gnome friends who were now relaxing in the hotel. Of course I couldn't let that happen. I wonder since when did I become so impulsive and aggressive? Perhaps this is due to the fact that from the very moment I arrived in this country, all I did was hide and spy, and this had a much greater impact on my psyche than I expected. Or was I angry that someone wanted to harm Keha and her children? We cannot exclude the possibility that this was connected not only with my personality, but also with something much deeper hidden in my immortal high elf soul, which longed to eradicate as quickly as possible the heretic who dared to try to reach the level of spirits. Ever since I left the deep forest and began to live among people, I began to notice from time to time that I was different from them. This may sound ironic, but such thoughts have come to me more and more often, especially in recent years. Really, I've also matured a little because we shouldn't forget that even though the memory of a person lives in me, and I feel my age a little differently, by the standards of the high elves, I'm still considered a teenager. Unable to bear it any longer, I decided to take a shortcut and jumped onto the nearest roof. This will be much easier than trying to find my way along streets unknown to me. After passing through a poor residential area, I reached a part of the city dotted with stately mansions. Whatever you say, this view immediately makes it clear that this is the habitat of aristocrats. And despite the fact that Rahan was a stranger who had recently settled in this country, his house was not only not inferior to others, but also stood out noticeably against their background. No wonder the rest of the nobles hate him. In this part of the city, the number of security patrols had increased significantly, and on the contrary, there were practically no places where one could hide. Because of this, the difficulty level for stealth actions rose sharply, but with the help of spirits who conveyed the position of the guards to me in real time, 
It didn't take me very long to reach my destination, the source of the fetid aura that I felt from the very moment arrival in the capital. The lights were off in the mansion, but I was not optimistic enough to believe that its inhabitants were asleep, kindly leaving me free to carry out my work. The owner of this evil presence did not even think about hiding it, like a wild monster boasting to everyone about his incredible power, or because the bloodsucker absorbed too much of someone else's energy, and he lost the ability to restrain himself. Having alerted all my senses, I could not detect other people inside except the owner of the house himself. It was strange that in such a huge estate there were no servants at all, but if I think about it carefully, my perception could be confused by the waves of negative energy emanating from the house one after another. Jumping over the fence, I approached the wall of the building along which I quietly climbed onto the roof. I, of course, could have burned down the whole house in an instant, but I was forced to abandon this idea because people could remain inside. I'm afraid the dwarves captured by the Emperor are unlikely to still be alive, but what about the slaves Rikon bought? No matter how angry I was, and no matter how much I wanted to destroy everything here, I could not ignore the presence of strangers. I still remember the feeling of emptiness that came over me after I took the lives of innocents in the earthquake I caused in Ludoria. Taking out my bow and putting an arrow on the string, I jumped onto the second-floor balcony, kicked down the front door, and shot at a creature sitting on a chair that could hardly be mistaken for a person. Before me was a terrible creature, born of an attempt to contain many lives in a small human body. If you try to fit more into a vessel than it should, it will shatter into small fragments, spilling the entire contents. Therefore, looking at this bloated, distorted figure of the monster, I could not help but feel disgust. Since you have already decided to become a monster, then take the appropriate form. Otherwise, due to attempts to forcibly preserve human outlines, you only feel even more disgust. Well, I suspected that something similar would await me even before coming here, but even so, from such a disgusting sight I wanted to turn away and not look. This was the first time in my life that I complained that the High Elves' vision was so sharp that it allowed them to see everything in the smallest detail. Wait to Ra made some sounds. It was probably trying to tell me something, but due to strong hostility, my brain refused to perceive these moans as human speech. And to be honest, whatever Rayhan wanted to say, I didn't give a damn. What worried me more was that the arrow I fired, which was supposed to pierce the left side of his chest, only passed through his clothes, but did not even leave a mark on his skin. And this despite the fact that I did not use an ordinary wooden arrow, but one with a tip made from the claw of the great wolf. I wonder how his body works, since even an arrow, which at one time easily pierced even the bones of the greedy boar, cannot take it. However, I just needed to change the method of attack. Oh, spirits of the wind! The window had already been broken, so the wind from outside easily penetrated inside, by my will, concentrated at one point, and then scattered in all directions, carrying a power capable of demolishing the entire room. Well, at least that's what I thought, but Rayhan again let out an inarticulate grunt and slashed his hand through the air, causing all the wind I had collected to simply evaporate. What's happened? I definitely asked the spirits for help, and they clearly answered me, but suddenly their power just disappeared? Confronted with an impossible phenomenon, I became momentarily confused, causing my reaction to become dull. It really was only an insignificant moment, not enough even for me to blink. But during this time, Rayhan managed to get closer to me and try to pierce my stomach with his fingers. Desperately bending my body, I somehow jumped to the side, but still there was a laceration on my side, inflicted by the claws of my opponent. Moreover, due to such sudden movements, I lost my balance, which Rayhan took advantage of, sending me flying with a kick. From the intense blow, my body flew out of the balcony and crashed into the ground. 
but the spirits arrived in time and turned the hard soil into loose sand which softened my fall. Phew, they helped me out. Otherwise, in the worst case, I might have broken something. Well, my neck, for example. I also owed my life to my beloved bow, with which I managed to block a kick at the last moment. If it had been made not from a branch of a sacred tree, but from ordinary material, it would not have withstood such a strong attack and would have broken, and then the spirits of the earth would have caught the already lifeless corpse. Enduring acute pain, I rose to my feet. Hmm, however, I really should have been ashamed. I knew very well that hermits are capable of interfering with nature, so I had to assume that he could neutralize an attack carried out using the power of spirits. I knew something. But because of my disgust for the creature in front of me, it completely slipped my mind. That's why I ended up screwing up and ending up like this. Moreover, the problem is that I turned out to be weak. Of course, the power of spirits is simply unimaginable, and I know how to handle it well. In addition, I am quite good with a bow and a sword, and let's not forget about magic. But I have absolutely no experience using any of this in real combat. Not only did I rarely encounter monsters, but my confrontations with humans could be counted on one hand. Of course, I don't take into account all the fistfights in which I participated, because they are unlikely to somehow help me defeat the bloodsucker. True, I had no choice. I had to finish off Rahan here and now, no matter what. Moreover, this must be done before the guards come running in response to the noise. But make no mistake, I am not at all a fighter for justice who has come to eradicate evil, and I do not now represent the High Elves. I also don't think it's a bad thing for people to try to prolong their too short lives, even if they harm others in the process. This is the natural order of things in this world. We are all, one way or another, forced to absorb other people's lives to prolong our own. And for my people, it doesn't make much difference whether we are talking about plants, animals, or people. I am driven only by personal motives, because as long as this monster is alive, my loved ones will be in danger. That's why I want to kill him, and that's all. But first, I needed to stop looking at this bloodsucker with disgust and recognize him as a strong enemy. I may not be anything significant myself, but all my teachers are amazing people, and a dwarf, so I'll manage somehow. Collecting my thoughts, I took a deep breath and looked at Rayhan, who had come out onto the balcony and was looking down at me. It's so big, however, with what power to challenge me, stupid long-eared one. Be afraid, regret, tremble and cry, you will still end up becoming a part of me. Although the hostility has not gone away, Having recognized my rival, I gradually began to recognize the words in his seemingly incoherent growl. Probably, because of the sharp pain in my side, I was able to cool my head. However, I heard nothing but ordinary stereotypes. Isn't he ashamed? Hmm, yes. Although I should be ashamed because it's me that this monster is looking down on, uttering standard phrases from second-rate American action films. Complaining about my own stupidity, I stretched my lips in a crooked grin, but Rayan thought that I was mocking him, so he immediately became furious, abruptly rushed from his place and swung his fist at me. I noticed this last time, but isn't it too fast? However, this no longer matters because the same trick won't work with me a second time. Earth! I shouted at the same time as I quickly jumped back. In response to my call, the soil under my feet began to move and turned into countless stone spears that were aimed at Riken. The origins of this world, he began to cast a spell, preparing to neutralize my attack. But I had already seen this, so I was ready for such a turn. I didn't have time to call out loud, so I waved my hand like a fan. Having understood my sign, the wind spirits began to thicken the air, turning it into a kind of cannonballs and began to bombard the bloodsucker from above. Cannonballs on top and spears on the bottom. I didn't mind if he tried to cancel it all out because this time, instead of one powerful attack, I decided to resort to numerous small ones. It seems that the enemy mistook me for an ordinary elf, 
But unfortunately for him, this is not the case at all. Apparently, due to the fact that he repelled my last attack even before it gained full power, he misjudged its scale. In fact, I am the Supreme One, who has a much closer connection with the spirits, therefore, having encountered unexpected pressure, Rayhan could not even move from his place, but only continued to reflect the projectiles flying at him one after another. El, yes, he, Rao, Fos, I began to slowly pronounce. Only this time it was not a call for help addressed to the spirits, but a magic spell. Turning the mana flowing inside me into a flame that gathered above my outstretched palm, I launched it at the bloodsucker. Flying in a straight line, the fireball unerringly hit its target, immediately followed by a powerful explosion. Such power would be enough to take the lives of several ordinary people. But Rayhan was far from ordinary, and it was difficult to call him a human being, so he managed to withstand it. Putting his claws forward, he dispersed the flames raging around him and rushed at me. Apparently, he still got a decent hit because his ugly face was now distorted not only by anger, but also by pain. However, I expected such a reaction from him even at the moment when I began a series of attacks, so I took the correct stance in advance. Channeling mana into my magic sword, I swung it, performing such a familiar technique from the Yosogi school. One horizontal swing and one vertical. At this point, the outcome was decided. I don't know how Rayhan's body was constructed, since he could deflect even an arrow with a tip from the claw of the great wolf with his bare skin, but this clearly spurred the enemy's self-confidence. Believing that he could withstand my sword without any problems, he did not even try to dodge, but rushed straight at me like a wild animal. But I also had strong faith in my weapon, forged with Fidel. Needless to say, my blacksmithing skills were recognized by a stinking gnome. As for fencing, although I was an immature warrior, admired by the beauty and sharpness of Kaihi's sword, I continued to train for many years and eventually achieved recognition as my master. This magic sword and this technique, no matter how tough the opponent was, I was confident that I could cut him. Riken cut into four parts, lay on the ground and twitched in death convulsions. Vampires on Earth could be reborn even from the ashes, but the bloodsuckers of this world were not capable of this. Even if they were not afraid of sunlight, could take a shower from holy water without any problems and would not even scratch themselves at the sight of garlic or a cross. But if you kill them, they die, as expected. However, if he is left as is, then perhaps at the expense of the lives he has absorbed during all this time he will get out, but I was not going to let him do that. Looking at me, Rayhan desperately tried to say something, but due to the fact that his mouth was now also divided vertically, he could not utter a sound. I roughly guessed what exactly he wanted. It was either pleas for mercy or angry curses, but I was not interested in either one. Only now, when I was able to relax a little, did I realize that my wound hurt as if salt had been poured into it? Damn, well, all this is not mine. But despite this, for the first time I thought that I needed to become stronger. If I am going to continue to live outside the forest, then I will probably encounter such monsters more than once. Whether this will be in ten, a hundred, or even several hundred years, I don't know. But there are no guarantees that the next enemy will not be much more terrible. Having engraved this decision in my heart, I passed mana through the blade and slashed down with all my might and then again, and again, and again. Leaving the aristocratic area before the guards arrived, I hid with the dwarves and began to heal my wounds. However, although this was called treatment, it was more like torture because the gnomes had naturally strong bodies and high endurance, so at the moment when one of them took out strong alcohol and washed the wound with it, I could not restrain myself and cried out pitifully. To be honest, even when Rayhan's claws pierced my side, it didn't hurt that much compared to this kind of treatment. According to my doctors, something very bad got into the wound, so the flesh began to rot and they had to act so roughly. 
Hmm. Since things were like this, then nothing can be done. It's worth enduring the first aid, and then I can use magic to increase the recovery speed. Come to think of it, I used mana quite often this time, perhaps for the first time since I left Odin. As for the search for Rehan's killer, despite the fact that the victim was a high-ranking aristocrat, the investigation was very superficial. Of course, the fact that he was hated by both the army and the nobles played a certain role in this. But most importantly, something much more important happened at the same time. It was publicly announced that the emperor was struck by a serious illness, and therefore he resigned and the eldest prince ascended the throne. But in reality, everything was much darker. Thanks to the wind spirits, I was able to find out that this so-called disease of the emperor was nothing more than his transformation into a ghoul, also called a corpse eater. From what I heard, I learned that the moment I killed Rahan, the emperor lost his mind and turned into a monster, after which he began to attack the courtiers and servants, killing and devouring them. Although he turned into a monster, he was still the ruler of an entire empire, and he could not simply be eliminated on the spot. So it was decided to capture him alive, which is why the number of victims only increased. As a result, they somehow managed to lock him in the tower dungeon. But, of course, no one was going to reveal the whole truth to the people. If someone finds out about this, it will not only affect the reputation of the empire, but in the worst-case scenario, it could lead to a split in the country. Apparently, the new emperor will have a difficult start to his reign, however. This had nothing to do with me, but this still concerned my fellow gnomes. Although the responsibility for the death of their fellow tribesmen was placed entirely on Rahan, an official apology was still made to the kingdom of the gnomes. We should not forget that the Fodor Empire could maintain a leading position among neighboring countries largely due to the fact that it traded with the gnomes and also invited them to work in the blacksmith guild on its territory. Because of this, the newly minted ruler desperately tried to do everything he could to assuage the guilt of his predecessor. But the anger of the dwarves over the death of their fellow tribesmen was very deep, so the deterioration of relations between the countries could not be avoided, although they also would not want to lose such an important client. So there was no need to be afraid of a complete break. I no longer had any business in the Empire, so all I could do was secretly follow the dwarves to Cortolia, unite with them, and return home, where Vin was waiting for me. If I ever have the opportunity to visit this country again, I would like to come openly, with my head held high and not hide in the shadows all the time. I must say that the trip this time turned out to be unpleasant, and although I thought that I would be able to enjoy playing spy games, in fact, only the first few days turned out to be fun. On the second night after the dwarves left the capital, I was floating high in the sky above the city, very high, even higher than the central tower, in one of the rooms of which the former emperor was locked. If you look at the city at night, it seemed like a stone monster that had swallowed up many people. Perhaps during the day, there is a much more pleasant view but it is unlikely that I will get to see it. Noticing red lights below, I realized that these were the torches of guards patrolling the streets of the town. The likelihood that I would be discovered was extremely small, but it was better not to risk it and quickly accomplish what I stayed for. Taking out my bow, I prepared an arrow and pulled the string, so that nothing would disturb me. I asked the spirits to stop the gust of wind for a while. My target was behind one of the tower windows. Leaving the shutters open in such frost is still a mistake, but if you consider what that room is intended for, then we can assume that this was done on purpose. The room in which the former ruler was locked was intended for prisoners who could not be executed directly, but who were sentenced to death. Therefore, conditions were created in it for Mother Nature to do the dirty work for people. But this only works with normal people. And this time, everything was much different, because a ghoul that has absorbed many lives is able to survive for a long time even in hellish conditions. 
He will be thirsty for fresh blood, and when someone comes to check on his condition, he may attack him, break free, and begin a massive massacre. Although I said that I did not care about the inhabitants of this country, if, knowing all this, I had simply turned around and left, and then many innocent people had died, then this would lie heavily on my conscience. As expected, even my eyes could not see such a distant target at night, but I was helped by the high elf's senses, which told me about the presence of evil in that direction. Taking a deep breath, I sent the arrow flying. Slipping between the bars of the bars, she pierced the heart of the former emperor, ending his unrealizable dream of returning to youth and living at least a little longer. Creation is the moment when this world came into being. No one knows whether the world was created by the Creator, or on the contrary, in the world that has existed since the beginning of time, the Creator was born. Whatever one may say, there are no witnesses who have survived to this day and cannot be. Be that as it may, for the sake of a smoother control of the excessive force of nature, the Creator created spirits in the distant past. After the environment became more or less suitable for life, he gave birth to someone who could understand the spirits, look after them, and direct their power in the right direction. This is how the original elf appeared. Looking at the small creature scurrying on the surface, the creator rejoiced, and next he placed the firstborn giant above the clouds, and in order to unite the two, he turned the flame into the firstborn phoenix, which could fly between the earth and the sky. At this point, the creator felt satisfied. He couldn't think of anything else that could be needed in his world, and he didn't want anything. Therefore, thinking that his intervention was no longer required, he created the gods to watch over the young world, and he himself plunged into deep sleep. The gods, in turn, first of all created the elves, taking the firstborn as a model. After this, they went further and gave birth to a race completely opposite to them, the gnomes. As a result of an attempt to balance the two peoples, humanity appeared. But after seeing how weak it turned out to be, the gods decided to correct their mistake by filling the world with animals and beast people. Unlike the Creator, there were several gods, so each of them created a race to his own taste, halflings darting around the steppes, the heavenly people soaring under the clouds with wings behind them, mermaids living at the bottom of the sea, and many others. It was due to the fact that there were several gods that this world developed rapidly, but also because of this, their opinions differed, which led to the First War. There were those who wanted slow development and those who wanted to speed it up, and also the gods who did not want any changes. Each of them loved their creations, so they did everything possible to create a more comfortable environment for them, but at the same time they all tried to interfere with each other. Disagreements turned into a squabble, a squabble into a conflict, and the conflict gave birth to a war previously unknown to them. Not only the fierce gods, but also the peace-loving ones were forced to take up arms. And only long after the start of the war, the gods realized that, possessing boundless power, they inadvertently dragged the children they had spawned into the battle, thereby greatly harming the world. In fact, several races were completely wiped out during the conflict, while many others suffered huge losses and were on the verge of extinction. Also, due to the clash of divine forces, mana leaked into the world which began to distort the weakest creatures, thereby creating monsters in the world. If the scale of the war continued to increase, then the gods could incur the wrath of the guardian of this world, the original dragon, who received special power from the Creator Himself. Frightened by this, the gods united their forces and created a new territory, the world of the gods, where they all moved, an unreasonable influence on the mortal world was strictly prohibited. That is why, in our time, the gods almost never participate directly in the affairs of our world, although occasionally, something happens that can only be called a divine miracle. All these events are from the distant past, so no one can confirm whether this is true or not. But such is the generally accepted knowledge about the gods, which has survived to this day in the form of legends and myths. 
However, in different parts of the world, there are many other legends that differ from each other. But this is not so important now. Why did I even remember all this? Besides, I personally think that the elves, from the point of view of the history of their origin, are closer not to us, the high ones, but to the gnomes. But I don't dare say this out loud, since they will probably be very angry with me. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. And so, when I returned from the Fodor Empire for my services in resolving the crisis, I was officially recognized as a full-fledged resident of the Kingdom of the Gnomes. Of course, so does Vin. Although we had been accepted as one of our own before, it was nothing more than a welcoming address to guests, but now we have actually joined the society. To be honest, all my actions were motivated by personal interests, but the gnomes who did not know this highly appreciated my merits, so I was pleased, but a little embarrassed. Not only Aswald and his family came out to meet me, but also Grander, acquaintances from the forge and bar, as well as neighbors whose names I didn't even know. Everyone was tipsy, and my welcome party suddenly turned into a wild celebration. As I learned later, no other race had ever received citizenship in the Dwarven Kingdom before, so this could be called a historical achievement. In a sense, this was window dressing on the part of the current king who recognized Oswald as his successor, so he decided to make life a little easier for his foreign students. However, I was little interested in the king's reasons because there was a special meaning in our acquisition of civil rights right now. If this had happened after Aswald ascended the throne, then there would have been those who began to accuse him of abuse of power and bias towards his own students. But since I became a citizen by the will of the current king, this, on the contrary, should give impetus to development with other races. In other words, my recent thoughts about trade between the forest folk and the dwarves are no longer just idle dreams, and there is a hint of the reality of their implementation. Of course, international trade also brought certain difficulties. Not only does it require a lot of effort, but all sorts of problems can arise, and in the worst case, the gap between the races can only become wider. But be that as it may, I personally found it interesting that the two peoples would finally begin to communicate. And yet, Although it's not good to be particularly happy about this, relations between the country of the gnomes and the empire have deteriorated further, so the export of weapons, armor, and other things has sharply decreased. Of course, the economy cannot stand still, and in order to compensate for all this, the volume of supplies to the kingdom of Ludoria has increased enormously. I was sure that thanks to this, the opportunity to do business with the elves was bound to be born. The forest people could offer fruits and berries or alcohol made from them, and in return they would receive equipment made from the skin, fangs, and claws of monsters. I was a little hesitant about whether to use people's services as an intermediary. It would be much better to conduct business through a third race, thereby reducing direct contact to begin with. It's just okay. There are still gnomes, but the elves know nothing about the value of objects or even the very concept of money, so there is a danger that they can be deceived by greedy people. This will lead to a new wave of hatred towards humanity, which will spread through it to the gnomes. In general, continuous problems. I described the current situation to Irina in a letter but it's probably worth meeting and talking with her in person in the near future. Although this is my next selfish prank, I believe the girl will understand and support me. It's been about 18 years since I met Vin. This year he turned 24, which by human standards is equivalent to 12 years of age. If you think about it this way, it seems to me that his development is too rapid if we do not forget that he is still a half-elf. I believe this was due to the fact that he eats more nutritious and balanced food compared to life in the forest, and thanks to fencing and blacksmithing, he does not shy away from exercise. Not much time has passed since he began studying with Asvald, but according to the stinking gnome, the guy not only remembers everything well and has an innate sense, but at the same time shows a zealous desire to learn. 
The guy has already gotten pretty good at controlling the flames of the forge, although in principle, what else could you expect from someone who can communicate with spirits? But I was sad that Vin didn't tell me anything about it. I also understand the reluctance to talk about how he failed and was scolded, but he could share his successes. My mentor told me more than once that it is quite natural for a guy of his age not to report everything to his guardian, and if I wish Vin a prosperous growth, then I should shut my mouth and just keep an eye on him. The stinking gnome is a father himself, and much more experienced than me, so I listened to his advice and did not bother Vin with my questions. It looked as if Aswald knew the boy much better than I did. However, lately I really didn't understand what he was thinking about. Although, no, it's not like that. If you look back at my past, everything falls into place, and I just don't want to admit the obvious. It was by building some distance between himself and the guardian that I am that Vin began his preparation for becoming an adult. If you think about it, I also left my homeland, the Deep Forest, when I was 150, which by human standards is about 15 years. The boy is also already 12, so the day when he will become independent is not far off. One way or another, I was still able to spend some time with him. Apart from eating, the longest I could do this was when practicing with a sword. Like me, he is a follower of the Yosogi school, so it was much more convenient to train together. This way, we could point out mistakes to each other when performing techniques and also arrange sparring. I noticed that after the incident in the Fodra Empire, something changed in me. I used to think of combat as something like a competition, where the most important thing was to use your own techniques correctly in any situation. In other words, I was only interested in the beauty of my own sword. Of course, neither sparring nor battle can be complete without an opponent, but I did not pay enough attention to him. However, now I wasn't just showing off the elegance of my own techniques, but was mostly concentrating on my opponent, waiting for the best moment to attack. This was probably due to the fact that, for the first time, I felt the need to become stronger. Thanks to this, I could foresee a gap in my opponent's defense and take advantage of it correctly. Moreover, I managed to do this not only against Vin, but also at a time when warriors of the Gnome Kingdom joined our training. If it works out, I would like to maintain the current attitude until I return to Keha. Then I could relearn everything from her again, and this time become the full-fledged swordsman she talked about. But all this will become possible only in the future, for I did not plan to leave this country until Vin completed his training in blacksmithing. So, I'm going off topic a little, but in short, the effectiveness of Vin's and my training has increased noticeably. Eight! Along with a scream and the air shaking from tension, Vin swung at me, but his attack was accepted and rejected by my wooden sword. But the guy didn't stop there. Courage, pride, or slight madness. I don't know what word would be better to describe it, but Vin continued his onslaught, trying to crush me with countless blows. The feeling was simply amazing. Before this, one of the dwarf warriors taught him something, and the guy was able to merge this knowledge with his own style. However, given our physique, both Vin and I had trouble copying the dwarf's ultimate technique, which mainly relied on the sheer force and gravity of a single attack. But at the same time, we were much faster and more agile, which went especially well with Yosogi's style. That's why the guy adopted from the gnomes not their skill, but their pressure, and if one attack was not heavy enough, then a second, third could be added after it, as long as endurance allowed. If someone underestimates Vin, he may pay bitterly for it. Let's not forget that he began training in the Yosogi style about ten years ago, so his sword, although wooden, felt like sharp steel. Although he had to get used to the gradually lengthening arms and legs each time, many years of practice were not in vain for him. That's why I didn't take a step back. At a greater distance, it's easier to parry attacks, but if I back away, the guy's pressure will only increase further, and in the end, even I won't be able to stop him. He really has grown noticeably.
I probably won't be able to take him lightly anymore because there's a child in front of me. For some reason, it seems to me that the guy has much better data to become an outstanding swordsman. Taking the matter seriously, I took a step towards my opponent. No matter how violent his attacks are, that doesn't mean they can't be dodged. After each blow, there is always a moment when Vin draws the sword back for the next swing. It was at this moment that I threw my hand with the weapon forward. It's not that I want to deny the boy's amazing growth, but I wish he could stay with me a little longer. I'm not going to forbid him to leave the nest, but let it be at least a few years later. There was a thud from the collision of two wooden swords, and my blow was slightly stronger, but it was enough to cause Vin to lose his balance and be driven into a corner. After the end of the sparring, we bowed to each other as usual, and an expression of annoyance appeared on the guy's face, which he could not completely suppress. This gave me a confused feeling of relief and guilt. Ah, why are relationships between people so complicated? However, all these worries will surely turn into pleasant memories over the years. It will soon be a year since I returned from the Fodra Empire. Thanks to the help of a caravan friend, I exchanged several letters with Irina during this time. As I expected, or better yet, as always, the girl willingly volunteered to help in my new venture. But there were several obstacles in the way of trade relations between elves and dwarves. For example, neither Irene nor I had any real power to force the forest people to cooperate with us. As a high one, I have enough authority for the elves to listen to my request, but this does not mean that I can order them as I please. Previously, when I ordered the elves to leave all the forests of the kingdom of Ludoria, I had a good reason for I acted to save the lives of the people. That is why the elders responded to my call and obediently moved. But this time everything will not go so easily because I am driven by a simple desire, and it is not at all enough for the elves to overcome the hatred of gnomes inherited from their ancestors and begin to trade with them. Even if I try to persuade them, the elves' opinion of the High Ones may well change before I succeed. It's the same story with Irina. The girl is recognized by both her people and the inhabitants of the kingdom as a representative of all the elves of Ludoria. Thanks to her merits, she can make decisions single-handedly. If the scale of the issue is not too large, both sides trust her so much. But demanding to enter into negotiations with the gnomes... This is beyond her capabilities, because none of the elves will listen to the girl's absurd words. However, there is one way to turn authority into real power. I just need to take Irina's place, gain a legitimate position, take advantage of the privileges of the Supreme and begin to gradually expand them. As a result, all the elves of the kingdom will be under my influence. In this case, no one will complain anymore no matter what I'm going to do. In other words, I need to become the king of the elves. But, frankly speaking, no, excuse me. I don't see anything attractive in standing above the crowd. On the contrary, in this case, I will only see one side of them, or rather only the tops of their bowed heads. I am one of those who are used to communicating with people by looking them in the face. And if they interest me, then I can look at them from other sides. One way or another, it was for this reason that I asked Irina to become the representative of the elves in my place. Of course, the fact that she was much better suited for negotiations also cannot be denied. Thus, I spent my days puzzling over the solution to the problems that lay before me, when in another letter from Irene, I saw something that greatly interested me. Her assistant and part-time successor, in case she decides to retire, decided to gather several elves who had long left the forest and became adventurers, in other words, weirdos like me, and bring them to the kingdom of the gnomes. They wanted to learn about this country not only from my words, but also to look at everything with their own eyes, and at the same time demonstrate to the gnomes that there are friendly elves besides me who are friendly towards them. Well, that's quite reasonable. If the arriving elves are adventurers, then they will be able to understand better than anyone else the quality of the weapons and armor forged by the dwarves, 
and will certainly show interest in them. Again, gnomes are very hot-tempered and love to fight, so it will be easier for them to accept their own kind. Adventurers, through whose veins the hot blood of adventurers flows for their own sake. If at least one of them can become friends, then I can take advantage of this and begin to expand the circle of communication between the two peoples. The more people are drawn in, the bigger the waves will be in the quiet backwater. And when the waves spread widely enough, then even if not all the forests of the kingdom, but at least a small part of them can support me in my endeavors. However, there was one more fact that made me think about Irina's letter. Apparently, she began preparations to leave the kingdom. This is because the people closest to her, Cliff and Martin, have already grown old and, ten years later, or maybe twenty, it's not so important they don't have so much time left. I don't know whether she wants to spend their last years next to them or, on the contrary, is afraid to see them like this, but I believe that after they are gone, she is unlikely to remain in Ludoria. That's why she found a successor for herself and began to prepare strong ground for him. This time, too, if everything goes well, it will be his significant merit. In this case, I will also prepare for their reception, and then I will rely on Irina's ability to select people, that is, elves. I was a little uneasy, arranging a meeting between dwarves and elves so unexpectedly, but since the girl made such a decision, then I can only believe in her. So, if I don't have faith in her, then who should I trust? In this world, she cared about me more than anyone else and understood me better than anyone else. If I had not met her that day, my life in human society could have turned out completely differently and obviously not in a good sense of the word. First, you need to prepare permits for all... Five? If we take into account Irina herself, then I need to ask Asvald to get me six passes. You also need to take care of housing, provisions, etc. Yeah, I definitely have busy days ahead of me. Whatever one may say, such a large group of elves will visit the kingdom of the gnomes for the first time in their lives. Surely, everyone will be very surprised by this. However, my obtaining citizenship of this country was a much more unheard of event, so perhaps the gnomes have already begun to develop immunity to surprises. After it was decided to welcome the elves into the land of the gnomes, I spent two months full of bustle and trouble. True, since we discussed the schedule and various subtleties of the plan by exchanging letters, it was inevitable to avoid moments when there was more or less nothing to do. Well, in other words, this was exactly the case now. Inside, everyone was already on edge, but I couldn't do anything until I received an answer from the other side. It was these feelings and the excess of free time that gave rise to an unexpected desire in me. To take a bath. To be more precise, a hot spring, which was an integral part of everyday life in my past life. What? I have a bathroom in the house. Why don't you like it? Oswald stared at me incomprehensibly. I don't argue. The gnomes surprisingly turned out to be clean people, and they wash themselves regularly, but the whole problem is that they use excess steam from the forge and build something like saunas. But this is completely different from the water bath I'm used to, in which you can stretch out and lie around for hours, giving your tired body a rest. A sauna is a sauna, although it is pleasant in its own way. But my soul now requires something completely different. Ah, if you think about it, the leader of the Warrior Corps once mentioned that he saw a place in the region of the volcanic belt where water flows from underground. Monsters come there to drink. Wait, don't tell me that you are you going to take a bath among monsters, said the mentor, looking at me with eyes in which his doubts about my sanity were clearly written. No, no, no. Even I'm not going to throw out something so reckless, but who does he even take me for? It was enough for me to know that boiling water was gushing out of the ground somewhere. The rest can be asked from the spirits of water and earth, enlist their support, and dig a new hot spring. It will most likely be too hot next to it, so it is necessary to deliver water to another place and fence it off with rocks so that it is difficult for monsters to get inside. 
I'm not greedy and I'm not going to use it alone. If everything works out well, then the onsen can be designated as a resting place for warriors. By the way, it would be nice to invite the elves planning to visit us there as well. It will be useful for them to personally visit the volcano at least once, because the power of the spirits of fire and earth in that place is simply amazing, and the opportunity to feel this is extremely valuable for the elves. You also need to take wine with you. He had already grown up and matured enough so that the mountain road did not present an insurmountable obstacle for him. And most importantly, I will be pleased if we prepare the hot springs together. It was only when I informed Oswald of my intentions that he gave me a completely unexpected statement. Uh-huh. Everything is clear. In that case, I'll go with you too. Oh, oh, what is he talking about? Although you can't tell from him, but the future dwarf king is standing in front of me, how can I let him go to the most dangerous place in the area? Well, damn. You're going to take the kid with you, right? So you're confident that you can keep him safe. Besides, even the elves will be heading there later, so why can't I? He stated with a capricious look, before laughing loudly. No, he's right, of course. But it seems to me that the idea of taking a bath, which came to me in a moment of idleness, will turn into a much more grandiose event than I imagined. And now, a week later, my fears came true. Due to the fact that the stinking gnome decided to go on the road, a guard detachment was immediately assigned to him. Moreover, it was stated to me with an important look that if the hot spring is planned to be used as a resting place for warriors, then they should also take part in choosing the location, so they are here not only to protect the future king. After this, citing the fact that with the presence of security, security increased even more, Aswald decided to bring his entire family with him. Also, builders and carpenters were imposed on me in order to arrange the surroundings of the hot springs, and even the minor grander, who had nothing to do with all this, found an excuse to follow us. Besides them, there were still plenty of people interested. Not quite a lot, but not so much that I could take them all. Well, damn it, why did it all turn out this way? With such a crowd, Obviously not a single small monster will come near us, but on the other hand, we can attract the attention of someone large. This is a natural result after all that you have done. You can call it innate charm, stinking elf, Aswald casually threw at me, watching with a malicious grin as I faced difficulties. Everyone knows that you are strong, consider us your friends, and are ready to fight side by side with us. Besides, you constantly come up with all sorts of fun things that we could not even imagine. That's why everyone wants to come with us. How sweetly he sang, does he really think he can chat me up and make me forget that this stinking gnome is to blame for all this fuss? Actually, I was planning a family trip with Vin, not a group excursion. However, it is very nice to hear praise, so so be it. I will forgive him this time. Although I carefully selected the participants, in the end there was still a crowd of almost fifty people, well, in the sense of dwarves. Since there is already such a crowd, then you need to make a comfortable place to rest, as far as possible from the volcanoes, where it will be easiest for the dwarves to use it. Ah, among us there is Aswald's wife and daughter and several other ladies so we will have to carefully divide the hot springs into male and female halves. Of course I consider myself quite brave and reckless, but even my nerves are not thick enough to suggest mixed baths just because I'm too lazy to do the extra work. Eh, who would have thought that my simple desire to take a bath would result in an event of almost national level? However, to my own surprise, I enjoyed it all. In truth, Vin is not very good at using spirit power offensively, perhaps because he does not want to use the spirits who have become his close friends for such purposes, or perhaps he prefers to rely mainly on himself, or it could also be that I taught him poorly. But this absolutely does not mean that he does not own the magic of spirits and cannot enlist their help. Vin? 
The boy nodded to my question, saying that I also noticed, after which he turned around and said, Ahead, about five minutes into the journey, a medium-sized monster disguises itself as a rock. Friends from the Warrior Corps, we are counting on you. Now we both use the power of spirits to detect enemies. This is exactly what I was talking about. Although Vin does not like to attack himself, I believe that in communicating with spirits he can outperform even the average adult elf. My search for the hot spring had turned into something big, so I couldn't avoid having to rely on the boy's ability, so I decided to give him some training. This can be considered a kind of exam for Vin, and it will also increase confidence in his skills among the gnomes who follow us. Upon reaching the volcano belt, you will first need to find a source of water and dig it out. I'm afraid that among all those present, only I am capable of this. After this, the carpenters will begin to arrange the rest area, but this is not a job that can be completed in one day. Therefore, there will inevitably be a need to get food, and for this, warriors will go hunting for monsters. This way, our group will be split up, and to be honest, it will be hard for me to keep track of everyone on my own. That's why, for the sake of insurance, I will need to rely on Vin in places where I myself cannot be. To be honest, I originally planned to come here alone with the boy and take a leisurely stroll, avoiding unnecessary encounters with monsters, but unfortunately, things never go the way I would like. However, such experience will also be useful for Vin, so even if he is a little nervous, he is clearly trying, so that's okay. Having reached the outer edge of the volcanic belt, I immediately found several places where a source could potentially be dug, so I decided to ask the gnomes which one would be easier to defend and more convenient to use. Having decided on the place, I turned to the spirit of the earth, and he helped me dig a deep hole, from which water immediately sprayed out like a fountain. Seeing this spectacle, the gnomes opened their mouths. After asking the spirits, I found out that this water not only will not harm the human body, but it can even be drunk. Sticking my hand into the resulting reservoir, I noticed that the water was slightly viscous, which means it contained a small amount of alkali, which could often be found at hot springs in my past life. But the temperature was a little high, and I had to direct the water to another place. But on the way there, for some reason, it turned white and became a little cloudy. Worried, I turned to the spirits, but they assured me that this change was due to the contact of water with air, and in principle, there was nothing wrong with it. If you dig a shallow hole, have gnomes polish it, and then fill it with boiling water, you'll get an almost perfect outdoor bath. Hmm, although this was normal in my past life, but in this world where you could encounter a monster at any moment, it would be difficult to pull off something like this, although the idea itself was quite funny. By the way, the gnomes also liked it, so they immediately got to work, and upon completion they thoroughly enjoyed the bath, taking turns standing guard. Those pleasant feelings when you immerse your body in hot water were completely different from the sauna familiar to the gnomes, so everyone was in high spirits. Who knows, maybe today will serve as the starting point for a new tradition to arise in the underground kingdom, and the sauna will be replaced by a bath in every home, but that's a completely different story. The next day, in order to prepare for long work, a detachment of warriors went hunting, and Vin decided to join them. To be honest, I was a little... No, I was quite worried about him, but if I had been too protective, it would not only have hurt his pride, but also had a negative impact on his development. I had the job of erecting walls and securing the place, so I could not go with the boy. It seemed that Oswald guessed my feelings, but he did not say anything, but simply slapped me forcefully on the back. I don't know what he wanted to achieve by this, but we will assume that he encouraged me in this way. The group returned only in the evening and brought several monsters they had finished off. Noticing them on the way, I breathed a sigh of relief and went out to meet them. After this, the warriors began to praise Vin, saying that I can be proud of my son, 
because he has grown up to be a good warrior. In battle, he did not stick his nose where he shouldn't and carefully fulfilled his role. The boy listening to all this was a little shy, but then he proudly told me about everything in detail. Looking at my son joyfully talking about his adventures, I felt an indescribable joy and wanted this moment to last as long as possible. After working at a construction site, taking a bath in the bathroom and eating fried meat, spending days like this, we didn't even notice how the rest area was completed. It was supposed to be a traditional hot spring, but the dwarves had clearly gone overboard and it was now better called a bunker or even a fortress. As it turned out, the soldiers decided to use this place not only for recreation, but also to station a regular garrison here. This was very different from the original plans, but on the other hand, you could immediately understand that everyone really liked the bath. Perhaps one day, tour groups will be brought here, and in time, this place will turn into a first-class resort. I hope that the elves who I plan to show the hot springs to during their visit to the land of the dwarves will also like the hot springs, and after returning, they will create something similar in Ludoria. However, First, I need to complete preparations for their meeting. About two months later, one day, a group of elves actually arrived in the land of the dwarves, following a bearded guide. Although everything, from permission to enter the country to the guide, was prepared by me and Aswald. And of course, we knew about their visit from the very beginning. But even so, I could not help but doubt my eyes when I watched a group of fellow tribesmen walking along street of the underground city. In addition, the surrounding gnomes looked at them with a very indifferent look, as if saying that they were quite accustomed to the elves and there was nothing to be surprised about. Oh well, yeah. They're actually already used to it. High elf, regular, or semi, it doesn't matter to them. The gnomes classify us all as one species, and due to the fact that Vin and I have been living in this country for quite a long time, meeting an elf in a store, forge, or bar, for they have become quite commonplace. As soon as I thought so, I even felt a little sorry for the group of guests who were nervously looking around, because in their understanding, the kingdom of the gnomes, although it had not reached the level of enemy territory, was a place where anything could happen to them at any moment. But even among them, one figure stood out, Irina, who serenely walked at the head of the procession. Master Aswald, Mr. Ace, no see for a long time. Also, dear gnomes, although for a short time we count on your hospitality, she greeted us politely and very elegantly. Moreover, she clearly did not tense up and behaved quite naturally. However, what else can you expect from one who is the only one among the elves who has repeatedly represented her people in negotiations when her opponent was an entire kingdom? Moreover, she has more than once found herself in deadly situations, so it is not difficult for her to communicate kindly with those who do not show any intentions of fighting, even despite the fact that they are dwarves in front of her. Oh, thirty years have already passed, right? Are you still using the machete you bought then? Show me it later, I'll patch it up for you. Well, let's not hang around in such a place. Come to me, you probably have something to eat. What to talk to Ace, Aswald said in a friendly manner, exchanging a firm handshake with Irina. Five more tribesmen arrived with Irina, three men and two girls. I have known some of them since I lived in the capital of Ludoria. Although our communication was limited to advice on equipment and the exchange of standard phrases, I was pleased to see familiar faces. Plunging into nostalgic memories, I involuntarily smiled and waved my hand to them, to which they timidly responded with the same gesture. The Dwarven Kingdom is essentially a huge underground cave that was dug into the mountains and covered with stone. But don't even think about comparing this place to a hole or a hole, because this country was neat, sophisticated, and had its own culture. The wells and sewers were properly equipped, so there was no trace of an unpleasant smell. As for ventilation, it is thought out so carefully that residents can enjoy the fresh breeze blowing through the city streets every day. Although sunlight is not able to penetrate to such a depth, 
Its absence was compensated by an abundant amount of luminous moss, thanks to which the stone buildings were buried in soft light. When I saw all this for the first time, I was extremely impressed, and on the faces of the visiting elves one could see a surprised expression. Even Irene, who behaved calmer than the others, turned her head with her mouth open. One of the prejudices that elves have towards dwarves is that my fellow tribesmen consider the underground people to be barbarians and savages. So I hope that by seeing such beauty they will be able to dispel such misunderstandings. If they had stopped looking at the gnomes with disdain and thought carefully, they would have immediately realized that such a number of masters who were famous for their skills throughout the world could not have been born among the savages. I don't deny that these guys are very straightforward and quick to start a fight, but that doesn't mean they lack discretion. They have perseverance and endurance, which allows them to do painstaking work, and they also have excellent aesthetic taste. That is why this city is not only functional, but also very beautiful. Well, it's true that it is located in a remote region among steep mountains, so it cannot be called convenient for traders and travelers. After Oswald brought everyone to his house, or rather, mansion, everyone introduced themselves once again. Excluding Irina, three more elves, two men and one girl, were adventurers, and I knew them a little. But as for the remaining two, they led a slightly unexpected lifestyle. To begin with, the guy, Horatio, turned out to be a bard who travels not only throughout the kingdom of Ludoria, but also throughout all neighboring states. He had been to Vila Strica and the Eastern Union several times, so I felt that he and I would easily find a common language. And finally, a girl named Levis. She was an artist and a very famous one at that. She is often invited to paint portraits of aristocrats and royalty, but her true vocation is landscapes. The girl was impatient to capture on paper what she saw in the land of the gnomes, so she continued to fidget throughout the entire acquaintance and did not even try to hide it. Yes, Irene brought some very eccentric elves with her. I didn't even imagine that there were such individuals among my people. I wonder how they will perceive this country, whether they will be able to understand it and correctly tell about it from the outside. I was already full of anticipation, although Levis was ready to run to paint a picture at any moment. But first, everyone needed a break from the long journey, and after that, they had an audience with the king. However, there is no need to worry about this. I met the current ruler when I received my citizenship and several times after that, and he left me with the impression of a very good-natured grandfather. At least in public, the elves who arrived in the kingdom of the gnomes merged with their surroundings much better than I expected, so much so that it was even suspicious. The first to find a common language with the underground people was the bard, Horatio. As soon as the audience with the king ended, and everyone was allowed to move freely around the country, he immediately rushed to the tavern, performed several heroic songs beloved by the dwarves, and, in the blink of an eye, captured the hearts of the tipsy audience. Moreover, he found out about various dwarven legends and tales and turned them into poetry, so that he finally became a local celebrity. Next is the artist Levis. Although she spent most of her time capturing views of the kingdom, if she was asked, the girl also painted portraits without any objections, so she quickly became friends with children full of curiosity. As soon as she closed the distance with the children, the adults followed them, more specifically, mothers and fathers as well as older generations. Do not forget that the life expectancy of gnomes is much longer than that of people, so it was quite normal for them to have not only grandchildren, but also great-grandchildren. Having received a portrait of the children, the family inserted it into a homemade frame and hung it in the most visible place, so Lewis's fame spread throughout the country. Elven adventurers who had no talent for art also communicated with the underground people, in their own way. They either did small jobs in the city or went hunting with the soldiers. I couldn't say with certainty that there weren't any gnomes who spoke ill of friendly visitors, 
but at least I didn't encounter any. I was very pleased to realize that here and now the stereotype of irreconcilable hostility between the two peoples was destroyed. As for the leader of the visiting group then, Mr. Ace, regarding trade with the gnomes, the head of the elf settlement of the Mai Forest proclaimed that if this is a request from you to whom they owe so much, then they will readily begin collecting the gifts of nature and producing all kinds of alcohol from them, Irina told me a very unexpected but very happy message. I could not even imagine that there would be elves who would be ready to immediately trade with the dwarves, even before our plan to deepen friendly relations between the races came into force. There was just one thing that bothered me a little. If we talk about Mai, then this is a relatively large forest located in the east of the kingdom of Ludoria, and many elves freed from slavery live in it. To be precise, this is the place where Vin was born. So why does the head there feel obligated to me? The captured tribesmen were freed mainly thanks to the efforts of Irina and the adventurers, and I only helped a little. I also took the wine to myself because I wanted it myself. If I am now asked to bring him back, I will refuse without hesitation, even though the guy will very soon become completely independent. But Irene seemed to have guessed my restless thoughts, because she immediately hastened to assure me, Mr. Ace, the head of the Mai Forest has absolutely no hidden intentions. If you had not been with us at that time, then a full-scale war would probably have broken out between humans and elves, and we would not have been able to avoid numerous casualties. And the tribesmen who feel for you, thank you for helping us avoid all this. They live far beyond this forest. Hearing this, I had no choice but to take it for granted. I have long realized that my actions are sometimes perceived by others with much greater exaggeration than I could have imagined. Well, then I must make every effort to ensure that the inhabitants of the forest of me are glad that they responded to my request, I said from the bottom of my heart to which Irina nodded in agreement. Elves living in the forest most want not metal products, but weapons and armor created from materials obtained from defeated monsters. Therefore, I was required to prepare specific examples of things that would become trade goods in the future and ask Irina's team to deliver them. However, if you think about long-term trade, then okay, just a small part, but I could not demand from Aswald to make everything personally. At the same time, there will be no point if I do the production myself. In this case, I needed to find blacksmiths who would agree to give their best in their work, despite the fact that their creations would be sent to the forest people. The problem is that dwarves take pride in their metalworking skills, and if you ask them to work only on the fangs and skin of monsters, they may begin to resent it. That is precisely why it will be much better if the creation of goods for export is not carried out by someone specific, but by a whole group of artisans in turn. Although approaching our goal takes small steps, it's really fun, Irina told me with a dazzling smile on her lips. I totally agree with her on this one. It really is a hell of a lot of fun. I thought that trade between elves and dwarves was something distant and difficult to achieve. But thanks to everyone's support, my dream began to take concrete shape. Find artisans, transfer materials to them, and entrust processing. During the process, take the elves to the hot spring. After spending some time there and letting everyone enjoy the hot bath, you can come back, at which point the first batch of goods should be ready. After this, the elves will deliver the samples to their fellow tribesmen and negotiate detailed terms of exchange. Perhaps at the moment, elves and gnomes are separated not only by physical distance, but also by mental distance. But as long as there are like-minded people walking together along this road, there will be hope that one day this distance will be overcome. Let's drink to our new friends who have overcome the mountains and come to us from afar. Oswald proclaimed, holding a cup in front of him, to which the other dwarves smiled and drained the contents of their cups. It was another welcome banquet in honor of the elves. As for me, once would have been enough, but something tells me that these guys just found a good reason to drink and make some noise. What was just a holiday for the gnome 
became a severe test for the elves. Come on, drink too, drink. One after another, smiling, bearded men came up to me and poured their drink into my glass. Of course, the same thing happened to the rest of the elves. For a dwarf, sharing his own alcohol is a sign of the highest respect. The only problem is that for the sake of these banquets, these guys did not skimp and got all the best, which means that we drank the strongest liquor. I've lived in this country for quite a long time, so I more or less know how to drink it and where my limit is. But here are the rest of my fellow tribesmen. The gnomes also treated girls more delicately and reservedly, but they did not spare the men. So the two elf adventurers were already completely drunk, but even despite this, the hype around them did not stop. Poor fellows, you will need to seize the moment and help them out. By the way, there was someone at this festival who managed to avoid the fate of a victim of dwarf hospitality. It was none other than the bard Huricio. Referring to the fact that he could sing only when sober and high-proof alcohol could generally damage his throat, he successfully dodged the mugs, cups, and goblets offered to him from all sides. As I thought, he's a pretty funny guy. I believe he has far more places visited and experienced than the two adventurers combined, and this applies not only to drinking. Casually surveying my surroundings, I popped a piece of thinly sliced meat into my mouth. As for me, it was slightly oversalted, but this did not affect the taste in any way. After chewing and swallowing the meat, I rinsed my mouth with liquor to get rid of the aftertaste. As soon as I did this, I wanted something salty again. However, if you rush too much, you can quickly get drunk and won't be able to enjoy the holiday for a long time, so I decided not to fuss and not to rush anywhere. Suddenly, an elf sat down in front of me. Mr. Ace, you are holding up well. Oh, some more for you, she said happily with a carefree smile on her face, but I just shook my head. Even though I'm an experienced drinker, that is, I'm used to drinking, I also have my limits, so it's enough for me that every second dwarf considers it his duty to pour me a drink. When drunk, gnomes can start a fistfight. If this happened, then I would need to pull my hapless fellow tribesmen out of the mala pile, so I needed to maintain some degree of sobriety. If you live in this country for some time, then anyone will get used to it, whether he wants it or not, how to drink properly, and how to skillfully refuse the offered drink, I said, to which the girl, the artist, Levis, uttered an enthusiastic, oh, oh. She was in quite a good mood and her face was as red as a tomato. Apparently, this girl also had a little too much. At the banquet, there was not only local liquor, but also alcohol brought from distant countries, which it seems she managed to drink. However, most likely her mood was high not only because of the drink. You look happy today. Have you finished painting? I asked, to which she nodded several times. Exactly. You know, Mr. Ace, I'm really so glad that I arrived in this country, she said, jumping up and almost falling, so I had to support her and sit her back down. Hmm, she really had too much today. So she was so pleased with the resulting picture. Tomorrow. She's unlikely to be able to move because of the hangover, so it's better to ask her the day after tomorrow to show me what she did. Glad I came to this country, right? She had a small, but no, a very big reason for saying that. If we compare her with the same Huresio, then her field of activity is not so wide. Although they say that artists roam the world in search of new species, in reality, they are not so free. This is because if there is no one who will appreciate the painted picture and will be willing to pay well for it, then the artist will not be able to continue working. Levis is famous enough in Ludoria and surrounding countries that she can sell her works to merchants and nobles. But if a girl goes to distant lands where no one knows her, it will be very difficult for her to make money as an artist, no matter how good she is at it. Again, aristocrats prefer portraits to landscapes, and they especially like to send their opponent embellished pictures of themselves during a marriage proposal. Lewis herself would like to circle the world and transfer what she saw to canvas, 
but those around her expected something completely different from her, so her dreams were very different from reality. If she became an adventurer, she could go to more distant lands and paint pictures there. Being an elf who can turn to spirits for help, she cannot be called defenseless at all, but the girl is not particularly strong in battle and does not like to get involved in battles, except in cases of self-defense. Well, I can completely understand her. Even if you consider that I have no problem with battles, I still do not intend to earn my living from them, but prefer to spend more time on what I really like. That's why she was very glad that she was able to come to the unknown country of gnomes and freely draw what she wanted. Listening carefully to the girl, I did not forget to put meat in my mouth from time to time and wash it down with liquor. And I also talked with Huricio and suggested that, in the near future, we should gather more of our fellow tribesmen and create a caravan. So we can go to different distant countries, helping and protecting each other. Surely it will be a lot of fun. However, this proposal of hers is still at the concept stage, and to be honest, it is simply at the level of her dreams. But this is one of those dreams that can be realized. Well, before, anyone would have dismissed it with ridicule if I had mentioned trade between gnomes and elves. But here we are, actually sitting together and celebrating the first successes along this path. So if a girl really wants it, then her dream can come true. What about Mr. Ace? I can teach you how to draw, and Horatio has stuttered more than once that he would like to sing with you. Travel wherever your eyes look, see many new things, meet unexpected people, and conduct trade. To be honest, her invitation was very tempting. If it were my past self who had just left the deep forest, I would have agreed before she could finish. But the current me just shook his head. I can't yet. I still have things that need... No that I want to do. I have already decided for myself how to use the time for the near future and what will happen next. Who knows? I know myself much better than anyone. I am a very selfish person and do not know how to adapt to others. It's okay when it comes to people, but if my opponents are elves who have a long life, then I obviously won't be able to be with them for too long. Moreover, because of my status as a higher, the rest of the elves, somewhere on a subconscious level, begin to try to adapt to me, so my presence can become like poison for them. If one day they can actually form a caravan, then it will be possible to travel with them from time to time, but no more than that. Lost in thought, I didn't even notice when Levis had fallen asleep, sprawled out right on the table, and a commotion began to arise not far from us. Apparently the time has come to rescue drunken fellow tribesmen and evacuate them to a safe place. As I looked around, I met the gaze of Irina, who was also studying the situation. She probably also realized that it was time to save her companions, so I decided to entrust Levis to her, and I myself began to make my way through the crowd to the rescue of the unlucky adventurers. About three years have passed since the elves left the kingdom of the gnomes, five since the events in the Fodor Empire, and if you count from my arrival in this country, then almost eleven. Trade between the two peoples, although on a small scale, took a concrete form. Grave took on the processing of monster materials and the production of armor and weapons, a famous master who used to live in Ludoria. I had already heard this name in the past, and as it turned out, he knew about me too. It was none other than the dwarf who had beaten me in blacksmith competitions for several years. He not only volunteered to become responsible for production, but also actively invited others, eventually gathering a decent group. In addition to him, to my great surprise, La Judor, the mentor of my worst friend Fidel, showed great interest in this matter. He stated that among the elves there may be many more who have the gift of magic than among the dwarves, so he wants to present them with his magical tools. However, I'm not sure whether my fellow tribesmen need magic things at all, but I was pleased with the unexpected turn of events. Who would have thought that, having lost the fight for the throne, Lajudor would not harbor a grudge against me, but, on the contrary, would decide to invest his contribution in the development of relations between the dwarves and elves? Well, 
If the seeds of common efforts have sprouted, then all that remains is to nurture them, but this will take a lot of time. By the way, the trade connection with the Forest of Mai is carried out by the caravan with which I traveled to Fodre. According to them, after the uproar in the empire, no one wants to do business there anymore, so they have a lot of free time. Although, I don't think that the guys, who are the only thread connecting the kingdom with the outside world, who have to constantly cross steep mountains, can be so free. But as soon as they heard that I was trying to establish trade with the elves, they began delivering the cargo as if it was something for granted. As for the alcohol supplied from the M.E. forest, it consisted not only of wine, but even of mead, which is an extreme rarity in all nearby countries. I, too, did not miss the chance to try something new and was very pleased not to mention the gnomes who drink alcohol even more often than regular water. Aswald won the fight for the throne, trade with the elves was established, and I already enjoyed the hot spring to my heart's content. In other words, I finished all my business in the kingdom of the gnomes. Vin has also achieved a certain skill in blacksmithing, and then he just needs to practice a lot and start accepting orders from real clients. Therefore, he also agreed. For us to leave this place, I didn't have the slightest complaint about my time in this country. I, and I think Vin too, had a lot of fun here, but I didn't forget about my promise to Kaiha. Of course, I still had a little time left because this does not mean that she only had a couple of years left, but we were talking about a decade or more. But if you look at it from the other side, it can last another 10 or 20 years, but obviously not longer. Therefore, I decided to go to her and spend these years next to her, which for the high elf will seem only a short moment. I thought Vin would want to stay, but it seems the guy had his own thoughts on the matter. He will soon become completely independent, so I no longer have to control his every move. Eh, both for him and for Keha, time flies too quickly. And this despite the fact that before leaving the deep forest, I also thought about myself. In the morning, when we left the underground city, Aswald gave Vin and I each a bracelet. At first glance, they looked silver, but if you took a closer look at their shine and structure, you could understand that it was mithril, without a doubt. I didn't remember helping in the forging of something like that, and more importantly, mithril is the main secret of the dwarves, so it was strictly forbidden to take it outside the country so I could not hide my surprise. Don't worry so much. I went through all the official procedures and received permission to use the royal forge, so there is no crime behind them. Once these bracelets are seen by a dwarf, even one living at the end of the world, he will immediately understand that you are our friends, our brothers, Oswald said with a snort with an important look. Ah, I didn't even have anything to say to that. But Aswald, that stinking dwarf, just snorted again and hit the guy in the chest with his fist. Idiot, you are also my full-fledged student, a full-fledged resident of this country, and our brother. Therefore, there is no point in comparing yourself with this stinking elf, he said to the guy, whose face was twisted from the fact that he was trying to endure either pain or something completely different. And anyway, why on earth did I become a stinking elf again? However, when this is your adoptive father, then I can understand that you constantly compare yourself with him. Well, I won't say too much in his presence, but believe me, I understand you perfectly. But the fact that I recognized you as my outstanding student has nothing to do with the stinking elf. So, consider this bracelet proof of that. To be honest, I absolutely don't understand what this stinking gnome is talking about, but I'm sure of one thing. I'd better stand with my mouth closed and not interfere, because he's now trying to convey something to Vin that I can't, something that even I don't understand, even though this gave me rather complicated feelings. Do you understand me, Vin? You are not an appendage to your father, so you can come to us at any time to have fun, but don't even think about being lazy and forgetting about forging. I won't forgive you for that. After listening to Aswald's words containing deep meaning, Vin nodded silently. Seeing this, the stinking gnome laughed a little strangely. Hmm. Well, if they both understood each other, then okay? Although my mentor's words were directed at Vin, 
they also contained a hint of what I was missing as a parent. Yeah, I'll have to think about that a lot. Fortunately, I realized that I don't fully understand the boy's feelings. Of course, I never considered Vin a make-weight, but what's more important is how he perceives it. Ace, you helped me a lot this time. When we meet again, perhaps I will already be polishing the throne with my ass. I myself know that this will not suit me, so you can laugh without being embarrassed. Well, see you later. With these words, we left the kingdom of the gnomes. When we first walked this road, Vin was dangling on a chair behind me, but now he confidently walked on his own two feet. The only thing that has not changed is the grandeur of the views from the tops of the endless mountains. Having overcome the last mountains in the south, we entered the territory of the kingdom of Ludoria, after which we continued to move all the way to Wolfiel. The capital was still crowded and noisy, but this does not mean that nothing has changed at all. However, this was quite normal. The butcher shop, where I used to shop frequently, has changed hands. His face was similar to the previous butcher, but since he was very young, it was most likely his grandson. Vin seemed to notice this too, as he looked a little sad. Well, as far as I remember, he often came here to visit, and the local uncle treated him well. While we were in the country of gnomes, the guy did not feel much difference in the passage of time with those around him, but in the human world, unfortunately, it was completely different. The only way to forget about this is to continue wandering around the world. Having reached the dojo, we began to climb the stairs, and when we had climbed half the steps, I suddenly noticed that two, no, four people were waiting for us from above. Wow, really Vin and Ace? Mom's instincts are simply amazing, said a man who looked about 30 years old. He had a startling aura about him, showing that there was no gap in his defenses, but the smile on his face showed his friendly attitude. It was Shizuki, no doubt about it. Two children stood next to him, holding both his hands. A girl of about five years old and a boy who was at most two or three years old. Shizuka's children, in other words, Kaiha's grandchildren. Looking at us with blank eyes, the kids looked really cute. And finally, a couple of steps away from them stood she, my master, Kaiha. As soon as we reached the very top, she smiled tenderly and came out to meet us. Welcome back, Ace Vin. I just had a feeling you should show up today. Look how much you've grown, Vin. I involuntarily smiled, but the guy she was addressing blushed a little with embarrassment. We're home. By the way, I'm amazed that you guessed our arrival so accurately, I greeted her. Although I was very glad that we were greeted right on the doorstep, I also found it a little strange. I certainly sent them letters quite regularly, but I did not indicate in them the exact date of return. You know, Mom suddenly unexpectedly announced that you both would come today, so I went out to the gate, half not believing it, Shizuki explained to me, who himself was clearly surprised. That's it. It means it was Kaiha who sensed our approach. When I shifted my gaze to her, she just smiled mysteriously and said, That's right. The wind this morning was not blowing like usual. He probably wanted to tell me something. Of course, I know that she is not able to hear the voices of spirits, but for some reason these words did not seem far-fetched to me. Walking inside, I saw students training, and there were noticeably more of them compared to the past. If we talk simply about the number, then there were now no less than what I saw during my visit to the Rodland School of the Two-Handed Sword. This means that Yosogi's style has regained its position as one of the four great schools of the kingdom. I don't think all the students are here right now, so the total number should easily be over a hundred by now, but at the same time all these people called Shizuka, not Kaiha, the master. Apparently she has already retired and ceded the role of head of the school to her son, and judging by how naturally everyone perceives the guy's dominance, then this should have happened at least several years ago. It turns out that the sharp increase in students is the result of Shizuka's hard work and obvious success. On the training ground, there were people I knew who had been my fellow students during my training at the dojo. Only now they had all become instructors themselves. Brother Shizuka, let's cross blades for once. 
Besides, introduce me to your children already, Vin said, pointing to the dojo. Isn't he in such high spirits because of his long-awaited return? We haven't even given souvenirs yet. Wait, that's not true at all. It seems the guy is doing this for me. So Shizuki smiled knowingly, raised the children in both hands and headed inside the building while calling all the students along with him. Vin has really become such an adult, but the last time I saw him, he was still a little child. Well, Ace, I'll make some tea, and you tell me about your life in the land of gnomes, okay? Keha said when we were alone, to which I automatically nodded. Vin has really matured. It may not be very polite to think this way towards him, but these are still my true feelings. Besides, somewhere deep in my soul, I felt proud of him. I don't know what Vin himself thinks about this, but if he so desires, he can start an independent life at any moment. I understood this especially clearly when we crossed the mountain range. Not only is he skilled with a sword, but his skills as a blacksmith have been recognized by the stinking dwarf himself. Unfortunately, he has no predisposition to magic, but he has spirits and their limitless power as his allies. Of course, I started studying all this much earlier than him, so I have not yet been inferior to him in anything. But there are no guarantees that this will always be the case. This is especially true for fencing. During sparring, he already manages to gain the upper hand three or four times out of ten. Of course, I'm a mile ahead of him when it comes to dealing with spirits, but the reason for that lies in the difference between our races, so I'm not going to be too proud of it. It's much more important that the guy has his own thoughts, his own experiences, and is gradually growing, unnoticed by me. So the care he just showed for Kaiha and me was a big surprise for me. I wonder where he learned this. And most importantly, from whom? From all this, I was both happy and sad at the same time, and I didn't even know what to correctly call this strange feeling. Probably, at that moment, my expression on my face was quite pitiful because Keha, walking in front, suddenly stopped, grabbed me by the sleeve, and pulled me along. Although she was strong-willed, the fact that she pulled my clothes and not my hand did not change a bit as if in front of me was still the same young girl she was when we first met. Keha listened to my story to the end, only occasionally asking for details. I left the dojo over ten years ago, so it's a long story. During this time, I managed to help my blacksmith master process the mithril, placing him on the throne, and also go to the Empire, where I defeated the bloodsucker and stopped the impending war. Along the way, I also finished off the emperor who had turned into a monster, and upon returning to the kingdom of the gnomes, I established trade between them and the elves. In addition, I talked about how I overcame a gnome with my bare hands, found an onsen, fought a huge toad at the foot of a volcano, and much more. Yes, if there was someone else in front of me, he absolutely would not have believed even half of my words, but Kaiha was the one who would not doubt for a second that I was telling the absolute truth, laughing at times, rolling her eyes at times, and even getting angry a couple of times, she continued to listen with interest. Even when the tea had already cooled down, my story still did not end, and when my throat was completely dry, I asked for more several times. I wonder how long I've been talking. If I went into every detail, there would be no end to it, so I had to boil it down to generalized facts. Ace, as soon as I take my eyes off you for a little bit, you do amazing things, like heroes from children's fairy tales. Although, even when you were in my sight, you were the same, Keha said, narrowed her eyes, and then laughed quietly. Just a little, right? Well, for me, a little over ten years really isn't that significant of a time, but for Keha, it must have been a long wait. I was interested in several points. For example, the hot lake that exists in the east, where the ancestors of the Yosogi school came from in the distant past, as well as your fencing skills and desire to study again. Oh, as I thought, there are hot springs in the east too, just like in my previous world. As for fencing... I really want to learn from Kaiha again, but this time as a real swordsman and not just for fun. Let the head school and Shizuki became, 
but only she, Kaiha, can be my master. However, what's bothering you the most right now is Vin, isn't it? So I'll ask you directly, do you want your child to surpass you now? She said, looking straight at me. In fact, this was a very difficult question. There were so many answers inside me, and I couldn't choose the right one. I'm happy for the guy's growth, and I'm proud of him. There's no doubt about it. In other words, my heart was a complete mess. So much so that Keha even called me a hero from fairy tales. That's right, a hero from fairy tales. But they are always somewhere far away, out of reach. So for Vin, my back flashed too far. However, I could be called lucky since I could rack my brains over all this. After all, most of the inhabitants of this world can only think about how to survive and gain the power necessary for this, and think about how to find the right approach and establish relationships with their own children. They simply do not have time. Despite this, in order to solve our problem, well, I'm probably too late for this, but in order for us to at least find a common language, Keha and Shizuki decided to lend us a helping hand. Indeed, I am lucky dot 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 in many ways. Vin, I plan to continue making training swords or something else for the guild as before. What about you? I asked, watching the dancing flames. If the guy wants to take on the job, then I will accept orders for him too. If he is just given a chance to show his skills, he will soon be able to get his own license, but for this, I need to help him a little. But if he decides to completely focus on fencing training, then I won't even say a word because he is free to choose how to spend his own time. I want to use the forge. But as for orders, I want to become someone who can find a job for himself, the guy said, after thinking a little. Clearly. Indeed, if he does not know how to find work for himself in human countries, then it will be difficult for him to prove himself as a blacksmith. In this case, he definitely needs to get a guild license. It's okay if he stays in one place, but if the guy decides to go on a trip, then he'll definitely need it. I know from myself. Well, then next time we go to the guild together, I'll tell you how to choose orders. If you don't open your own shop, as the stinking gnome did in the past, then the fastest way to find clients is to contact the guild. Of course, the organization takes a share of the reward, but at the same time, it helps solve the issue of the forge, materials, and fuel for the forge, so this can be considered a necessary expense. If you want to support yourself by working as a free blacksmith, then it would be better to get a license of the highest category. Naturally, in order to obtain it, you need to have sufficient skills and merit, but if you take into account who you studied with, then I believe that in three years, we'll figure something out. Well, this of course does not mean that all of Aswald's students become top-class blacksmiths like me, but I suppose everything will be fine. Not only did the stinking gnome recognize Vin's talent and diligence, but the guy also began his training already. Well, ten years have not passed yet, but in three years this period will be even a little longer. Even I was able to get my license within ten years, so I don't see any reason why my son can't do the same. Uh-huh, got it. That's... Thanks, Ace. Vin thanked me a little shyly. As for me, he has no need to worry about this at all because helping him gain the strength to survive in this world is my direct responsibility. Even now I remain his guardian, not his opponent, and in three years we will have a match, not a duel to the death. We can compete with him, but not be at odds with him. So, shall I start with the repairs? All this can still be used. Vin. Can you help me out? After I left the dojo, the students had no choice but to turn to the capital's blacksmiths for help in maintaining weapons. But since they were located in another part of the city, it was inconvenient to visit the masters too often. Maybe I should teach some of the students or Shizuka himself blacksmithing. Such a luxurious forge has been sitting idle for years. What a waste. Even so, it will be three years before I can seriously think about it, but now I have something that I have to do. Having received an affirmative nod from Vin, we stood next to each other and began the repairs. While we were working, neither of us talked too much and we were both focused on completing the tasks required of us. But for me, 
it was still a very peaceful and calming family time. In the past, when I trained with Kaiha, we always stood next to each other and I simply repeated the movements after her. Only now she was right in front of me and without a sword in her hands. This gave me a feeling that what was happening was wrong, because of which I could not calm down. Don't make such a face. As much as you waved your sword trying to imitate me, I thought about how best to train you, if not longer, she said with a smile on her lips. She said this as if as a joke, but I understood that her words must be the absolute truth. Honestly, it was a great honor for me, but at the same time hearing this, I even felt ashamed that I had only now decided to take her training seriously. However, her whole appearance said that she did not hold a grudge against me at all for wasting my time. For any person, there is a moment when it is easiest for him to demonstrate his strength. Of course, the opposite is also true. For example, if you inadvertently exhale while trying to break a thick thread, then all your strength will concentrate for one moment, after which it will leave you body. She continued her explanation as if nothing had happened. It feels like I've heard something like this before somewhere. Maybe my subconscious inadvertently retained memories of some TV program from a past life. Who knows? Breathing dot 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 IT would seem that it could be simpler, but in fact it is a rather complicated process. Even when I hunt with a bow, I shoot only after predicting the movement of the prey by its gaze, aura, and dot 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 breath dot. When swinging a sword, the spirit and body must be in harmony, and the environment must be suitable. Again, it is extremely important to provide yourself with a suitable environment while fighting, Keha said, making a gesture as if she was swinging a sword. Although she had nothing in her hands, this movement gave me the illusion that the air between her palms had compressed and torn apart the space itself. As I thought, her technique is the most beautiful, Correctly calculate the best time based on the enemy's gaze, breathing, and aura, and defeat the enemy with just one blow. This is a very beautiful, almost ideal version of events. True, this is only if you can do it at any time. Perhaps because you have mastered the bow perfectly, it seems to me that you are very good at it. But with you, everything is the opposite until your body and spirit reach harmony and you provide yourself with a suitable environment, your sword doesn't move, she added, as if reading my thoughts. Ah, well, yeah, she's right. Probably. So, swinging a sword with an imbalance, or even worse, without the necessary preparation, is no longer the art of Kayahi that I admire so much. Therefore, I am not willing to use such poor attacks. This is why my style of sword fighting is to first stop the enemy's attack and only then execute the swing. But if the opponent guesses about my weakness, then my sword will never reach him. This is your main flaw. Even if the balance is broken, even if your heart is not yet ready, you must be ready at any moment to strike a blow that will destroy the enemy's stance, create a gap in his defense, and ultimately end his life can be considered strong only the swordsman who can swing his weapon at the right moment, even if it is done poorly and through force. I didn't even have anything to answer to these words of hers. She's probably right. Although, no, not probably. But since Kaiha says so, then this is the absolute truth. But I was wondering whether I should really take and use this beautiful Kaihi sword in an inferior form, learned through long imitation. While we stood opposite each other, an awkward silence hung between us. I needed to say only one word. Understood. But I could not bring myself to say it, although I am aware that she, my master, is absolutely right. However, I know that you are stubborn and selfish and will not listen to me. Keha was the first to break the silence. She said this with a sigh, but for some reason a little joyfully. That's why the idea came to me. If you don't want to use my sword in an imperfect form, then all I need is, in any situation, even when I've practically fallen to the ground, I'm lying, or have been subjected to a surprise attack. Use my sword like this so that you want to imitate him. 
she suddenly gave a slightly strange solution. No, no, no. The conversation was about the fact that I cannot use an imperfect sword. So how did it all come down to the fact that it was Keha who had to use the perfect sword in the wrong situation? Is it even possible? I already told you that I swung my sword many times thinking about the best way to train you. Therefore, I am more or less capable of it. True, the part with a prone strike is still in the process of training, but in a fall and in a surprise attack, show your I can already do my favorite beautiful sword, she stated in such a tone as if it was something taken for granted. So I realized that there was not a drop of fiction or boasting in this, but only the simple truth. In order to confirm her words, she still grabbed the air with her bare hands and made a smooth series of attacks with an invisible sword in all directions, even behind her back. It looked so simple, as if she was just running her palms through the air. But at the same time, as during her first demonstration, I felt the sharpness of the movements, capable of cutting anything in her path. Surely, even with a sword in her hands, she will be able to repeat the same thing, easily and without any preparation. Next, all you have to do is imitate me and learn to do it yourself. Ace, it won't be that easy, but you can do it, right? She asked, not stopping her attacks for a second, while each swing was still as sharp, and a smile did not leave her lips. In other words, in order to allow me to copy her movements, she herself continued to improve her techniques day after day without even thinking about giving up. Having realized this, how could I answer her with anything other than yes? Stopping after a while, Kaiha cheerfully stared at me, who had not yet recovered from the shock. Only I can teach you this, right? Actually, I tried a lot for this, so I'm very glad that I was able to surprise you, she laughed loudly. Indeed, I honed my swordsmanship just to be able to implement Kaiha's beautiful techniques. That's why now, having seen all this, I could barely restrain my wildly beating heart and was shaking a little with an irresistible desire to repeat her every movement. Um, did Shizuki learn this too? I couldn't help but ask, because I was worried whether I could really learn all this. Well, this technique belongs to the current Yosogi school, and it is clearly the pinnacle of their skill. But in response to my question, Keha just shook her head negatively. No, although that child cares about Yosogi's style, he trains first and foremost to become stronger himself. He has no need for such a fancy sword. Besides, he is already able to come up with techniques suitable for him himself and no longer needs in my care, she stated proudly. At the same time, it seemed to be written on her face that her son is not such a problematic swordsman as some, and he has the body, spirit, and skills of a true warrior, so I should not underestimate him. Among all my students, there is only one abnormal person who has set himself the goal of completely copying my technique, and that is you, Ace. It didn't take me that much time to train the others. That's why only I can teach you this. After listening to her words, I bowed my head, put my sword aside, and then grabbed the air with empty hands. She deliberately did not use a weapon, but showed me everything with her bare hands. Right now, I couldn't understand why she did it. That's why I needed to imitate her while thinking about the reason. Imitate and think, imitate and think, and one day I will be able to understand her intentions. This was my usual workout, no different from the previous one, only now I was faced with a completely new goal. Roar, now I'm going to eat someone! Opening and closing my hands like crab claws, I moved my ears and walked forward majestically. As soon as I did this, two children, four-year-old Soka and two-year-old Toki, pretended to scream and began to run away from me. Of course, no matter how fast they moved their tiny legs, they would never be able to hide from me, but still I deliberately pretended that I could not catch them. It was only when the boy got tangled in the grass and almost fell that I deftly caught him. Seeing his brother, who was thoroughly enjoying the flight under my armpit, Soha apparently became jealous, so she deliberately ran past me to make it easier for me to catch her. Without hesitation, I extended my free hand and also raised it into the air, 
which made the girl laugh joyfully. I'm sorry, Ace, that you had to play with the kids, a girl standing nearby said, bowing her head. Karone, Shizuka's wife. That's right, Soha and Toki were her children, and therefore Kaiha's grandchildren. Shaking my head, I twirled the babies in the air for a while and then carefully set them down on the ground. I like children and I like to play with them, so it was not a burden to me at all. Besides, even if their father is the head of the school, I don't intend to treat them any differently or hold back in front of them. However, the children who found themselves on the ground grabbed me by the legs and began to shake me, as if they didn't have enough and wanted to fly some more. Yep, everything is clear. It's not for nothing that they are my master's grandchildren. Despite their young age, they were already full of energy. Having raised them again in my arms, I lightly tapped my foot on the ground, making a request to the spirits living in it, and they willingly raised the soil under me, creating something like a slide. From such an unexpected turn, Soha and Toki, however, like their mother, opened their mouths in surprise and fell into a stupor for a moment. So, holding the children in my arms, I climbed to the very top of the slide and rolled down it. Hmm, it's probably better to prepare a soft sandbox downstairs, just for safety's sake. After the children experienced the slide for themselves, as soon as I let them go, they immediately rushed up and rolled down themselves with joyful squeals. I couldn't help but smile as I watched my big sister help her little brother climb the steps. As a result, I softened the ground under the slide so that the children would not get hurt and they would fully concentrate on the new fun. Sorry, I heard about you from my husband, but I didn't even think that you were so amazing. Corone hesitantly turned to me, only now recovering from shock. Well, this is probably exactly what it looks like from the outside, but it's not me who is amazing, but the perfume. In addition, although my position is a little specific, I remain one of the students of this dojo. There is nothing special about this. On the contrary, I think that it is Shizuki who is incredible, because he is able to teach fencing to several dozen people at once, I answered, carefully making sure that the kids did not inadvertently get hurt. If I'm not mistaken, Caron's maiden name was Espera, exactly the same as that of the head of the knights, who long ago bought the sword I forged for the qualifying competition. Not that I checked, but most likely the girl in front of me is his granddaughter. In other words, she is the granddaughter of a big shot from the Ludorian Swordsmanship School. In fact, I don't even know if Shizuki married her for love or if it was a political marriage. It was too impolite to ask such a thing, even for the sake of my curiosity. One way or another, it is an obvious fact that the Yosogi and Ludorian fencing schools are now in close relations, as well as the fact that this had a great influence on the Yosogi school itself. However, I didn't care about all this, because the main thing is that Shizuki clearly shows warm feelings towards his wife, and she reciprocates this. Again, their children are also not deprived of parental love, so everything is okay. Shizuka's children, Kaiha's grandchildren. Although I couldn't say that I treated them like my own grandchildren, I considered them part of my family. In addition, Mizuha, who lives in Wiscott, also got married and gave birth to a child, so I wanted to visit her once to check how she was doing. I wonder if the girl is happy now. I know that she is very strong and determined, but this is precisely why I was worried that she would overdo it, like when I was a child. Well, Wiscott is located in the kingdom, so getting to it is not so difficult, so you will definitely need to visit her in the near future. Shizuki was currently teaching fencing to Vin, just like Keha trains me. It's just that the time when they are free is completely different. Since he is the head of the school, Shizuka needed to work not only with Vin, but also pay attention to the entire dojo as a whole. Thus, the time he can personally instruct Vin is quite limited. But this was compensated by the fact that other students helped the guy with his training. The duel in three years will not just be between me and Vin, but also between Keiha and the entire Yosogi school. To be honest, I was looking forward to it in anticipation, 
while all the students had high hopes for Vin. Now, this is not yet so noticeable, but the closer the decisive day approaches, the more they will increase. And as they say, great hope can turn into heavy pressure. That's why I wanted to find out how Vin would grow over these three years, under the influence of expectations and a sense of responsibility, not only physically, but also mentally. Moreover, I was eager to meet my mature son in three years, both as his guardian and as a swordsman. This is probably the first manifestation of that same thirst for battle that I so lacked in the past. It all started with bare hands, but gradually I was allowed to use a wooden sword, so now I was swinging with it. Only when I started practicing with weapons did I understand why, in the beginning, I was required to learn the correct movements. Because if I had a real sword in my hands from the very beginning, I would most likely have injured myself due to its weight and centrifugal force. Having deepened my understanding, I continued to swing the sword, and only after several seasons had replaced each other did I begin training battles with Keha. I'm afraid that in just three short years my skills will not reach the level that the master expects from me and which would satisfy me. No matter how you look at it, this skill requires several decades of training, no less. But even so, everything suits me. When the time comes, even with unfinished techniques, I will give it my all in the fight with Vin. So, this is not the end of our life with him, and I will still have plenty of time to continue my studies. But over time, losses will definitely come. Two years after returning to the dojo, I received a letter, so I went to Wiscott to visit Cliff and Martin, who were once members of the White Lake team, or, more precisely, their grave. High elves, whose souls become spirits after death, have no way of mourning the dead. When one of my tribesmen's time comes to an end and he falls into eternal sleep, his body is buried under one of the trees, and his family communes with that tree as they say goodbye. In this world, mana can hit the body of the deceased and turn him into a monster, so trees protect our people from such a fate. As for people, it is customary among them at funerals to pray to the god of fertility, so that the person who left us will return to the earth, and like a young sprout, someday in the future, his soul will return to this world again. This is especially true for Martin, who served the god of fertility. Although it is believed that in this world there is a god who protects the dead, they usually still pray to the one in whom the person believed during his lifetime. But I still preferred to bring my palms together and conduct them in my own way. Of course, in this world, or at least in nearby countries, there was no such tradition, but still such a gesture best allowed me to convey my feelings. Naturally, there was no photograph of Cliff and Martin on the stone stele, but standing in front of their grave, I could easily imagine their young faces from the time when we had just met. Mr. Ace, thank you very much, said Irene, who sent the letter to me as I raised my head. She wrote in a letter that about two months ago, Cliff was the first to leave this world, and less than a week later, his wife followed him. I really couldn't help but think that human life is so ephemeral. Even these two, who were seven-star adventurers, passed away so quickly. Although everyone in Viscott loved and respected them, and a large crowd came to say goodbye to them, I am sure that after a hundred or two years, no one will even remember them. Except for Irina. I didn't do anything worthy of gratitude. I wanted to answer her, but swallowed my words, because the elf's smile at that moment was so fragile and lifeless. In the last hour, Marthena told me, sorry, and also, thank you. I just remained silent and continued to listen to the girl. Of course, I could not know the full depth of the relationship between Irina, Cliff, and Martin, but I understood one thing for sure. Just as the two felt indebted to Irene, she felt regrets and unspoken sadness for the two of them. Perhaps the fact that Cliff and Martin responded to Keha's ridiculous request also has something to do with all this. That day, Kuroha told me that they were under a curse placed by someone other than me, and maybe she was right. But what does it matter now? All thoughts and feelings turned to ashes along with their bodies. Kaiha also arrived in Wiscott, but now she was at her daughter's house. 
She probably plans to come to the grave alone. Mr. Ace, if you weren't here, if you hadn't entrusted me with such an important role, I'm afraid I would have fled this country before I said goodbye to them. I couldn't understand Irina's feelings unless I was in her place, and that's why I decided not to say anything but just let her speak. If I had not returned to this city for a long, long time, and they had died during that time, then I would not have found the courage to confirm their death even for a hundred years. And even if I had been able to one day, there would not have been there is no one who has even pointed out to me the place of their grave. There is clearly no such if. It was so easy to object to her words because I know that she is not so weak. Among all the elves I know, she is the strongest and most amazing. Even if she ran away for a while, she would definitely return to say goodbye to her friends. Even if she had arrived after their death, finding a grave for her would have been as easy as shelling pears. But there was no point in saying all this. After all, by and large, Arena now does not expect consolation from me. She only says goodbye, is sad, and collects her broken heart. If I ran away, I wouldn't be so sad, but then I wouldn't even be able to say goodbye to them. Of course, it will take her some time to come to her senses. Maybe it will take a dozen or two years, or maybe a hundred. But even so, in the end, she will one day be able to look back and cherish the memories of her friends in her heart. That's why, thank you, Mr. Ace, she said, to which I silently nodded. I know that she has been preparing for some time to hand over her duties to her successor and leave the kingdom. But I'm not going to ask her what she's going to do after that, because it'll probably depend on how she feels when that time actually comes. I think she can be sad as much as she needs to in order to ease the burden of saying goodbye. Whatever you say, we have plenty of time. If she suddenly wants to talk about the past, I will gladly support her, because the pain she is experiencing now is not at all something alien to me, because very soon I myself will have to experience the same thing. After this, I visited Kaiha's daughter Mizuha, who, to my surprise, also gave birth to two children. I wonder if it's Yosogi School's main house tradition to have two children. But it seems that Kaiha was an only child, or is this due to her mother's poor health? After giving birth, Mizuha stopped being an adventurer and is now raising her children while working part-time as a fencing instructor in the guild. There was also a sense of some strange family continuity in this. By the way, I once heard that the son of Cliff and Martin became a knight in the neighboring country, Zaire, and, as a result, I had never seen him before. So this time we missed each other. Probably our destinies were simply not connected. After visiting the grave of Rodner, who would never again come to the gate to greet me with a warm smile, I returned to the capital with Kaiha. I won't deny that I had warm, nostalgic feelings for Wisket, but I had already given up my house, and the stinking gnome shop was inherited by the son of one of his students, so there was no place for me here anymore. Although my heart was filled with sadness, I could accept the harsh truth because one day I would lose not only my place in this country, but also everyone I knew, and I could not avoid this. Such was the inevitable fate of a high elf living in his own stream of time. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. So, upon returning from our unhappy journey, we were awaited by the news that relations between Yosogi and another of the four great schools the Rodland School of the Two-Handed Sword, began to noticeably deteriorate. To be more precise, as if in protest of the strengthening of the Yosogi School and the deepening of its connection with the official style of the kingdom, the School of Ludorian Fencing, the Rodland School entered into an alliance with the Glenda School. Both in the present and in the past, the dominant style of the kingdom is Ludorian Fencing, and even if the other two schools join forces, they will not be able to oppose anything to it. Therefore, one could easily imagine that their target was Yosogi's school. Whatever one may say, even though it was quite a long time ago, there was irreconcilable enmity between the schools of Yosogi and Rodlin. Until now, 
Cliff somehow coped with the role of an intermediary between the two schools, but he is no longer in this world. Cliff held the title of Sword Saint and was highly respected among all swordsmen, so even when he grew old, the Rodland School did nothing out of respect for him, but apparently they thought that now they had no reason to hold back. I must say that all this really got on my nerves. There are times when I'm not in the best mood. If at least a couple of years had passed since Cliff's death, I would not have taken it so seriously, but everything happened so quickly, as if they were just waiting for this. It was as if they specially appeared in front of me so that I would release all the negativity accumulated in Visca on them. In that case, there is no need for me to hold back at all. I'm not going to kill anyone, but as Cliff was afraid in the past, I will definitely raise the dojo of the Rodland School to the ground, and Glenda's school too. However, just as I had already made this decision, Keha grabbed me by the clothes from behind. This is the problem of the current head of the Yosogi school, and he has not yet asked for help from either me or you. So we just need to watch for now, she said in a confident voice, and even her hand did not shake at all. In fact, this choice must have been very difficult for her. While still a child, she lost everything, both her father and her dojo, without being able to do anything. But despite the fact that she experienced all this herself, now she decided not to do anything, but only rely on her son. In this case, I also do not have the right to act willfully. Although I also belong to the Yosogi school, if we talk about my position, I am a direct student of Kaiha. At least until Shizuki turns to his mother for help, I should silently keep an eye on him. Even if I thought that it would be much easier to deal with everything myself, I still suppressed my zeal and decided to wait patiently. In addition, Shizuki is not alone at all. Not only Vin, but also all the other students are on his side. However, no matter how much the relations between the schools deteriorated, this did not mean that one of the parties would immediately rush to the opponent's dojo with weapons in their hands and begin to destroy everything. This is quite an obvious fact, but if one of the parties does this, it will be perceived as a crime, and the offender will be severely punished according to the law of the kingdom. Last time, the students of the Yosogi school chose this method, firstly because of the death of their leader, and secondly because of a blind struggle for the right of inheritance. Probably until something unexpected happens, no one will usually even think about something so dangerous. Well, if I took over the matter, then there would be no evidence left, but at the moment the four great schools have split into two alliances and they are all trying to create favorable conditions for themselves. It's not that I understood all the details well, and I didn't particularly want to delve into it, but if I were asked to describe everything in one word, I would answer politics. But the tension between the schools was transferred to her students, and every time they met in the city, Representatives of the styles of Yosogi and Rodlin constantly threatened each other, but so far, everything was limited to that. Whether we should say, unfortunately or naturally, the people who gather in the dojo are not particularly peaceful. Perhaps this is to be expected from those who study the craft of war, because from the very moment they took up arms and decided to live off them, they can no longer be called pacifists, right? Moreover, after such long training, they, of course, are eager to test their own strength, and now the enemy has conveniently appeared in front of their noses. Of course, this does not mean that the students of all dojos are bloodthirsty barbarians who only think about battle. This especially applies to the Yosogi school, where, according to the rules established by the previous chapter, decent behavior is required from everyone, and if someone is guilty, he will be harshly educated. If a person could not accept even such a basic principle, then he did not stay long in the dojo. So as for me, all the students of Kaiha and Shizuka were quite pleasant people. But you shouldn't expect the same good behavior from members of the Rodlin school. And if someone starts to defame Yosogi's school, then its students might lose their temper. To prevent this from happening, the heads of the schools are trying to restrain their people, but still, 
The critical situation, of course, was still far away, but tension was really in the air, and so they passed day after day. The decisive day has come. Three years have passed since our return, and the fight between me and Vin will begin in a matter of minutes. With wooden swords in our hands, we stood opposite each other in the very center of the dojo. Keiha behind me and Shizuki behind Vin watched us from a short distance. As for the surrounding students, well, it's quite obvious because they've been training together all this time, so everyone supported Vin. Words were no longer needed. I had to admit that the guy had really matured. It was enough from just his stand alone. Even in height, he is not at all inferior to me, and maybe even a little ahead of me. That's why I had to give it my all. If I hold back, even if not on purpose, then I will no longer be able to look Vin in the face. Since we have lived together for a long time, we have learned each other's habits, both good and bad and those concerning the sword and all the rest. But this case is three years ago. How much has the guy improved his strengths? Or how much did he improve his weaknesses? Our swords will tell about this. I held the weapon in a side-mounted position, and Vin held it in a vertical position. In Yosogi's style, or to be more precise, Keiha's style, my stance concentrates most on the sharpness and sharpness of movements, and my master prefers it, which means I do too. While my stance was intended for counterattacking, Vin's vertical sword was more suitable for powerful strikes and maintaining a set distance. In battle, it is very difficult to determine the distance from which your opponent can make an effective attack, but since our physiques were similar, and the weapons in our hands were exactly the same, we both could easily calculate everything. Therefore, we didn't even need to exchange tentative blows. If, I repeat, if Vin, seeing my stance, thinks that I have not corrected my bad habit, then this fight will end with my easy victory. But I believe in the guy, so the result shouldn't be so disappointing. Let's start, shouted the senior student, acting as the judge. At the same time, Vin rushed towards me and sharply closed the distance. Of course, based on his position, I assumed such a course of events from the very beginning, but its speed significantly exceeded my expectations. It turns out that during these three years, he had still honed his strong side, which meant that the speed of his sword should have increased significantly so it was unclear whether even my indestructible instant strike could determine the winner or not. However, if I step back, he will immediately catch up with me and the battle will end there, so my only option was a sharp jump to the side, which is what I basically did. At the same time, I spun my body like a top and struck from the most awkward position, causing the dull sound of our swords clashing to echo throughout the area. The guy barely blocked the blow, but my attack wasn't over yet. Continuing the movement of the sword, I regained my balance, while Vin, who continued to defend himself, became a little darker, apparently because he could not understand how I managed to deliver such sharp attacks from such an absurd position. He was in a very bad mood. Well, I understand him perfectly. I felt the same way after Kaiha beat me in our first sparring but my skill in attacking from unpredictable angles barely achieved satisfactory results, so it was not at a level where Vin could not defend against them if he kept his cool. As a result, I was never able to break through his defenses, and we bounced away from each other, again restoring the original distance. Thus, we learned how much the opponent has changed over these three years. At the moment, our forces were equal, or I was half a step ahead, but this is unlikely to continue. However, before the battle began, Keha gave me only one piece of advice. Ace, if you really care about Vin, then you simply have to beat him, after which you must become a target for this child, just as I am a target for you. Although it was not a specific plan to win this battle, her words ignited a fire in my heart. Moreover, her speech was surprisingly convincing. So I wasn't going to lose, I just couldn't afford to lose, no matter how much Vin wants to get the better of me. With the same flame in my chest, this time I rushed towards the guy and delivered a sharp blow, which he could not take normally, from which he jumped back and jumped to the side and began to try to upset my balance, 
quickly circling around me. Apparently all this time he really tried to increase his speed and developed his legs, so he became so nimble that he couldn't even compare with the past. However, even so, I was not going to let him escape. Bending my body a little, I pointed my sword at the place where the guy was supposed to be in the next moment. Just as he honed his speed, I expanded my reaction zone. As long as he is not exactly behind my back, my sword will always reach him. Thus, no matter how fast my opponent is, as long as I watch my back, I can easily keep up with him. True, Keha can hit an enemy with a slight movement even behind her back, but in order to copy this technique of hers, I obviously still need a lot of time. Realizing that his tactics were not working, Vin decided to start moving in only two directions. But this did not mean that he had already given up. Since there was no way to approach me from the side, he put all his strength into vertical attacks. In other words, everything returned to where it started. And in the end, for me now, this was the worst thing. Vin returned to his original stance, so I returned the sword to the side position again. Perhaps the next moment will be decisive. Last time I dodged, but I wasn't going to run away again. I've already seen enough of the guy's movements. I'm sure the coming attack will be much faster and stronger than anything he showed me today, but I had to be able to take it. As if pulling the string of a bow, Vin bent and gathered all the strength in his legs. By the way, I didn't end up teaching him archery. Like a released arrow, the guy rushed towards me in a straight line, lowering his sword vertically, to which I tensed my whole body and responded with a horizontal swing. Ace, after the problem in the dojo is fixed, I'm going to go on a trip to the west, Vin told me on the evening of the day our duel took place, sitting next to me on the ground and looking at the stars. Travel, right? I felt that this time would come soon, but the West? Now I understand that you tried to protect me from many things. I also heard that if it weren't for your intervention, I would have been killed immediately after birth, the guy laughed. But his words were not a joke at all. Who? Who told him about this? Irina? No, I don't think so. Then, the first to come under suspicion are the wandering bard Huricio and the elf adventurers, However, one day he still needed to find out about it. To be honest, when he became old enough, I should have talked to him about it myself, but I never got around to it. But that's why I think I need to learn more about the causes of conflict between different races and similar tragedies, so I chose the West, Vin explained. So, is this because there is an ongoing war in the West between the beast people and humanity? In those parts, People believe that they are the most noble race, and all others were created to serve them. One could say that for a guy who has inherited both human and elf blood, this is the worst place in the world, for there is a possibility that both sides will look at him with enmity. But Vin understands this and still specifically chose the West, which means he is serious. I couldn't stop him and keep him by my side all my life, and I know that the time has come for him to become independent. But even so, I can still do something. Vin, I just ask you, value your life, okay? If something happens to you, then it is possible that all the beastmen, people, and even elves in the West could be inadvertently destroyed. I threatened the guy a little. Well, even I myself am not sure whether it will end with a simple threat if something really happens to him. Hearing my words, Vin smiled bitterly and muttered, Ace, you're really overprotective. This may be true, but what can I do about it? When my son, although not related to me by blood, is about to go to such a dangerous place, it is ridiculous to think that I will not worry. Everything will be fine. I have a goal, so I won't die so easily. Having seen the world, experienced a lot of things, I will become a strong man who will one day return and defeat you, Vin said confidently. Ooh, it seems that I still manage to remain a role model for him and a mountain that he longs to overcome. When that time comes, I will challenge you again, and this time my sword, which lacked just a little, will be able to reach you. Dad, he added at the end in a low voice. Hearing this, I hugged him tightly, 
because if I didn't do that, he would see my tears, and I didn't want to seem pathetic to him at that moment. The time has come for him to take his own path, and I will no longer stop him, because he is my son. He has already become a real man. In fact, two years passed before Vin was able to travel, in other words, before the problem between Yosogi and the Rodlin school was resolved. I didn't know anything about this, but as it turns out, due to an incident in the past where Yosogi school students broke into the Rodlin school dojo for revenge, our school was banned from participating in the Great Royal Tournament. But that was all in the past, and Kayaha founded a completely new school, even if she kept the old name. So Shizuki petitioned the royal court to lift the restriction on them, which the Rodlin school strongly opposed. If something happened in the capital at the present time, it would be sharply perceived by the public. But since, under the leadership of Shizuka, none of the students succumbed to provocation from the Rodlin school and behaved more worthy of their opponents, the government recognized their right to participate in tournament. Due to this, Neither the Rodlin school nor their ally, who actually wanted to eliminate the formidable competitor from the competition, lost a reason to cause trouble for the Yosogi school. On the contrary, if they had not stopped after the intervention of the authorities, they themselves would have become a target for criticism from the public. Thus, Shizuki and the head of the Rodlin school met and were able to resolve the issue peacefully without shedding a single drop of blood. In fact, if I had intervened from the very beginning, I think that the result would not have satisfied either side. The fact is that I am very far from all these concepts like the honor of a warrior, the glory of a swordsman, and other nonsense. The only thing I crave from my fencing is a sense of inner self-satisfaction. It's similar to how blacksmiths give their all, creating their best work when they participate in a qualifying competition trying to spread their name around the world. But with me, it's different. I even often felt irritated when I had to show my work to the public. Work, and even more so, sell it to all sorts of nobles. This time, too, everything was exactly the same. I didn't really care what the cause of the conflict was. All that concerned me was that someone was threatening Kai Ha and her legacy, so I was ready to eliminate the problem by force, even if it didn't completely resolve the current situation. And now, when peace returned to the dojo, I stood and looked at the back of Vin, who set off on his first independent journey. At the same time, I thought about how he would face many problems in the future and solve them in his own way. I was very sorry that I would not be able to watch him closely, but someday I would definitely hear from him many exciting stories about how he suffered, how he rejoiced, and how he overcame all difficulties. That's right. One day when my son returns, I will ask him about everything, for sure. A year has passed since Vin set off on his journey. In other words, I returned to the dojo about six years ago, and recently I have been teaching blacksmithing to several students at the Yosogi school. Most likely, Shizuki understood perfectly well that I was staying here only because of Kaiha, and this would not last forever so he himself turned to me with a request that even after I left, there would be people left who could inherit my forge. In addition, for the students themselves, this was also a very good chance, because even if they came here to learn fencing, this does not mean that each of them in the future will be able to live only off the sword. Therefore, mastering an additional profession was very useful for them. There were also those who loved swords but did not want to take a step into a world where people constantly kill each other, but preferred to live peacefully and improve fencing for self-development, nothing more. There were those whose families did not own any business, and those who were the third or fourth child and could not inherit the property of their parents, and so on and so forth. In other words, there were more than enough people who wanted to learn blacksmithing. Needless to say, I couldn't accept everyone, so I chose only those who were willing to take the job seriously and also had the innate qualities to withstand the high temperatures in the forge. But to my great surprise, among all the candidates who met all the requirements, for some reason Soka, who turned 10 this year, was included. 
Not only was she the daughter of Shizuka and therefore the granddaughter of Kaiha, but it is also possible that in the future she could become the head of the Yosogi school. Well, although she was Shizuka's eldest child, she also had a younger brother, Toki. When it comes to sword fighting, no matter what anyone says by nature, men have an advantage over women, so the chances of a girl becoming the next head are not that high. But we should not forget about who was the previous leader of Yosogi, who raised the school from scratch, and we cannot exclude the possibility that Soha's future husband could lead the dojo. And in general, if it has come to this, then the children of Mizuha, who now lives in Viscota, should they show talent for fencing, they can fight for the position of leader. To be honest, it was unpleasant for me just to think about Kaiha's grandchildren fighting among themselves, and since Toki inherited the gift of his father and grandmother, I hope that he will be able to express it correctly. Well, back to where I started. In other words, I was a little unsure if it was okay for me to teach Soha, the possible future leader of Yosogi blacksmithing. If she becomes my student, it will inevitably lead to a decrease in the time she can devote to sword training. Besides, she's only 10, and that doesn't mean her lessons will be limited to fencing and blacksmithing. Don't forget about reading, writing, arithmetic, and history, as well as cooking, embroidery, and other household chores. In short, she had a lot more to learn. When it came to Vin, there were no such problems since he had a much longer childhood than people. But for Soka, everything was completely different. If she really decides to study with me, it will only limit her future. At the very least, this will definitely move her significantly away from the chair of the head of the school. That's why I couldn't come to a final decision whether to teach the girl or not. But all my doubts were dispelled quickly enough when Shizuki told me, Soka herself wants this, and we have already discussed everything, so we count on your concern. At the same time, even Kaiha supported him. Basically, Becoming the head of a school is not the only path in life. There are also those who became strong through learning blacksmithing. Just please, don't spoil my granddaughter, okay? She said, laughing. Well, what do you want me to do now? To be honest, I don't really like to put other people's fates on my shoulders. However, since her family is not against it, then I simply have no reason left to refuse Soka. Hmm. It's good that I chose the most serious and responsible students. Although the girl is only 10 years old, she is still the daughter of the current head of the school, which means there would probably be those who decided to learn forging just to get closer to Soha. In this case, instead of using a hammer in my forge, I would start swinging my fists. Well, since I decided that I would take up teaching, then origin no longer has anything to do with it. I'm only interested in whether the students can truly embrace metal with all their hearts and produce a satisfactory product. Of course, from the very beginning they will not succeed. But the most important thing in studying is to absorb knowledge well. And here, it does not matter what family you were born into. Come to think of it, I'm glad Vin didn't learn blacksmithing from me. Although I admit that Aswald is superior to me both as a blacksmith and as a mentor, that is not the point. It's just that I would still make concessions to my son to one degree or another, and this would not do him any good. Well, be that as it may, Soka, who actually began to study blacksmithing, turned out to be surprisingly outstanding. She listened to my explanations more attentively than others, watched my work, and tried to copy it. If we talk about disadvantages, then it is worth mentioning her low physical strength. Although, given her age, even here the girl showed very enviable results. Watching Soha's serious work, the other students, who were all much older, were unwilling to give in to her, so they put more effort into practicing, and those who couldn't even keep up with her gave up the thought of studying themselves. All the guys remaining after Soka's natural selection gradually grasped the basics and, filled with the desire to move forward, quickly absorbed all my skills. After a couple of years, they were already able to repair their training swords themselves, and I even periodically began to take on work for them in the guild. Nails. Oh yes, 
those same nails, rivets, farm tools, and kitchen utensils, all of this was in high demand in the capital, so they always had something to do. And at the same time, Soka still continued to stand out among everyone else. But as I was afraid, having devoted herself to blacksmithing, the girl could not devote enough time to training with a sword, and gradually began to give way to her brother, who was younger than her. I hesitated for a long time, but in the end I asked if she wanted to give up everything. Doesn't she want to put the hammer aside and focus on fencing? But in response, she just laughed and said, Master, it's okay. Toki will definitely become an amazing swordsman like his father and inherit the dojo from him. At this time, I want to help him with my blacksmithing skills. After all, I'm his older sister. As she spoke, she puffed out her chest proudly, propped her hands on her sides, and simply beamed with confidence. It's clear. I thought I appreciated the girl quite enough, but as it turned out, it was still not enough. In this case, instead of needlessly worrying about her, I should pass on all my skills, all my experience to her, and give her a place in this forge. Once on the verge of destruction, Yosogi's school was restored through the desperate efforts of Kaiha. Shizuka was further developed and had a very reliable young generation, which I could only rejoice at. I studied fencing and at the same time taught others blacksmithing. The days passed in peace, and time flew by unnoticed. Thirteen years have passed since I returned from the kingdom of the gnomes, and eight since Vin left. At the moment, Soka and several other students have mastered the skill quite well, so I completely handed over the forge to them. Although I could still convey a lot to them, they learned everything they needed, so I stopped classes, because I wanted to devote as much time as possible to Keha. This is because she began to spend more time on her daily workouts. I didn't take on any work because I felt that the inevitable moment was just around the corner. In order to delay it at least a little, I offered Keha the last Apua fruit, which, by pure luck, was lying around in my bag, but she just shook her head. And when another year passed, she could no longer train. I tried to be near her almost all the time, and because of this, we exhausted all topics of conversation, and our communication often boiled down to a simple, it's warm today, or it's cool today. Even though these were particularly meaningless conversations, even though I had already talked about my adventures several times, Keha always listened with joy, no matter what I said. However, even in this state, she did not allow me to shirk my training, so I swung the sword in the garden next to her room and she watched me from a chair. This did not change even six months later, when she practically did not get out of bed. I didn't understand at all how Keha herself perceived the approaching end. Is she scared? Or has she given up? Or maybe she is already yearning for release? I didn't even know that. But every time Keha talked to me, or watched my training, she smiled, and I continued to believe in her smile. It seems like it's time, Keha suddenly announced today. However, I had been preparing myself for this for a long time, so I wasn't the least bit surprised by her words. But even so, is that so? Can't you wait a little longer? If possible, at least a couple of years. I didn't want to give up, which is why I started talking obvious nonsense. Hearing this, she smiled bitterly and replied, shaking her head. Since this is your request, I would really like to agree, but three years is too long. This means there's no way. This time we lived together for almost 15 years, and I wanted to hope that I was mistaken in my judgment by three years. But as it turns out, this was absolutely not the case. Besides, you've already been with me enough, and I think it's time for me to give you back your freedom. Her words made my chest tighten for a moment, but I somehow suppressed this feeling and managed to maintain an unchanged expression on my face. But I never considered myself limited. I was here of my own free will. Although, I believe, she herself understands all this perfectly well, it's just that we had no control over our fate, and she didn't want me to feel guilty. Ace, can you give it to me? she asked, to which I nodded sadly. 
Then I took out the last apua, crushed it, and fed it to Kaihu with a small spoon. Having drunk everything with trembling lips, she swallowed hard. After which, she waited patiently until the fruit took effect and finally smiled, getting out of bed for the first time in a really long time. Very tasty, Ace. Thank you. Now give me the sword. The sword that you forged for me, she said, left the room and headed into the yard, to which I hastily grabbed the sword leaning against the head of her bed, caught up with her and carefully handed over the weapon. It's just that no matter how accustomed she is to using it, a sword is still a sword and it's made of heavy steel so she shouldn't have the strength to lift it. But despite this, Keha firmly grasped the hilt and pulled the blade out of its sheath. This ends my Kaihi Yosogi's path of the sword and my life, she said weakly with trembling hands. But even so, I didn't cry because tears would prevent me from seeing her for the last time, and the next moment all sounds disappeared from the world, both color and the movement of time. It seemed to me that everything disappeared from this world at once. All that remained was a quiet but so threatening sword capable of cutting through anything. Of course, this could only be my imagination, but even so, it was the most beautiful sword I had seen in my entire life. To describe it, I had only one word, perfection. Well, something like this. Ace, did you see everything thoroughly? Keha turned as the sword slipped from her hand and fell to the ground. Instantly rushing forward, I picked up Kaiha's staggering body and hugged him tightly. Such a small, light, and cold body. Reaching out a trembling hand, she touched my face and whispered, Ace, I love you. After which she closed her eyes. And forever. I imprinted her best sword on my heart and heard her last words. Now, I no longer have a reason to hold back my tears and sobs, right? Holding Keha in my arms, I cried and screamed for a very long time, even when Shizuki and the others came running. For a very, very long time. And so, the funeral took place and Keha returned to the ground. Having witnessed this, I turned around and silently left the dojo. Everyone tried to stop me. Soha... Toki, and the rest of the students. Even Shizuki, who understood from the very beginning that I was not, I'll stay. I couldn't restrain myself and asked to stay at least a little longer. But I was not in the mood to be in any particular place right now. Of course, my heart had not yet calmed down, but even so, I wanted to wander around the world and see many more things. So, one day I will return here to Kaihi's grave, and at that time I need to bring for her even more stories that she loved to hear so much. This time I will go far, far away. However, I was not on the run, so first I must notify the elves of my departure, and then I will head east to where Yosogi's ancestors came from in the past, following the clouds floating across the endless sky. Blue sky, wide, deep, extending without edges and existing forever. Only at the moment this sky was shaking in front of me with a roar. Apparently, my compatibility with vehicles is generally no good. Although I was lying on the soft awning of a large covered wagon, the random shaking made me slightly nauseous. However, compared to how I felt inside, it could still be called flowers, so it's worth being grateful that I can be outside, feeling the wind on my entire skin and breathing fresh air. Mr. Ace, how are you feeling? Huricio, a wandering bard from the elf people, asked me a little caringly, but mostly with open mockery. He sat in the driver's seat and drove the cart, and dot, 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 it seemed like he was just bored. It's still tolerable, but still. Carts are not my thing, I answered without taking my eyes off the sky. It is far from certain that the weather will be good throughout the entire trip, so in the end, I may still have to move inside. But I had a tiny hope that over time I would get used to it and it would be easier for me. Well, until then, we can only endure. It's not clear why when I'm in the saddle or on a ship, I don't feel anything like that. But as soon as I climb into the cart, 
I immediately begin to feel seasick. However, no matter how much I racked my brains over this question, I never found an answer. Is that so? Maybe you should sing then? A good song always lifts the mood, the bard said as if it had just occurred to him, only as if I was going to show off my meager talent in front of a professional in this field. I'd rather take a nap enjoying the warm rays of the sun or, at worst, get off the cart altogether and continue the journey on my own two feet, since I can reach a speed not inferior to a horse. You can't do that, Hugh. If you are so persistent, then anyone will refuse you. And in general, instead of all sorts of songs, it's much more interesting to draw, isn't it, Mr. Ace? Would you like to make a couple of sketches of the views from the roof? Levis intervened in the conversation, throwing back the edge of the awning and sticking her head out. No, no, no. Of course, I admit that the scenery here is beautiful, but if I try to concentrate on paper, I will definitely throw up. And in general, I still understand if Levi's, who earns a living from this, is doing this. But if I try to depict something on a shaking cart, then I can easily imagine the result. Well, be that as it may, I understand perfectly well that they both offer me all this just to distract me from sad thoughts, so I was very grateful to them for that. After Kaihi passed away, I left the dojo and first joined the elven caravan. Exactly. The same caravan that Hurizio dreamed of back in the kingdom of the gnomes. This group consisted of elves, and they traveled to different cities, transporting all kinds of goods. Also, wherever they stopped, Gerazio performed his songs, and Levis painted portraits for the local residents. In addition, this caravan was officially recognized, and they represented the elven people in the kingdom of Ludoria and all neighboring states. In addition to this, the caravan became a kind of temporary refuge for all the elves who had left their forest because of curiosity, and here every fellow tribesman could come for advice or help. It was founded by the efforts of Irina, Hiuricio, and Levis, who were supported by several elf adventurers. Oh, you two, stop playing with Mr. Ace! Irina's dissatisfied voice came from the cart, to which the artist only smiled wryly, and the bar generally looked perplexed in an attempt to pretend to be innocent. Hmm, playing around is a very cruel way of putting it, although, oh well. At the moment, the caravan is taking me east. I plan to transfer ship when we reach the Eastern City State Union, but until then, I plan to travel with them. I had two reasons for joining the Elf Caravan, despite my intolerance to carriages. Firstly, to give them a letter for Vin, who had gone far to the west. Since our paths diverged and we each went on our own journey, it was difficult for us to learn about each other's location. But if we correspond through someone who knows both of us, then we can maintain at least some connection. Again, although it is sad to admit, Yosogi's dojo cannot fulfill such a role, since it is unknown how long those whom Vin and I will both know will remain there. People age so quickly, and the difference in the flow of time between them and Vin, as well as between Vin and me, is quite large. No matter how sad it is, nothing can be done about it, and I have already been convinced of this many times through bitter experience. But the elves are different in this regard, at least they live longer than Vin. And if we talk about someone I trust the most, then it will, of course, be a Reina, which is why I asked her to become the connecting thread between me and my son. And another reason, I'm just too sad to travel alone right now. This does not mean at all that I expect consolation and special attention because I have no regrets about how everything ended. I've kept all the important memories with my special someone deep in my heart. I just, I still can't figure them out. That's why I don't need anyone to listen to my complaints and whining. On the contrary, it will be enough for me to simply hear someone's voices so that I don't feel lonely. Thus, the caravan of cheerful elves wandering between cities was now the best place for me, even if our journey together would not be long. As one would expect, the caravan traveling throughout Ludoria and surrounding countries knows the current situation firsthand. 
For more than ten years I was isolated from the world and did not pay attention to what was happening outside the dojo, so I was surprised at everything they told me about. For example, the kingdom of Paloja, located in the south, was destroyed, and the eastern countries of Zines and Gidiar are rapidly merging together. Hmm, whatever you say, I miss some very amazing events. Polology has long cast envious glances at the sea of its neighbor, the Velestric Republic, and has repeatedly invaded its territory. But in the end, Polology not only did not achieve any success, but on the contrary, was crushed by the retaliatory blow of the Republic. As it turned out, the government of Vilestrica could no longer tolerate constant raids and resorted to the services of numerous powerful detachments of mercenaries, who swept away Paloja with such speed that Ludoria, which provided it with food, was unable to provide it with military assistance in time, and thus another state sank into oblivion. However, when everyone expected the Republic to subjugate all the captured lands, it took and abandoned most of it, not wanting to share the border with the kingdom, and forced the surviving aristocrats of Paulology to found a new country. Whatever you say, Velestrica specialized in trade from the very beginning, so she did not have such a strong desire to expand her territories. Therefore, instead of taking for itself not particularly desirable lands, the Republic chose to get a kind of buffer zone between itself and its huge neighbor in the form of the kingdom. Thus, a new country was born, Geotica, which came under the control of the Republic. Although in the past Pologia and Velestrica did not trade with each other, now everything has changed, and a huge flow of all kinds of goods poured into Giatica, so that we can say that the new state was even more prosperous than its predecessor. Well, as for Zainets and Gidiar, relations between these countries have always been warm and now they are trying to completely unite, forming a powerful power called Zidon. Their main goal was to protect against invasion from the north, or more precisely, from Durat's invasion. But both countries have a fairly long history of skirmishes and minor wars with the Eastern Union and the Kingdom of Ludoria, so the surrounding countries looked warily at the unification of old allies. As a result, the Kingdom began construction of a new fortress, and the Union slowly increased the number of troops on the border. Thus, although the current situation of the kingdom could not yet be called dangerous, a feeling of anxiety began to spread among the people. Do not forget that Ludoria was blocked on one side by the dense forest of Pula, and on the other by impassable, at least for ordinary people, mountains. So it turns out that if Velestrica and Zidon decide to join forces, the kingdom will find itself in a full-scale blockade. Of course, Ludoria is a very strong state with fertile lands and a bountiful harvest, so this will not be a mortal wound for it, but at the same time it will still gradually weaken, and in order to prevent this, everything will come down to only one thing, a total war. Well, all these are just my assumptions, and no blockade may happen at all. Perhaps, on the contrary, after the fall of Polology, trade between the kingdom and the republic will gradually improve, and as a result, both countries will prosper. It just bothered me a little that two such drastic changes happened in a relatively short period of time. However, no matter how much I worried since I was heading to the easternmost edge of the continent, I could not influence the upcoming events in any way. And since we're talking about this, I should explain my upcoming route. The central and eastern parts of the continent are separated by a wide strip of swamps, nicknamed the Man-Eating Mire, which in terms of danger is on par with the dense forest of Pulha, and a whole cloud of monsters lives in it. Due to numerous rivers originating in the Eastern Union and constant floods from the sea, a unique ecosystem has arisen in the swamp belt. There are also rumors that an ancient race of lizards were seen here in the distant past, but it is difficult to judge whether this is actually true. To get to the eastern part, you need to choose one of three ways. 
go around the swamps by land from the north, making a huge detour, board a ship and travel by sea, or don't care about everything, and go straight through the people-eating mire. By the way, if you cross the swamps, you can find yourself on the endless prairie, where halflings and nomads settled. However, this does not mean that it extends all the way to the sea, and its south is full of human countries. On the other side, in the north lies a desert, beyond which lies an icy wasteland. There seem to be habitable zones in the desert, but even so, it is difficult to meet someone who would want to live there of their own free will, and the wasteland is not even worth mentioning. So, ultimately, I decided to cross the swamps directly. I thought that by using the ship, I would arrive at my destination, but it would be boring, and I somehow didn't want to venture into the desert in the north. And in general, I would prefer to face monsters than endure constant heat, especially since in the swamps I could easily resort to the help of spirits. Well, and what is very important if lizards really exist, then I would like to take a look at them with one eye. I sat in the square and showed the picture to the children gathered around me while Juracio strummed some sad melody on his lute nearby. Not only is he a bard, but he is also an elf with a very long life, so he masterfully mastered not only the lute and harp, but also many other instruments common in these parts. Once upon a time, in one state there was a poor village. The river flowing through it was narrow and shallow, and if the sun shone for several days in a row, it immediately dried up, I said, after which I took out another picture from behind my back and overlaid it on top of the previous one. Levis drew these pictures for me. At my request, she made them not as realistic as usual. Of course, you couldn't call them caricatures, but they were simpler and naive, like comics from my past life. After the picture with a small village, there was an image of a girl, in this poor village there lived a little girl named Marie. One day she went to a dry river and began to pray, Please give me some water to drink. Like this, I continued. That's right. At the moment I was telling the kids an illustrated story. The elves from the caravan asked me to participate in their performance too, and after much thought this was all I could think of. The story was written by Juracio. The pictures were drawn by Levis, and Irina was in charge of the special effects, which she created using the power of the spirits. As for me, it would be more suitable for Irina to be the storyteller, and for me to be responsible for the effects, because in addition to the power of spirits, I also have magic. But for some reason, everyone unanimously declared that it was I who should read the story. As soon as she finished saying this, a miracle happened. From the bottom of the river, just from the slightly damp earth, a spirit of water appeared which filled Marie's folded hands with clean water, I said. At that moment, Irina quietly turned to the bucket standing next to me, and hearing her request, the spirit in it raised the water and created a translucent figure of a young maiden. No, this of course does not mean that all water spirits appear in the form of young, beautiful girls, but for some reason people tend to think so. Marie was very surprised, but her throat was so dry that she desperately put her hands to her mouth and started drinking. By the way, this story was created by Horatio based on a legend passed down in the now-destroyed Palology. A girl named Marie really existed, and her thirst was truly quenched by the spirit of water, but the power that awoke in her was too small and she could not help the entire village. Because of this, the head of the village had an evil thought. Since the spirit liked Marie so much, she must be sacrificed and then the river will be filled with water again. Of course, nothing like this could happen, but how could a person know about this, especially from an illiterate village? If they did this, then on the contrary, they would lose their last source of water. It is not for nothing that they say that it is not thirst that is terrible, but human greed, which deprives people of reason. When Marie was almost buried at the bottom of the river, for the good of the village, an elf passed nearby and saw the poor girl and became very angry. After he saved her, he began to shout that the spirits do not require human sacrifices, 
and since the inhabitants are so stupid that they are ready to tear out the last sprout of hope with their own hands, then it is better for them all to die in agony from thirst. But none other than Marie, whom he saved, calmed him down. She said that she was not offended by the village, that she wanted to help all the inhabitants, and she desperately begged the elf to tell her everything about the spirits. Touched by the girl's selflessness and kindness, the elf decided to teach and guide her. Even the head of the village woke up from her words, repented, and swore that when Marie grew up, she would take his place. After many years, the girl turned into a girl and, thanks to diligent training, became a full-fledged spellcaster, after which she used the power of the spirits and created a place in which everyone lived without knowing hunger and thirst. This is the story. In short, this story was intended to tell everyone that if people and elves join forces, they will be able to create miracles, but if they anger an elf, the consequences will be dire, and also to make people understand about the existence of spirits and that they are not evil creatures at all. Well, it is rare to find people who can see spirits, and even then, because they are different from everyone else, they are persecuted and despised. If my performances help one day to avoid such sad mistakes, then I will be very happy. That's how Marie made the village rich and well-fed, and many, many spirits looked after its inhabitants, and they all lived happily ever after, I finished. And at the same time, Irina called a gust of wind, and the rest of the elves threw flower petals into the air. The sky was filled with dancing colors, and as a result, not only the children sitting nearby, but also the adults watching from afar let out delighted screams. At the end of the performance, we gave all the children one piece of fruit and poured the adults a small glass of wine. Well, if someone wants more, then they will have to pay for it. In order to further inflame the atmosphere, Horatio began to loudly sing cheerful songs and the square was filled with conversations and shouts. The children asked their parents to buy them more fruit, and the adults wanted to drink more wine. Thus, the impromptu performance ended in great success, and in the future, such a performance may even become one of the sources of income for the caravan. So, where else can you see a show in which so many spirits will take part, entertaining the crowd? If Geracio comes up with new stories and Levis can sketch them, then the number of productions will only increase. In fact, it seemed to me that the power of spirits could be used much better for a puppet show. But if you think about the possibility of spreading this art, but without the help of spirits, then the pictures were much better suited. If everything happens like this and others begin to try to repeat this show, then knowledge about elves and spirits will unobtrusively spread among people. However, no matter how skillful the imitators are, the special effects will remain a unique feature of this caravan, because where else will you find so many strange elves who decide to leave their forest and wander through human cities? Patting the heads of the kids, who one after another ran up to me to tell me how much they liked it, I looked around at the cheering crowd with a slight smile on my lips. It was night outside and we enjoyed a late dinner at the bar. At the moment, the caravan consists of eight elves, not counting me. In addition to Irina, Huricio, and Levis, there were three adventurers responsible for security, and two elves who had literally recently left the forest and had not yet decided how to live in the human world. However, this does not mean that we all gathered in this bar. Even when staying in the city, at least two were always left to look after the horses, and they spent the night in the cart. In addition, the caravan mainly transported armor and weapons made by the gnomes, as well as fruits collected in the elven forests and wine made from them. All goods are very rare and valuable, so attempts at robbery could not be ruled out. Even if the cart stopped on the territory of some trading company, no one even thought about lowering their vigilance. After all, do not forget that seeing an unprotected treasure in front of them, greed awakens in people, and they can lose common sense. And unfortunately, this happens quite often. That is why the elves, even when spending the night in the city, 
take turns staying in the cart so as not to show their weakness to others. Although they do this mainly for themselves, such actions also take into account the safety of outsiders, and all elves who have lived long enough in the human world are well aware of this. Well, although everyone understands the need to stand guard when they find themselves in the city, everyone at least wants to eat properly. That's why I exchanged a few words with Irina, took the wrapped takeout dishes and headed towards the cart. Today's menu included stew, soft white bread, chicken bones, and wheat grape wine. Of course, the amount of alcohol was small, so no one could get drunk with it, but there was enough to enjoy dinner. By and large, I was treated as a guest in the caravan, so I never stayed on duty, but that's why I volunteered to bring food to the remaining elves in the caravan every time. Horatio was quite noisy during the day, but despite this, he continued to bawl songs even in the bar. Although this wandering bard at first glance seems like a sophisticated man, in fact he is still a tough nut to crack, and there seems to be a dormant source of endless vigor and positivity within him. While his voice came from behind me, I walked along the dark city streets. I moved quickly enough so that the food did not have time to cool, but at the same time very carefully so as not to spill anything. Today, the only people left in the cart are Yursha, an adventurer who is second in strength only to Irene in this caravan, and an elf who recently left the forest, Pune. Oh, Mr. Ace, did you bring us some food? Thank you very much. Jurcha stuck his head out of the cart, noticing me on the approach, waved his hand, and lifted the tarpaulin. Hearing his words, Puna also poked her head out, looked around curiously, and when she saw me, she bowed slightly. Climbing into the cart, I filled the stew plates they had prepared, divided the bread and meat, and filled the goblets with wine. Wow, looks delicious! Looking at the dishes placed in front of her, Puna exclaimed joyfully. In fact, she was only about 120 years old and had just left her native forest, so the girl enjoyed human food with full enthusiasm every time. When I still lived in the deep forest, I had to eat only fruits, and as far as I know, the diet in other elven settlements was not much different either. From time to time, there were those who tried mushrooms or the meat of defeated monsters. But not only were there only a few of them, but also in culinary skills, the elves were far inferior to people. That is why often the reason for the inability of elves to take root in the outside world is their picky eating. Well, in this regard, there was no need to worry about Puna, because she really ate everything with pleasure and great appetite and watching her enjoy it, even my mood lifted. It was somehow inconvenient for me to return right after I handed them the food, so I also settled inside the cart. And in general, when it comes down to it, it would be better to wait until they have eaten and pick up the dirty dishes, so as not to have to go back twice later. By the way, Mr. Ace, this illustrated story of yours, as you call it, is simply amazing. I didn't even suspect that the High Elves knew about something like that, Puna told me cheerfully, to which I could only respond with a wry smile. Hmm, the High Elves have nothing to do with it, but I didn't think I could properly explain to her about my past life. Um, that's how it is? Well, it just kind of suddenly occurred to me. It's probably because I really like books. So I had to utter words that smacked of an excuse, but I had nothing more to say. Jurcha who was sitting next to him, tilted his head to the side in bewilderment, but did not ask anything, while Puna, it seemed, did not have the slightest doubt about the veracity of my explanation, and she only nodded her head energetically, not forgetting to put a spoonful of stew in her mouth during breaks. Hrum, hum, you are amazing, Mr. Ace, glug, but I ran away from the forest without even thinking about what I should do in the future. If I had not met this caravan, then I'm afraid to imagine what would have happened to me, the girl said, looking up from her food. Hmm, that's true. After spending time with her, I got the impression that she was very carefree. But I think this is due to the fact that she is not yet accustomed to human society and simply does not know how to behave here. First, she needs to comprehend the common sense of the world that lies outside her forest, 
learn to clearly distinguish between dangerous and safe, and then you see she will behave more restrained. Again, having acquired enough knowledge, she may be able to find something she likes. For example, adventurers. Although many people use this word without a second thought, we should not forget that among adventurers there are swordsmen and archers, and if we are talking about elves, then a spirit caster can become an adventurer. Bards, artists, and those same blacksmiths. If you don't know what these professions are, then it will be impossible to admire them. That's why a girl needs to slowly accumulate knowledge and experience. Fortunately, she is still young, and she has plenty of time. And this caravan was created precisely to help elves like Pune. By the way, I would recommend her to become a dancer. If she wore exotic clothes and moved to the beat of Heuricio's tune, she would instantly become popular. In principle, an elf does not need two revealing clothes. On the contrary, she could hide her face with a veil, throw on a spacious shawl, and this would give her some mystery. Irina will not agree to this in any way, but if you repeatedly advise, then Puni most likely will not refuse. However, in the end, it's better for her to choose an activity that she likes, but until she decides anything, it wouldn't hurt to get all sorts of experience. By the way, if she herself is ashamed to dance, then there is such a profession as a puppeteer. She can both control dolls and create them. I believe that if you resort to the help of spirits, then the performance with dolls will be even much more interesting than my illustrated stories. If you want to do something, then first you can replace me as a reader in the next city. You know, it's very fun and pleasant when children surround you and look at you, forgetting about everything. I smiled and proposed to the girl. Whatever she chooses, she needs to try it first. Once a girl has found the courage to escape from the forest, it will be a shame if she does not find something to do to her liking. Mr. Ace, are you really leaving us? Arena asked me excitedly as we sat together around the fire on the night before our arrival in the Eastern Union. But she wasn't worried at all because I was planning to cross the people-eating mire on foot. Perhaps for humans such a decision would be akin to suicide. But she must understand perfectly well that for a high elf, this is quite possible. Therefore, the girl was worried not about the danger of my journey, but about whether I could cope with my current state of mind. Well, if you read between the lines, her question would sound like this. Won't you be lonely on your journey? Hmm. When she asks me about this for the umpteenth time, I even feel somehow awkward. Well, of course, I will be a little lonely, and the time spent in the caravan turned out to be much more fun than I expected. Besides, my heart is really weak right now. However, thank you, Irina. Everything is fine. I think everything will really be fine. Well, as I already noted, the caravan journey was fun, which means that my soul began to gradually open up again to the joys of life. Therefore, I think that I can continue my journey even alone. A lot happened between me and Kaiha, and not all of it was pleasant. But if I look back, I don't regret anything and I'm quite happy with the outcome. If the incident where the Ludorian aristocrats enslaved the elves had not occurred, then I would have been able to spend much more time with Keha, but this would not necessarily have been to our benefit. In this case, since the likelihood of us having a child was extremely low due to the difference in our races, then neither Shizuki nor Mizuha would have been born. I would not have met Vin, and after Kaiha's death, Yosogi's style would have remained only with me. To be honest, this option would have been much sadder. Although, if everything had turned out that way, perhaps I would still be happy with the result. In the end, it all comes down to endless ifs. I'm not saying there's no point in even imagining it, but there's no value in denying what happened because of it and trying to run away from yourself. Mr. Ace, you are truly amazing, Irina said, as if squeezing these words from the depths of her heart. And all because she inadvertently compares me to herself. Apparently the girl is still tormented by the bitterness of losing Cliff and Martin, and she just can't let them go. 
If we speak from the point of view of people's perception, then a whole ten years have passed since their death. On the other hand, for Irina, who is an elf, it was only ten years, so nothing can be done about it. Then maybe you will come with me. I couldn't help but propose to her at that moment. If you think so, then we have never did not travel with her. At most, we once got from the capital to the northern mountains on horseback, and even then this could not be called a journey, because we drove with all our might. Of course, if she agrees, then I will have to change my decision to go to the dangerous swampy area, and it will be better to use the ship. However, although I was ready for this, Irina just shook her head. No. While I'm glad you invited me, really, I am. I want to keep an eye on the caravan a little longer. Besides, someone will need to keep in touch with Vin, right? She said with a smile. Well, it's her choice, and I have no right to change it. But I'm afraid that if I said that I was unlikely to stand it alone, then she, most likely, was going to keep me company, which is why she asked me this question. But she will never even think of using me to alleviate her sadness. Therefore, this choice was very much in her spirit. Silence hung between us for a while, and we simply looked at the fire, in the flames of which a small spirit of fire swayed slightly. I don't even know how long we sat like that when Irina suddenly said, However, Mr. Ace, I have just one personal request for you. How is it? Although she had turned to me for help before, this was the first time with a personal request. She usually came to me when it came to the elves themselves, or to avoid unnecessary sacrifices. If you come across a white lake on your journey, I would like you to take me to it someday. Ah, so that's what it's all about. Indeed, even I could easily understand this request. We named our team White Lake because we were going to go on a journey to find it one day. Of course, I didn't forget anything. This was the name of the adventurer team she was part of along with Cliff and Marthena but it was also the name of a lake found in the legends of the elves and the high ones. It is a lake filled with crystal clear water that exists somewhere in the vast white lands that no mortal has ever seen. The three of us will never be able to find him, but even so, I still want to look at him with at least one eye, Irina whispered, to which I quietly nodded. I could understand her feelings and even empathize with her, but I'm afraid that it would be very difficult to fulfill her request. And all because if my assumptions are correct, then this lake, resting between the endless white lands, is located on the clouds in the world of the original giant. I doubt that we can find the way to heaven even if we search the whole world. But if Irina really wants this, then I am ready to at least try. The girl is in no hurry, and I have no goal other than to look at the homeland of the Yosogi school, which lies in the distant lands in the east. Again, I don't think anyone else will be able to find it, so I'll gladly accept her request. Meanwhile, the night, illuminated by the warm flames of the fire, passed unnoticed, and a new day began. Having entered the territory of the Eastern Union, I separated from the caravan and boarded a ship that sailed along the river to Lake Tvir. Yeah, I haven't been on a ship for quite some time. The last time I was on board with Vin was when we were heading to Jampamon, and the guy was so small then that he fit on my lap. How much has already passed? More than forty years. A ship that is propelled by the force of a group of rowers cannot reach a high enough speed, but even so, traveling on it is much faster than on foot. Having reached the port city of Foca, I spent several nights there to rest from the journey. Well, although the journey could not be called tiring, but due to the fact that I had to spend all the time on the deck, where you couldn't really turn around, my whole body went numb. At the same time, the most offensive thing was that despite the abundance of water around, I could not even take a shower. So, if you go down the river from Lake Tweer to the southwest, you can get to Jampamon, but this time I chose a different route. Fidel, Nona. On the one hand, I was interested in how things were now with my friends from the Eastern Union, but at the same time I was a little scared. This was especially true for Fidel. He was even a little older than Kayahi, so the likelihood of meeting him was extremely low. 
One way or another, my heart is unlikely to be able to withstand even more bitter partings. If Vin were with me, it would be a completely different conversation, but the guy is now somewhere far to the west. I believe we will fulfill our promise to one day return to Jumpamon when no one there will remember us, and we just want to visit places from our past. That's why I asked the guys from the caravan to deliver letters for Nona and Fidel, but even if they answer them, I will find out about it after my current journey comes to an end. Yielding to the flow of the river, our ship slowly moved east. Having crossed several small countries, the names of which I was even too lazy to remember, we went beyond the borders of the Union and reached two neighboring countries, which were located on both sides of the river. In principle, to my destination, but, as one would expect, it would never occur to anyone to lay a tourist route in such a dangerous place. Both states lived in peace with each other and often joined forces in order to fight the monsters that constantly raided from the man-eating mire. In other words, they could be called guards at the last gates of humanity in these parts, therefore, although they did not belong to the Union, they were supplied with food and other support at the expense of all their neighbors. And so, in order to replenish my supplies and gather information, I decided to stop for a while in a country on the northern bank of the river called Badas. In search of a hotel for today's overnight stay, I walked through the streets of the city, and along the way I met quite a lot of armed people who looked like adventurers. There were also plenty of establishments around that catered to dashing kids, such as bars, cheap eateries, brothels, blacksmiths, and, of course, shops. Where there are adventurers, there will always be a large flow of materials and resources, which means there is no way to do without the ubiquitous merchants. And finally, the guards. They could be found here even more often than in the capital of Ludoria. Apparently, the specific atmosphere of this place affected it, which required stricter control. Of course, the army mainly fights monsters in this country, but adventurers will never refuse to participate if they smell money. Thus, the more often the monsters attacked and the higher their number became, the more adventurers flocked here, followed by merchants and everyone else, which ultimately led to the rapid development of the city and the country as a whole. Although there were plenty of differences, for some reason this place made me remember Viscott. Adventurers constantly put their lives in danger, so there are many uncouth, rude people among them, and such people usually have a special bloody aura around them, so they were easy to recognize in the crowd. But precisely because they could not be sure whether they would return at all from the next mission, adventurers were inclined not to save money, but to spend it right away, living in grand style. If they do not relax with the help of alcohol and women, then one day the burden of battle will become too heavy and a person may die inside, becoming a common killing machine, which, although rare, still happens. Well, precisely because I was in such a city, I should have taken a more responsible approach to choosing a hotel. If I carelessly choose some cheap place to stay, then who knows what problems I might get involved in. I don't mean that if a place is cheap, then it must by definition be dangerous, but still, having paid enough money, it is much easier to ensure a reliable and restful sleep for yourself. After everything I had been through, I now understood perfectly why, in the past, Irina had so adamantly insisted that I continue to live in an upscale hotel. For better or worse, no matter how much I wanted to avoid it, elves will always stand out when visiting a city. In truth, Having collected enough curious glances on myself, I will be more or less protected from criminals, because any bad act in relation to me will be immediately noticed by someone. But there is always some brave soul, or better yet, a fool who decides to test good luck. Without even turning around, I slash the edge of my palm at the hand of the thief, who tried to get into my pocket from the blind spot, passing by me. For more than the last ten years, I have been training the Kaihi style created for me, and therefore my actions were already at the level of instincts. Young thief cried out pitifully and stumbled, 
drawing all the glances of those around me, but I continued on my way without even stopping. Judging by his skills, the guy is new to his business. I guess he managed to successfully rob some drunks a couple of times, so he became bolder and decided to choose a more noticeable target for himself. In other words, he's not at a level where I need to waste time catching him and turning him over to the guards. Having missed me, the thief will probably go looking for a new target and soon screw up again. If he is caught red-handed by one of the adventurers, then the boy may be left without an arm, and if he is caught by the guards, then he will face hard labor or the role of cannon fodder in the battle with monsters. One way or another, whatever his end may be, it has nothing to do with me. Hmm, it's been a long time since I became the target of a pickpocket. Walking around the city until the evening, I finally chose a place to stay for the night, an inn next to the river, which is mainly used by merchants transporting cargo on ships. The room cost two silver coins, which was quite expensive, but there were no problems in terms of security. Well, I saved up quite a bit of money during my time as a blacksmith, so it won't hurt me if I overpay a little. It was simply impossible to carry all the capital with me in the form of coins, so I exchanged most of it for precious stones, but I also left gold and silver coins just in case. I didn't have dinner at the hotel, but instead went to the first eatery I came across. The inn serves dishes made from wheat brought from abroad and fish caught in the river, but as I learned in establishments for adventurers, one could try the meat of all kinds of monsters they defeated during the defense of the city. Since I was about to cross the man-eating mire, I should have found out in advance which of the monsters living there were tasty and which parts of them were generally edible. If the food is frankly poisonous, the water spirits will warn me about this, but they cannot determine whether the food is tasty or not. No matter how disgusting the food is, as long as it does not harm my body, they will consider it acceptable. Although, they don't eat anything themselves, so you shouldn't expect anything more from them. Of course, even if the meat is a little tasteless, I'm going to eat all the monsters I've defeated so that their death isn't meaningless, but I'm heading into the swamp belt, which means swamps and muddy lakes await me. I'm afraid that many of the monsters that live in them can have a very specific smell, which is why it is extremely important to find out which fish or monsters are worth using as food, all to ensure that my journey is satisfactory. Hash dollar, percent at, you can't escape. A loud curse echoed across the surface of the water, and a spear flew from the deck of the ship at the monster. Although no, judging by the tip of the weapon topped with curved pins, it's better to call it a kind of harpoon, right? Anyway, I came to the river to watch the soldiers hunt monsters, and a very ridiculous battle unfolded before me. However, I couldn't learn anything from them before heading into the swamps, and all because the soldiers used although effective, a very primitive method of hunting, in which they surrounded the prey with several ships at once, cast a huge strong net, and then finished off the immobilized monsters. Moreover, either to prevent the monsters from sinking them, all the ships were large enough, so it was better to call it not the extermination of monsters, but fishing? As I learned from conversations, this method that I observed is used against small groups of monsters, and if there is a whole crowd of them, the soldiers use siege tactics or lure the monsters with food onto land where they are exterminated by the troops assembled for this. Although mass raids do not happen very often, a long tongue burst out from under the water, passed through the holes in the net, and attacked the nearest soldier at the stern of the ship but he defended himself with a strong shield with a deft movement. Apparently, this time the hunt is for monsters in the form of frogs. I had tried frog meat once in the past when I was collecting materials for Aswald near the volcano, and it was soft, and most importantly, it didn't stink. I had already tried it at the bar, and although the lava toad meat was still tastier, the local frogs were also quite good. By the way, the tongues of the local frogs did not have much power, and they jumped slowly and low, so compared to the lava toad, they were just a weak opponent. But even so, 
Every year, several people fall victim to these monsters, so the expressions on the faces of all the soldiers were extremely serious. The adventurers were fighting on the bank downstream, but I didn't dare spy on them. Their method of fighting monsters was born through numerous mortal battles, so they had no obligation to show it to outsiders for free. But at the same time, I didn't know who I could trust in this city, so I had to put aside thoughts of paying some group to let me watch their battle. If I suddenly run into greedy adventurers, they may try to finish me off for the sake of my luggage, then blame it all on the monsters or sell information about my wealth to some bandits. Of course, they can't send me to the next world so easily, but if I accidentally knock out a couple of attackers, then I won't end up with problems myself. Thus, I will have to come up with a way to counter the swamp monsters myself, but only after I find myself in the territory of the people eating mire. While there are no guarantees that the method of dealing with local trifles can be applied against the monsters living in the depths, so there's no point in worrying about it. Instead of copying others, it will be much better to figure things out on the spot. It will bring more benefits to my training, and it will be much more fun. Anyway, I was very interested in the harpoons in the hands of the soldiers. Aswald taught me how to make a wide range of different types of weapons, but I have never heard anything about the harpoon in this life. So, instead of calling a harpoon a weapon, it's better to classify it as fishing equipment, isn't it? In Visco, located on a plain and with dense forest nearby, fishing was far from the most popular activity, and in the nearby rivers there was no such prey that would require the use of harpoons. Although the harpoon was very similar to a spear, I still believe that to maintain the strength of its tip, you need to have special skill. Upon returning to the city, I will need to walk through the shops and take a closer look, and in the future I will try to forge something similar myself. But at the moment, I am not in the right mood at all, and I am not going to stay in one place for so long that I could borrow forge for practice. If I try once and come up with something inferior, then a sense of perfectionism will probably awaken in me, and I won't be able to travel until I bring the work to perfection. In other words, until I complete my primary goal of reaching the eastern part of the continent, everything else can wait. So, what else do I need? I'm heading into quite dangerous land, so it's probably worth stocking up on medicines and the like. If this were an ordinary forest or even a dense thicket like the great forest of Pula, then I could easily get all the necessary herbs right on the spot, because you can always ask the nearest trees about their location. Only this time, I'm heading to a place completely unfamiliar to me. Of course, some kind of medicinal herbs should also sprout in the swamps, and I won't disappear in a pinch, but the people eating swamps got their name for a reason, and it's better to spend a little more time preparing than to have regrets later, if I even survive to regret. That's why you need to think through all possible situations and collect all the necessary things, although even this will not be enough to call the upcoming trip safe. After that, I spent another two whole weeks in Badas, collecting information and shopping, and finally set foot in the territory of the deadly swamps. Using the help of spirits, I calmly walked on the surface of the water. Okay, it's still a short transition, but a long journey on water required constantly asking for the spirit's help, and this turned out to be very exhausting and energy-consuming. However, not the entire surface was covered with swamps, and from time to time there were patches of dry land, but even so, it's not for you to wander around the streets of the city. The water lilies growing on the surface swayed a little, and at the same time the spirits warned me that something had appeared under the water and was targeting me. There were three, two, point one left before contact. Having found the right moment, I pushed off the water with force and jumped high into the air. At the same time, right where I was standing literally a moment ago, there was a clanging of teeth and the muzzle of a huge crocodile appeared which closed its mouth, missing its prey. During the fall, I managed to grab a magic sword, imbue it with mana, and swing it sharply. My extremely sharp blade, without meeting any resistance, cut off the monster's head. 
Well, to be honest, it was hard to tell where the crocodile's body ended and its head began, so I cut it in a random spot. Having descended to the surface of the water, I immediately cut off the tail of the crocodile that had surfaced with its belly up, grabbed it, and hastened to leave this place. If you don't hurry, the blood flowing from the body of a defeated monster will spread, and its smell will attract a school of carnivorous fish. Although the crocodile looks huge, if the local relatives of the earthly piranhas swoop down on their prey, then in a couple of minutes there will not even be bones left. However, I can be called lucky if I was able to get a crocodile tail so easily. These monsters have the most edible meat in the entire swamp area. Not only does it contain no poison or parasites, but it also does not emit an unpleasant odor. This meat is soft and lean, so simply by mashing it with salt and frying it over a fire, you can get a more than acceptable dish. However, in order to collect dry firewood and make a fire in these parts, you have to work hard, often even more than when catching prey. That's right. Although I was still in the middle of the continent and by and large on land, almost the entire surface here was either covered with water or simply wet. Therefore, even without walking on water, I still have to turn to the spirits for help to compact the earth under my feet. And during rest, I have to ask them to create a stone chair or bed for me. As for eating, here, I learn to combine fire magic with the power of spirits and use flat stones instead of a frying pan. Of course, when I leave the parking lot, I return everything to its previous state. Although in the forest, high elves can walk with their heads held high and feel at home, in the swamps I am nothing more than an ordinary intruder, so I need to be extremely polite to the environment. Once you get used to it, life in the people-eating mire no longer seems so bad. Well, due to the peculiarities of the local climate, it is full of not only the spirits of the earth, but also the water, and the spirits of the air can be called generally omnipresent. So carefully using the skills and magic learned over all these years, I did not experience any particular inconvenience. I won't deny that there are a lot of monsters here, but if you look at it from a different angle, it means that I won't be short of food. At times hunting fish monsters jumping out of the water with a bow, at times chopping crabs with a sword, and at times running away from packs of evil otters, I slowly but surely moved east. Yes, the otters moving freely both in water and on land, which rushed at me in a whole crowd, were quite scary. Not only was their meat absolutely tasteless, but their size was such that they could easily swallow me whole. I even doubted how they could be so terrible, having quite nice relatives on earth. After spending a whole month like this, I suddenly felt someone's gaze on me, so I stopped abruptly. This look was not at all the way a predator looks at its prey. There was a clear sign of intelligence in him, as I felt both wariness and curiosity. Again, although they are clearly afraid of me, they do not show obvious hostility. Looking around, I did not notice anyone who could belong to this look, which means that its owner is either underwater or hiding among the grass. Have I finally stumbled upon the mysterious lizards? Whispering to the spirits, I learned that someone was hiding in the water, sticking out only his head and watching me from the nearby thicket of reeds. Although I really wanted to see what he was like, but if I thoughtlessly headed in his direction, then I might be considered an enemy, and then an unnecessary fight would definitely break out. Well, okay. The fact that I have confirmed the existence of a race that is believed to have been exterminated many years ago is enough for me. I don't know why. But from this discovery, I felt some kind of joy that is difficult to describe. If they are still alive, then perhaps one day I will have the opportunity to come into contact with them. And right now, I better not try to get acquainted with them. Waving in the direction of the hiding lizard, I resumed my movement. After that, I fought huge crayfish, rode a friendly shrimp, chased a tasty-looking giant frog, and more. And once I even stepped onto the surface, which I mistook for land, but without finding any signs of earth spirits in it, I quickly ran away, 
and only then realized that it was a turtle the size of a small island. By the way, due to the huge size of the local monsters, the parasites found in them were also healthy, so I did not need to be afraid that I might accidentally eat them. However, I still thoroughly fried all the food and just in case I kept a medicine for the disorder on hand. But in the end, everything turned out well. And a month later, the ground under my feet gradually began to dry out and the swamp was replaced by the steppe. Thus, I finally got out of the people-eating mire and entered the land of the eastern part of the continent, where I was to find the origins of the Yosogi school. It's not for nothing that the steppes of the eastern part of the continent are called the Great because they really are incredibly spacious. As far as I know, this place has its own unique name, like the Great Forest of Pula, but it changes depending on the people and the country, so I will simply call it the Great Steppe. Two peoples live here, halflings and nomads. Hmm, nomads sounds harmless, but in fact they are a people of brave horsemen, who do not disdain attacks and looting of states lying beyond the steppes. However, this does not mean that all nomads are military maniacs who only know how to fight, far from it. Among them there are tribes that trade with the cities, and at the same time they are very peaceful. Therefore, even though all the people living in the steppes are called nomads, they should not be united under one brush. By the way, the nation of Darren, which exists in the central part of the continent, actually descended from one of the tribe of nomads of the Great Steppe, which lost a battle here, after which it overcame the desert and icy wastes, settling in a new place. When they reached their current location, they immediately began to attack their neighbors, seizing lands and people, thereby causing a lot of trouble to countries such as the Kingdom of Ludoria and others. Just don't forget that a small group of strong people who struck fear into the hearts of many states even after all the hardships of traveling through deadly lands here in the Great Steppe are just a bunch of losers who lost the battle to another tribe. In other words, this indicates that nomads, also known as steppe people, have incredible strength. Under the gentle gusts of wind, the grass sways like the waves of the ocean. This steppe is like a blue sky that stretches endlessly. My original destination was the eastern edge of the continent, so I walked in that direction. If you cross the entire Great Steppe straight to the east, then there should lie the largest country in this part of the continent, the ancient Yellow Empire. It's just that it will take me more than one month to get there on foot, and here a new problem arises. I have run out of all provisions except for a small amount of meat left over from the last monster I defeated in the swamps. If you manage to hunt monsters or trade with nomads, then no problem. Otherwise, you will have to spend some time visiting coastal countries and purchasing provisions there. Moving across the steppe, I noticed a herd of horses in the distance. Since there were no people nearby, I decided that they must be wild. Only after a more thorough examination I discovered among them individuals with horns growing on their foreheads. They were black, gray, and blue, so calling such creatures unicorns was somehow awkward. But one thing is for sure, these are clearly not animals, but monsters. But despite this, it all looked as if these unicorns were protecting the rest of the horses, nibbling grass around the perimeter of the herd and ordinary animals treated the monsters as their own relatives, which aroused my deep interest. Usually, if animals live together with monsters, the latter occupy a dominant position, being a kind of local rulers. However, this was not observed in this herd. Not only were there several unicorns at once, but there was no sense of fear or submissiveness from the horses. Probably, both of them have a very proud character, and they do not have a relationship between defenders and the protected, but it just seemed that way to me. I don't know why, but for the first time in a long time I felt a little happy. I didn't even notice how some long extinguished feeling began to boil inside me. Now all my thoughts were only about one thing. I want to ride these unicorns. I wonder if I learn to ride, will they let me ride them? Hmm, maybe everything in this world can't be that easy, right? And now, 
because I had been staring at them for so long, the horses and monsters began to look at me with obvious suspicion. Well, nothing can be done. For now, you have to continue on your way. I just wanted to play with them and not at all threaten their usual way of life. And I have enough supplies for a few more days. However, horse riding, right? One day when I was riding behind Irene, the thought came to me about learning, but then I abandoned this idea, since the life expectancy of horses is very short, even compared to people, and I did not want to experience constant painful separations. Only now I have noticeably changed and I wouldn't mind learning horse riding at all. My life is so long that I cannot avoid many meetings and partings. With some, death will separate me, and with others, our paths will simply cross for a brief moment, so I think my heart can handle it if a few more horses are added to the overall picture, right? Thinking about all this, I continued to walk along the step when the wind blew sharply in my face. Strong, persistent, as if trying to tell me something. And the next moment, a spirit's voice was heard above my ear, whispering to me, There, save. I immediately realized that the spirit of the wind had turned to me for help, which made me very surprised, because this was the first time this happened to me. So, it's hard to imagine a situation where the spirits experience some kind of trouble. And in general, in this world there is practically nothing that could threaten the spirits. Of course, they can be harmed by polluting or destroying their habitat, but in this case, even before contacting me, the spirit would fly off the rails and begin to rage, as happened in the past, with the spirit of water whose river was poisoned by people. Thus for me, this became a very unique event in all my 200-odd years of life. Of course, I wasn't even going to refuse. On the contrary, I even became curious about what awaited me ahead. The wind spirits want to save someone, but they themselves are not capable of doing this. Well, quite a true story. Whatever one may say, most spirits, with the exception of the most powerful ones, are not very good at controlling their own power. This is due to the fact that they never use their abilities to fight nature, and to be more precise, they simply do not need to. Let's take, for example, a case where the wind spirit decided to help someone who was attacked by a pack of wolves. Well, it's unlikely that this will ever happen, but you never know what will come into the spirit's head if he is suddenly in a very joyful mood. Of course, the spirit can easily summon a gust of wind and blow away all the wolves, but it will be difficult to cause serious damage to them. Even if he goes overboard and creates a powerful hurricane, he will thereby harm the one he was going to save. When I turn to the wind spirits for help in order to carry out an attack, I always imagine in my head a picture of what I want to achieve from them, and they, in turn, simply embody it in reality. This is probably why the legends about the creation of the world say that after the spirits the high elves were born. Although spirits have enormous power, it was intended to support the smooth development of nature itself and not to use it for something else. That is why the role of the high elves began to analyze the situation and transmit their thoughts to the spirits so that they could correctly use their power. The same is true for ordinary elves and those chosen humans who have the ability to communicate with spirits. But unlike the high elves, the rest must train their skills while helping the spirits themselves learn. However, there are so many spirits in this world and in comparison with them, the number of spellcasters is so small that one spirit rarely stays with a specific person for a long time, so it is almost impossible to see the results of training. By the way, a spirit that has accumulated a fair amount of experience can eventually use its power without the help of our imagination, but our perception of the world with them is very different. Therefore, the way we use our abilities also differs. Maybe this is just my impression, but usually spirits approach things too roughly, without fine control of power or consideration of all the little things. For example, this was the case with that spirit of water, which at one time was going to solve all problems by washing away the city closest to it along with all the people living in it. Somehow I've completely gone off topic, 
One way or another, somewhere nearby, there is someone who the spirits really liked, and at the moment he is in danger, which is why the spirit decided to turn to me for help, who happened to be passing by. And I must say, it is very rare for spirits to show such interest in someone, so my curiosity also could not help but run wild. Spurred by the spirit of the wind, I ran across the steppe. Not much time had passed since I left the swamps, so I did not have time to properly rest physically. But now, I was driven by strong curiosity. So, for the wind spirit to show such interest in someone or something is such a rarity. If it were the spirit of water or fire, then this is a completely different conversation. Although water is mostly in motion, it happens that it accumulates and remains for some time in one place, so it begins to have a direct impact on many living organisms, including people. That is why the water spirit that I met in the past treated well the people who worshipped it, as well as their ancestors. Again, the spirit from the story about the girl, which I told to the kids in the square while traveling with the caravan of elves, also lived in the water. In turn, fire spirits also often come into contact with people, helping them in many ways in everyday life. This is especially true for us blacksmiths, because the mood of the spirit of fire that has settled in the forge greatly influences the quality of the resulting products. In addition, many peoples keep the fire never extinguished, which creates a good impression on the spirits, and thereby builds close relationships between them and mortals. But the wind spirits are very different in this regard. Although they can be called the most curious, by their nature they never stay in one place, so they do not show much interest in any particular person. The only exceptions are people like me, Vin and others who can see and hear them. In this case, the wind spirits often stay nearby for a long time, playing with us or playing pranks, but are there really many in the world who have the gift of communicating with spirits? That is why I found it quite remarkable and interesting that the wind spirits approached me with a request to help someone. However, while I was collecting all these thoughts in my head, it seems that I understood what it was connected with. By the way, the spirits of the earth show practically no interest in those who live above them. But due to the fact that they are constantly in one place, they have a very unique character. And if they once like someone, they begin to actively provide all possible help to that someone. However, almost no one even notices this help due to lack of necessary skills. After a fairly long run, a settlement of some nomadic tribe came into my field of vision. Probably, when you hear the word nomad, you imagine people constantly wandering across the plain. But in fact, these are people who settle in one place for a while, and several times a year move to new land so that their livestock does not ate completely all the vegetation around. This is precisely why the settlement is always built simply and without unnecessary frills, so that everything can be loaded on the backs of domestic animals at any time and moved to a new location. Of course, there is no stone wall, which is usual for any settlement in the central part of the continent, and the residents are protected only by a wooden fence, which, to be honest, can hardly be called particularly reliable. And now, Right before my eyes, the settlement was attacked by someone, and it was clearly not that long until it was completely destroyed. To be honest, when I saw all this, my first thought was, I've been screwed. I never like to interfere in conflicts occurring between representatives of the human race. What can we say about the current case when I don't even know the reason for what is happening? But the wind spirits continued to blow into my ears, almost shouting that I would help quickly. Well, there's nothing to be done. Usually, I'm the one who relies on the power of the spirits, so I'm not going to refuse them now that they ask me. And it's not even that I'm a high elf or anything like that. I just think that this is what everyone should do. Return kindness for kindness and extend a hand to someone who always helps you. Without stopping my run, I extended my hand towards the settlement. At the moment, he is being attacked by a couple of dozen horsemen 
who are circling around on horseback and shooting at the residents with arrows. In the settlement, someone tried to resist, firing from under the awnings, where they tried to hide from a hail of arrows, but the number of defenders did not even reach half of the attackers, and apparently they entered the battle hastily because they were not even wearing armor is worn. If everything continues like this, then as soon as the firefight ends, the horsemen will immediately break through the fence, and what will happen next will no longer be a battle, but a simple massacre. Spirits of the wind, hear my call, I shouted, sharply lowering my hand to the ground. Having read my intention, which I had formed in my head, the spirits hastened to translate it into reality, and the next moment a violent air current fell from the sky on the riders. Of course, it was not a simple wind, but air compressed to the limit, which turned into a kind of cannonballs that rained down on the attackers, aiming for their heads and shoulders. And the next moment the helmets began to fly off the heads of the unsuspecting riders, due to powerful blows to their hands. They dropped their bows, and the frightened horses reared up and threw several riders to the ground. But the wind did not hit everyone, but only ten people, exactly half. If more had suffered, the survivors would have had to abandon their fallen comrades, and then there would have been deaths. And so, each of the survivors can take one wounded person and leave the battlefield. Even though I was asked to help, I hated the idea of killing people I didn't even know, so I thought it was the best choice. Fortunately, the riders turned out to be smart enough. They immediately realized that the unexpected attack overtook exactly half of them, clearly not by mere chance, so they immediately picked up their wounded comrades and immediately retreated. In addition, it was clear that they were well-trained because they did not panic, did not rush to attack an enemy with a force unknown to them, but simply retreated without even breaking the formation. Looks like I just challenged a very problematic opponent, huh? The horses that had thrown off their riders went berserk and ran in all directions, but for some reason none of the residents of the settlement rushed to catch the seemingly valuable property, and everyone fell on their faces in anticipation of my arrival. You know, I even felt kind of scared. Shining like the sun, Lord, who commands the winds of the steppe, we thank you for saving us from the soldiers of the Dahlia tribe. I was greeted by the words of a girl wearing slightly more magnificent clothes and jewelry than the others when I reached the settlement and was led into the central tent. That's right. Standing in front of me was a human girl, from whom it was difficult to tell whether she had reached at least ten years of age or not. But at the same time, she called me shining like the sun, and this can only mean one thing. She has eyes that see spirits. My name is Selen. I am a priestess of the Barum tribe who reads the wind. I am also called the child of the wind. Honestly, this is the first time in my life I've heard about the so-called priestess who reads the wind. But if I'm not mistaken in my assumptions, then most likely this tribe worships the wind that blows in the vastness of the great steppe. And this girl named Selen is that rare type of person who is born with the ability to communicate with spirits, and in her case, they are wind spirits. In this case, everything immediately becomes clear, and why the wind spirits asked me to help her, and why she said that I shine like the sun, because this is how my immortal soul is displayed for everyone who sees the spirits, except for my fellow high elves. But... What exactly did the spirits like about her so much? Looking at the girl saying a complex greeting, standing among the elders of the tribe, I involuntarily tilted my head to the side. Well, I couldn't find anything in common between her and the wind spirits who prefer a free lifestyle. Is that so? I'm Ace. In my homeland, they called me the Child of the Maple. I actually don't command any winds, but I came to help you precisely at the request of the wind spirits. The old men frowned a little at my words, but the girl just nodded without any change on her face. Apparently, in terms of position in the tribe, she is much higher than all these elders. I don't really like it when great responsibility is placed on children's shoulders, but I'm not going to poke my nose into people's culture at our first meeting. Yes, I know about this. 
O great Lord of the wind, Selen humbly asks you to show mercy and protect my people from the Dahlia tribe, the girl said, bowing her head respectfully, to which I sighed sadly deep in my soul. Well, I figured this would happen, but I can't immediately, after saving them from an attack, say, Okay, I did my job and now I'm off, can I? Since the wind spirits asked me the same, I couldn't refuse, but still, I couldn't help but think that I had just gotten myself into trouble up to my neck. However, since I found out that I need to help a child, now my conscience will not allow me to just leave everything. Well, now I can only hope that this Selen, after throwing away the mask of the so-called priestess, will turn out to be a person whom I want to protect. Otherwise, at the moment, I can't really say anything. In the end, all I had to do was get the Barum tribe out of their predicament, and to do that, I first had to at least understand that very situation. Having lunch in the largest tent of the head of the tribe with Salen, her mother Zaya and younger brother Shuro, I listened to their story. But despite the fact that we were in the tent of the head of the tribe, he himself was not here. But instead, there were two young guys standing at the entrance, guarding us and, most likely, watching me. The appearance of the nomads looked a little exotic to me. Compared to the inhabitants of the central part of the continent, the skin of the locals was darker, and their facial features were more clearly defined. I must say, it was quite funny to observe such a drastic change in people after I had just crossed one swamp strip. The table was served with dried meat boiled with salt as well as buns with minced meat, somewhat reminiscent of manju. All of this came with cheese and what looked like yogurt. Most likely this can be called a rich treat. Since nomads do not engage in farming, they can only obtain the flour used in making dough in cities. And during this period when they were attacked by a hostile tribe, they clearly had no time for trade so it's easy to imagine how valuable all these ingredients are to them. Whatever you say, everything was very tasty. Ever you. I didn't see any cutlery, so at first I was a little hesitant, but after secretly peeking at the others, I began to eat everything with my hands. The drink was a little sour and had a specific aroma, but for some reason it seemed somehow familiar to me, especially this white foam. Ah, this is probably one of the varieties of kumis. Although it can be called an alcoholic drink, it was quite weak, so it went well with all the dishes served. Moreover, it serves as a good source of vitamins for nomads who do not eat vegetables very often, so it was indispensable in their diet. Hmm, why do I remember such strange information from a past life? I even know that kumis served as the basis for making kalpis water. Perhaps it was because of this knowledge that I felt some nostalgia. So, according to the story heard over the meal, the enmity between the Barum and Dahlia tribes began with the birth of a child of the wind and a child of the flame. Naturally, the child of the wind is none other than Selen, and as for the child of the flame, it is a boy from the Dahlia tribe who is three years older than her. Both tribes worship the steppe wind, and their regions of residence are relatively close to each other, so in the past they often traded, exchanging scarce goods while coexisting peacefully with each other. However, one day a child of flame was born in the Dahlia tribe, who was able to summon fire from nowhere, and this is where the separation of the two tribes began. The ability that the flame child was born with was without a doubt menacing. Just imagine when a child can cause fire at his own will, but what if he directs this power to a person? The answer is obvious. From this person in a matter of moments, there will be nothing left but ashes. Using this power, the Dahlia tribe began to raid the southern countries, which put the Barum tribe in a very difficult position because they traded with these states. And all because for the citizens of the southern countries, the nomads living in the steppe were all the same, be it the Dahlia tribe or the Barum. The more Dahlia attacked the cities, the harder it became for the Barum tribe to trade, which led to their inevitable poverty. 
The chief of the Barum tribe repeatedly attempted to negotiate with the Dahlia tribe, asking them to be more restrained in their forays into the south. They appealed to them to reason, citing the fact that the child of the flame is not at all invincible, and sooner or later he will die, and after that it will be difficult for them to continue raiding, but by this time trade will become impossible. But Dahlia didn't listen one bit to the words of her old neighbor. Well, it's quite a common story. Humans are very greedy creatures, and it was absurd to expect them to give up wealth that they could easily acquire with their current strength. On the contrary, they considered that while they had this power, they should enrich themselves further, give birth to as many children as possible, and increase the power of the tribe, so that even without the participation of the child of the flame, they could continue their raids. At the same time, Dahlia passionately desired to get one thing, namely, a girl born in the Barum tribe who has a strange power, a child of the wind, possessing the ability to foresee the weather and learn about events occurring far, far away. The child of the wind was an important symbol for both tribes who worshipped the steppe wind. The Dahlia tribe decided that if they got Salen as their wife, their child of the flame, then they could give birth to a new faith in fire. Just as a flame absorbs the wind, becoming stronger, so the Dahlia tribe wanted to absorb the old faith, acquiring for themselves even more power and wealth. Of course, according to their plan, the Barum tribe had to submit to them unquestioningly and become part of them. But the head of the Barum tribe, Selen's father, continued to refuse this marriage. In order to protect not only his tribe, but also the very faith in the wind of the Great Steppe. However, this led to a war between the tribes, and as a result, a little earlier, all the elite forces under the command of Selen's father were exterminated by the Dahlia tribe and the Child of the Flame. At the same time, they did not take prisoners, but beheaded every single one of them. I'm afraid that Dahlia no longer saw the Barum tribe as her equals and was going to take the child of the wind by force while slaughtering everyone else if necessary. At the moment, only a few warriors who did not participate in that battle remained in the tribe, inexperienced youths, children, women, and old people. In their attack today, the Dahlia tribe was going to kill all the able-bodied men and useless old men while taking women and children with them. And I, driven by the spirits of the wind, arrived just in time at the very height of the attack, which without my participation would clearly have ended disastrously for the Barum tribe.